Mayhem and Murder, written by Tegan Meyer, narrated by Merritt North. Chapter 1 I stood in front of my pole-built garage and guided Gabby my longtime friend and newest boarder, as she backed her horse trailer up, glancing to the driver's side mirror to make sure she could see me. I don't know why I bothered. That girl could back a bumper pull a quarter mile down a curvy country road and never drop a tire off the edge. Still, better safe than dragging the gutters off the barn. We'd spent the day estate sale picking for my upcycle store, Reimagined, I'd gone alone, but called and asked her to meet me with her trailer at the second sale because I'd ended up buying more than I could fit in my truck. I hadn't expected that, since I'd learned my first weekend on the hunt that sale ads were sort of like Facebook pics and dating websites. Carrie Underwood or Ryan Gosling often turned out to be the Crip Keeper in real life. Luck was with me, and that had only been the case at one sale. At the next, I struck Picker's Gold and called Gabby to see if she could meet me. I'd picked up some real gems, including a curio cabinet that was begging to be a rifle rack and a set tee I was going to reupholster and turn into a daybed. Both pieces had been stuffed in the back of a barn for the better part of fifty years under piles of God only knows what, so I picked them up for a song. Want some help unloading? she asked as she jumped out of the cab and pushed the door shut. I shook my head. No, I'll unload it tomorrow if you don't mind me leaving it in your trailer overnight. I'd save both my back and my toes and unload them with just a couple fingers when I had the energy to do it. One of the many advantages of being a witch. Right then, though, my back was killing me from loading them. I'd planned on lightening the load when we were putting them on the trailer, but the guy who sold it to me took the gentlemanly route and insisted on helping me instead of letting Gabby, who's all of a hundred pounds soaking wet, do it. That left me lifting what equated to her weight in furniture, but I still had to pull a little hocus-pocus after I dropped my end of the settee on my toe, walking it backwards into the trailer. With him holding the other end, though, I wasn't able to do too much without raising suspicion. After all, they were supposed to be heavy. She shrugged. If you're sure, I don't mind helping. That settee and cabinet are heavy. I waved her off, then wiggled my fingers at her. Ah, she said, raising her brows. Sometimes I forget about that. At least let me help you feed, then, she said. You've got to be as whipped as I am. She had that right, so I motioned to the barn. An offer I can't refuse. Let's get her done. In addition to running my little shop, I'd inherited Flynn Farm from my Aunt Addie when she passed. She and my Uncle Calvin had raised my sister, Shelby, and me after our mom died and our dad ran off. I'd been twelve and Shelby three, and the farm had been our home ever since. We rented out six stalls to cover expenses and had seven of our own so there were thirteen hungry horses waiting, not so patiently, for supper. They'd been happy to see us when we'd first arrived, but were now giving us the hairy eyeball for taking so long. Max, our miniature donkey, ambled toward us from the porch, his ears pitched forward in a pleasant manner that was a little out of character for him. "'Gabby? Noel?' he said, dipping his head. "'Yes, the donkey talks.' How are you ladies this fine evening? I trust your day went well and your search was successful? I narrowed my eyes at his apparent interest. Usually the only thing Max was interested in was Max. He'd been a 16th century lesser noble who thought he could pull one over on his mistress. Since she happened to be a red-headed Irish witch with a temper, I suspected was the basis for the stereotype. It wasn't his brightest move. She'd cursed him into a body she felt more closely resembled his inner self. But a couple months ago, an older witch from the next town over had suggested that the curse may reverse if he learned his lesson. Since that hadn't happened over the course of several centuries, I didn't see it being a thing any time soon, but Max had it in his head that being nice for a few weeks would make up for being an ass for hundreds of years. Hope springs eternal, but so does idiocy. Still, it was providing some cheap entertainment for everybody else at the farm that had had to put up with him over the years. 
We did, I said. But I was running a little low on cash, so I had to get an off-brand scotch instead of Glenlivet, I said. He was a snob when it came to his booze, and it was all I could do to keep a straight face as he tried to keep his head from exploding. I'm sure that will do, he said with a manic grimace that was supposed to pass for a smile. I appreciate that you thought of me at all. Watching him try to maintain the friendly facade was hilarious. I'm just messing with you, I said, bumping him with my knee. But seriously, you need to slow down on that stuff. Despite what you think, it's not meant to replace water. He lopped his ears back and scowled at me, but I didn't miss the relieved sigh. Gabby leaned around me to glance at him as we walked. So, did anything go on today while we were gone? Did Mayhem get into anything? Mayhem was her black and white paint horse, whose personality was as splashy as his coat. We had to keep his stall door and pasture gate latched with a lead rope, or else he'd open them and roam wherever he pleased, which usually meant the hay room. He was never content to tear up one bale. He had to wreck the whole stack by sampling them all. And that's just what he could do in an hour. We'd been gone all day. Max shrugged a shoulder, still a little miffed at the whole scotch thing. I suppose he was just like any other horse. He stood out there. He grazed. He pooped. Nothing out of the ordinary. For him, that's out of the ordinary, I said, grinning at Gabby as we reached the barn. She snorted. No kidding. The object of our discussion whinnied when he saw us and came barreling toward the gate, twisting his head and crow-hopping a couple times just because it felt good. He was only twenty feet or so from the fence when he threw his weight back onto his haunches and put the skids on, then stuck his head over the gate and bobbed it up and down, nickering and pawing for attention. I'd never seen a horse with so much personality. Did you put him in the pasture when you came to pick up the trailer? I asked. She shook her head. He was out when I got here. I'd left him in his stall because Will, our vet, was stopping by that day to draw blood for his annual Coggins test. Shelby worked with Will, so she must have turned him out when they were finished. We changed course and went to the gate rather than the barn, and Gabby patted his neck, then laughed as he rubbed his face on her shoulder. Were you a good boy today? she crooned as she scratched his jaws. It made me smile to see her so happy. She'd inherited the horse from Sylvia Sturgis, the lady who'd owned the farm where she'd worked for the last several years. The woman died, and when Gabby went to gather her belongings from the barn, the manager told her mayhem was hers. Mrs. Sturgis had always had a soft spot for her, but you could have knocked me over with a feather when Gabby called me with the news. Mayhem was six and had reigning horse bloodlines that read like a who's who of the industry, along with the training and earnings to go with it. He was worth forty grand. Easy. But I suspected money had nothing to do with why Sylvia had left her prize horse to Gabby. I was staring at the reason right that second. She loved the horse as much as the old woman had. Some things are worth more than money, at least to some people. Sylvia's money-grubbing son had begged to differ, but the will had been ironclad. The son had liquidated the farm faster than you could say, check, please, and Gabby had had to find a new place to put him, pronto. Gabby got the horse and a trailer to go with him, all his tack and equipment, and a generous trust fund to pay for his board and expenses for the rest of his life. He had a bigger monthly stipend than I ever would. It worked out well for both of us, because I'd been considering taking on another boarder at the time, but didn't want strangers wandering around while I was having coffee in my PJs on the porch. Win-win, considering she'd bought me my fuzzy slippers for Christmas and actually appreciated seeing me wear them. She opened the gate and slipped Mayhem's halter on and stood back so he could step through. She had to push his head away when he started pilfering her coat pockets for treats. Knock it off. It's supper time. Get to your stall. She pushed him toward the barn as she opened the gate a little wider to let the other geldings out. Go on. Get, she said, shooing him away in the same affectionate tone a mother uses with her kid. He snorted but turned toward the barn, his pasture buddies not far behind. 
The soft, steady clop of hooves on concrete told me they were cooperating with the system, each headed for his own stall. Gabby went to the feed room, and I followed the horses, closing and latching the stall doors behind them. Mayhem, whose stall was at the end of the barn, had stopped at his door and was snorting, pawing, and bobbing his head, his front feet coming off the ground in agitation. I jogged toward him to see what the problem was, but slowed halfway down the barn to keep from spooking him further. He was always energetic, but never nervous. Right then, though, his eyes were rolling so much I could see the whites in them. His anxious knickers caught Gabby's attention, and she called. Y'all okay down there? I held up my hand, signaling her to give me a minute as I got closer to the end of the barn. What's the matter, boy? Huh? I approached him one careful step at a time, speaking softly with my hands out. I was careful to keep my body positioned at an angle to his so that if he bolted, he'd go around me rather than right over top of me. He was still woofling and bobbing his head a little, but was calming down. I laid my hand on his neck, then grasped his halter and tugged down. He dropped his head, and I patted him and kept crooning, craning my neck to see what was wigging him out. All I could see was a gaudy but expensive pair of cowboy boots that led to jean-clad legs. But that was enough. Something told me some rich dude with bad taste wasn't just taking a siesta in there. I tried to control my heartbeat as I led Mayhem to the nearest empty stall. By the time I slid the latch shut with shaking hands, Gabby was standing beside me. She tilted her head at me, questioning, but all I could do was point and edge closer to Mayhem's stall. I stepped in and she followed me. My brain disconnected as it tried to process what I was seeing, and the first random thought that went through my mind was how high-pitched Gabby's voice was when she was screaming, though I reckoned that was to be expected, since there was a dead guy lying in her horse's stall with a set of spur straps wrapped around his neck, spurs still attached. It was obvious he'd bought his last pair of ugly boots, but I couldn't tell who he was because his face was buried in a pile of horse manure. Looking back, that turned out to be a pretty accurate foreshadowing of the rest of the week. Chapter 2 I grabbed Gabby by the sleeve and pulled her out of the stall, shushing her as I did. The horses were banging and kicking their stall walls, and the place was in a general uproar. I pulled her out at the end of the barn and barked her name. I didn't want to pull the whole Hollywood face slap thing, but I had no problem shaking her till her teeth rattled to get her to shut up. Knock it off! You sound like you're the one being killed, I snapped. She stopped, but was still sucking in air faster than she needed to be. Breathe. In. Out. I took a few deep breaths with her until I was sure she wasn't going to pass out. Then, with my hand still on her sleeve, I pulled her around the side of the barn, hoping to find that Matt, my friend who lived above the barn, was home. No such luck. His white work truck was gone, but there was a ginormous fancy new truck parked there, backed up and hitched to my horse trailer. I scrunched my forehead and scratched my chin. I didn't know the truck but I did know I hadn't loaned my trailer to anybody. Shoot, I hadn't even taken it with me that day because the axle on it needed fixed and I just hadn't taken the time to do it. Do you have any idea whose truck that is? I asked. She nodded, but didn't say anything. She just stood there like a lump on a log with her hand over her mouth. I ran a hand down my face. Well, spit it out. We have a dead guy in the barn. If you have something to add, now's a good time. I pulled out my phone to call Hunter while I rolled my fingers at her, debating between using 911 or his personal line. I opted to call him directly on his office line since our 911 center calls often funneled straight to him anyway. I hit send, and while it was ringing, I held it away from my ear a little and grabbed her jacket, sleeve, giving her a nudge. Gabby. Sorry, she said as we walked around the trailer to get a better look at the truck. The back glass was tinted and had a White Ranch brand logo in the center. Diamond Rail S. There was a reigning horse doing a sliding stop on either end of the rail. That was bad. 
worse than bad, because the Diamond Bar S was no more. It was the ranch where Gabby had worked before Sylvia died. Gabby finally found her voice. That's Marcus Sturgis's truck, which makes sense considering that's who's in Ma'am's stall. I pulled in a deep breath and puffed it out through my cheeks. Hunter picked up, his voice cheerful when he asked if I'd found anything good at the sales. Somehow, I figured telling him about the set tea in Curio could wait. We can talk about that later. Right now, we should probably discuss the dead guy in my barn. Dead silence for a couple of heartbeats. Come again? Tired, I explained. We came home and found a dead guy. It occurred to me we hadn't actually verified he was dead before running out of the barn, but I figured it was a safe bet, all things considered, in Mayhem's stall. Holy crap, Noel! I'm on my way. Stay out of the barn. The line went dead before I could say another word. I considered sidestepping his order to make sure the guy was actually on the other side of the daisies when Max wandered around the corner, drawing his bushy eyebrows down. That man's still here? Wait, you knew he was here? That would have been good information to have before we found him. When did he get here? Was he alone? Didn't you think it was weird some stranger was here? He rolled his eyes. People come and go from here all the time. Between you, Shelby, the infernal borders, and Matthew, it's hard to even nap anymore. I swear, it's worse than when you were children. At least he dropped the phony facade. Yeah, yeah. When did he get here? After Shelby came. I don't know when that was. And he's the only one who was here? No he said, laying his ears back and donkey-scowling. I just said, Shelby was here. Cody was with her. And some man in a mostly green truck arrived several minutes after this man. He motioned toward Marcus's truck with his nose. Got here. I heard somebody leave shortly thereafter, but was on the other side of the house. I assumed they both left, but apparently I was mistaken. Apparently, since he's face down in a pile of horse poop in Mayhem's stall, I said. What do you mean the truck was mostly green? I asked. He barely batted an eye at the news. I mean, most of the truck was green. The back part above the tire was blue. I shook my head. Why does everything have to be so hard? To use one of your idioms? Not my circus, not my monkey, he said, shrugging a fuzzy shoulder as he ambled toward the barn. Hey, stay out of there, dead guy, remember? With a put-upon sigh and a glare, he changed course back to the porch. I had no idea what I'd done in a previous life to deserve him, but it must have been a doozy. We followed Max to the porch and sat down to play the waiting game. Gabby didn't have much to say, so I went in and poured us a couple of glasses of tea. By now, the horses had accepted that supper wasn't imminent and had settled down some. I sighed with relief and drained the last of my tea when the sound of vehicles coming up the drive caught my attention. Hunter was barreling around the curve, practically tipping onto two wheels, followed by an ambulance. They weren't running their lights or sirens, and I was grateful. The last thing I needed was half the town forming a conga line of vehicles coming to see what the hubbub was all about, and that's exactly what would have happened. After all, it was Sunday evening, and there hadn't been any other good gossip to grind through the local mill lately. The masses were no doubt starving for new material. They were about to get that in spades, and once again, I was smack dab in the center of it. Chapter 3 While we waited, I asked Gabby as many questions as I could think of, but she didn't seem to have any more ideas about how the son of her former boss ended up toes up in our barn than I did. Considering his truck was hooked to my trailer, the only thing we could assume was that he was going to steal Mayhem, but that made no sense. It's not like he could have sold him for anything— 
Without his papers, he was just another pretty horse that did cool tricks. She did know a couple of people from Sylvia's farm who drove green trucks, but had no idea where they'd gone when the place was sold. For that matter, she didn't even know if the farm had been left intact or divided into parcels. Hunter, the epitome of tall, dark, and handsome, climbed out of his truck, and I motioned for him to follow me. He held up his hand. It would probably be best if you just told me where it is. I called Jim. He's in town and should be here in the next few minutes. Jim Sanders was our local CSI and coroner. He wasn't actually assigned to Keyhole Lake, but he lived here, and we were in his jurisdiction, so if he wasn't away on a case somewhere else, he filled in here. Until recently, his jobs here had been mundane, grannies dying in their sleep, or the occasional hunting accident. You're sure he's dead? I pursed my lips and shrugged one shoulder. I mean... I didn't actually check, but he's face down in a pile of manure, and a pair of spurs are crossed behind his neck so tight the straps are cutting into him. He looked pretty dead. Was Matt or Shelby here? Did anybody see anything? I bit my lip. Max was. He saw Marcus's truck pull up, then a green one with a blue quarter panel shortly afterwards. He rolled his eyes and sighed. So... You're telling me Max is my only witness. That was a little offensive. Max was a pain, but he wasn't a liar. If anything, he was a little too brutal about speaking the truth sometimes. Nobody wants to know they look like a deranged clown when they first wake up, but he'd point it out anyway. He's no more of a morning person than the rest of us. I crossed my arms. Yes, Max is the only one who was here. Why'd you say it like that? We're lucky he saw anything. Hunter raised his brows and gave me the think-about-what-you-just-said look. Of course I have just cause to request the warrant for the truck, Your Honor. My girlfriend's talking donkey said he saw one just like it at the scene of the murder. Oh, yeah, when he put it like that. So, what do we do then? He raked his hand through his hair. We'll have to reach around our elbows to scratch our butts, he said. I'll track down the employees from the farm, then narrow it down to people with green trucks and hope like mad there's only one. Gabby said there was a couple, but none with the mismatched paint. Great, he said, rubbing a hand down his face. While we were talking, a black SUV rumbled around the curve in the drive and pulled into the yard. Nothing screamed, low-key crime scene investigator, like a black SUV. Jim stepped out, shaking his head. Noel, I don't know how you managed to fall into every pile of crap dropped in this county, but you sure do have a knack. I scrunched my nose. You're likely going to regret that particular turn of phrase when you see the body, I said, ignoring the intent. He wasn't wrong, but what was I supposed to do? Move the guy to somebody else's barn like a baton in a relay? Besides, I'd only found one other body, Max Wheeler's, and that was because his ghost had come to Hunter, demanding we go find his body and figure out who brained him with a toilet tank lid. That's another story, though. Suffice it to say, I had nothing to do with the entire mess, at least before Max showed up all dead and cranky. In the barn, you said? Jim asked Hunter. Yeah he answered, then looked to me for confirmation. Back left stall? I nodded. I'm going inside for something to drink, so if you need me, I'll be on the porch. You'll find his truck behind the barn, but the trailer is mine. You knew him? Jim asked. Nope, I said, popping the pea. Never met the man before in my life. No clue why he was here. He glanced at Hunter and jerked his head toward the barn. Ready, Hoss? Ready as I'll ever be. He turned to Gabby. I have some questions, but I'm going to take care of the scene first. She nodded. Holler when you're ready. I'm not going anywhere. When we made it to the house, she collapsed on a chair in the kitchen and put her face in her hands. I poured us both a healthy glass of wine and joined her. There's something else, no. I had a fallen out with Marcus when he tried to stop me from taking mayhem. I pulled my hair back from my face, not liking the sound of that at all. 
You better tell Hunter about it now, then. They're going to find out anyway, and it would be better if you got ahead of it. You're right. She downed about a third of her wine. He ain't going to like it, though. That's for sure, I said, then sat down to wait. Chapter 4 My Aunt Addie popped in a few minutes later, and I mean that literally. Like I said, she'd passed almost a year before, but a couple of weeks after her funeral, I'd been cleaning stalls and crying, something I'd done a lot of in those days, when she'd shown up in the doorway telling me everything was going to be all right. I'd never been so happy to see somebody in my entire life, and she'd been right. For the first few months, she'd hung around the house, not sure how to get from one place to another. By the time we figured out how she could get around, she'd about driven me batty. Even in life, she was bossy. Take away her ability to physically do things, and that left nothing for her to do but micromanage every single task at the farm. Now she was away from home more than she ever was when she was alive. She called it her post-life retirement. What's going on in the barn? Bill? The former owner and current resident ghost of Clip and Curl, the local beauty parlor, said she'd heard somebody got killed out here. She glared at me. I told her she was surely mistaken because you'd have let me know. This had the potential to get ugly if I didn't handle it with kid gloves. Bill was right, but we haven't been in the house long enough for me to call for you. It's not even been a half hour since we found the... She popped out before I could finish the thought, but wasn't gone long before she appeared again. Mercy, them are some homely boots. Not near as homely as that pile of shit he face-planted in, though. Who is it? Did I mention that Addie's filter is more like a climbing net? Gabby spoke up. Remember Sylvia Sturgis, the lady I worked for in Eagle Gap? Addie crinkled her brow. Yeah. I met her a few times. She was a savvy old bird with a ton of horse sense. Oh, what she got to do with this? That's her son taking a dirt nap in our stall, I said. Oh, well, I reckon he had to belong to somebody. So what's the deal? Gabby spoke up. Well, we came home from estate selling, and when we brought the horses in, Mayhem flipped out and wouldn't enter his stall. When we went to find out what the problem was, that's what we found. Well, what in the name of all that's holy was he doing in our barn? And is that truck hooked to our trailer? I nodded. I don't have any idea why he hooked up to our trailer, or what he was doing here, and he's not exactly in a position to answer any questions. Gabby looked around. Are we sure about that? Did you see any, um, uh, non-breathing folks down there, Miss Addie? Addie raised her brows. None wearing a horse pucky face mask. That's probably a good thing, Gabby shuddered. He was obnoxious and handsy in life. I can only imagine what kind of peepin' Tom pervert he'd be as a ghost. Thank heaven for small favors, then, I said, getting up to bring the wine bottle to the table. Addie, we have a bigger problem. Don't we always, she said. Let me guess. He'd found a way around the will. Not exactly, though that would have definitely been a bigger problem. Gabby pulled her curly hair back from her face and looped it into a ponytail. I got into a fight with him when I took Mayhem and my stuff from the diamond rail. My unflappable aunt puffed out her cheeks. That does put a briar in things, but you have an alibi. You just said you were with Noel today, right? Gabby swirled her wine and concentrated on watching it run down the glass. Not all day. I came here by myself and picked up the trailer, then met Noel over in Eagle Gap. You gotta tell Hunter so it doesn't bite you later, Addie said. The front screen door opened, then slammed shut, and Hunter strode in, looking a little worse for wear. I'm almost afraid to ask what she has to tell me. Is everybody gone? I asked. I hadn't heard them leave, but then again, I'd had a little more on my mind than paying attention to who was coming and going. He shook his head. 
Jim's still finishing up. It's tough because of the sawdust. His nails were chewed to the quick, so there's not likely to be anything there, but we're hoping to find something either on the back of his shirt or on the spurs. Whoever did that would have had a tight grip, so if we're lucky, they left some skin behind. He turned to Gabby. Now, what is it you have to tell me? She took a fortifying swig, then looked him in the eye. We got in a knockdown drag out when I took Mayhem. When you talk to the barn staff, you're going to learn about it, and it wasn't pretty. Lots of name calling and anatomically impossible suggestions. He groaned. Anything else? I may have told him I hoped he died. He rolled his head back. And that's it? That's it. Other than what you know about me and Harriton Mayhem. And you don't have an alibi for this morning, I assume. Nope. She pulled in a deep breath, then blew it out again. But I didn't do it. Hunter went to the fridge and eyeballed the beer he kept in there, but reached for the tea instead. Of course you didn't do it, but now I gotta prove it, and at the same time figure out who did. <sighs> Easy peasy. Chapter 5 Hunter went back outside, taking the tea pitcher and several solo cups with him and muttering about women and murder suspects. I chose to ignore that last part, partly because he'd taken it so well and hadn't even batted an eye when she said she was innocent. A small part of me had been afraid he'd have to arrest her, at least for appearances, so I was grateful she was still sitting at the table, sans jailhouse bracelets. I divvied the remainder of the wine between us, then made the requisite calls to keep my own tail out of the frying pan. I texted Rayanne, my best friend and cousin, first. She was finally dipping her toe back into the dating pool after her last serious boyfriend had tried to blow us up. So she was at the movies with a doctor she'd been out with a few times. Next, I called Bobby Sue. Our relationship had several strands that bound us together. She'd been friends with my mama and had taken me under her wing when she passed. I also worked for her part-time at her barbecue joint, drank with her on Mondays, and co-parented a nine-year-old boy named Justin, though recently I'd moved into the background and played more of the role of favorite aunt. In other words, she'd skin me alive if she heard the news secondhand. By the time I got off the phone with her, I'd finished my wine, Ray had texted back, and I'd missed two calls, one from Anime, another of our girl crew, and one from Coralie, the owner of the beauty parlor. Frankly, I was surprised she hadn't just shown up to see for herself. Addie had been talking to Gabby while I was on the phone and said she'd go talk to the girls at the Clip and Curl and give them the information firsthand. It was always better when you were about to be at the center of the gossip de Duar, though this one would probably take top spot on the weekly chart to get out ahead of it with them, if you could. Captain of your own ship and all that. Because trust me, if you let them drive, it was hard to tell where the story would end up. It was either spill the truth or risk ending up with folks thinking Jimmy Hoffa had been right there in that stall all this time. Ray's text said the movie was over and she was on the way. I asked her to grab a couple pizzas since Hunter said he'd be a while. Tires crunched on the driveway, and before I could even get up, two pairs of shoes slapped across the porch, and the screen door squealed as somebody about ripped it off its hinges. Crap, I hadn't called Shelby. So, my little sister said, slamming her hands on her hips. Anybody want to share why our barn is full of cops and ambulance people and half the horses are still turned out, staring at me like they're starving to death? Her boyfriend, Cody, stood behind her, as eager as she was for an explanation, but not nearly as vocal. I ran my tongue over my front teeth, kicking myself for not calling her, especially considering all I had to do was open my mind and knock on her adjoining mental door. I'm sorry, Shell. Everything's been nuts for the last hour. I gave her the 411 and she plopped into a chair to absorb it all. Her initial reaction was one I didn't see coming, but should have because it was classic Shelby. I'm not cleaning that stall. You're dead guy, you're pitchfork. 
Gabby and I looked at her rebellious expression and started laughing. Once we started, we couldn't stop, and Shelby and Addie joined in. Cody was left staring at us like we'd lost our minds. Lordy, I needed that, Gabby said, swiping her finger underneath her eye to fix her running eyeliner. So what now? Shelby asked. So now we wait for them to finish up. Then we go out and feed and hope Gabby doesn't go to prison. I cocked a brow at her. Still glad you moved back to Keyhole? You bet your boots I am. If I still lived over there, I'd already be in jail. The sheriff isn't a fan. Last year, some hoodlums broke onto the property with their four-wheelers and tore up the pasture and a few fence panels. They were throwing rocks at the horses and I called the law. Sylvia demanded restitution, and one of the kids turned out to be the sheriff's son. Well, look at you, just making friends wherever you go, Shelby said. Cody shrugged. Lucky it was you and not me. I'd have made it more personal. That surprised me, because Cody was most definitely the calming force in that relationship. Then again, he was also following in his uncle's footsteps and becoming a vet. Being mean to an animal was the same as being mean to a little kid in his book, as it should be. So, it's safe to assume you're not going to get a sterling recommendation from him, then, I said. That would be a safe assumption, yes, she said, tipping the empty wine bottle over her glass. Shelby went to the fridge and pulled out a couple bottles of water and handed her one. The sound of vehicle doors slamming brought me to my feet. I went to the kitchen window and breathed a sigh of relief. One of the ambulance guys gave a tug on the back door, then went around and climbed into the front seat. As they drove off, Jim and Hunter came out of the barn. Hunter took his hat off and wiped his forehead with his sleeve, then shoved his hat back on his head. The two men talked for a few minutes, then shook hands. Jim went to his SUV, and Hunter headed toward the house as the FBI-looking truck pulled off. Finally, my barn was empty and, hopefully, free of dead bodies. Hunter came inside, and rather than sit down, he chose to stand. The only thing left to do is take your statements, and I think, under the circumstances, Smitty should be present. Smitty was Hunter's second-in-command, and a good guy. However, he's out of town at a music festival tonight with his girl, so it's going to have to wait till in the morning. I have to run back to the office and file the initial paperwork, then I'll be back. He glanced toward the fridge like it was full of gold bricks. I trust there will still be beer when I get back? I'll make sure of it, I told him, as he bent down to give me a kiss goodbye. We have to feed the horses, and Ray will be here with pizza in a little bit. I'll save you some. Thanks, sweetie. He touched the tip of my nose with his finger and gave me another quick peck, then looked around the table and sighed. And please, do your best not to find any more dead bodies before I can get back. Chapter 6 Thank goodness we had some empty stalls at the moment and didn't have to deal with the one that had now been dubbed the Dead Dude Stall. I crossed my fingers the name wouldn't stick, but I wasn't holding my breath. I mean, the name had much more flair than the last stall on the left. Somehow, I didn't think potential boarders would see it that way, though. That was a marketing mess for another time. It took Hunter longer than he expected to finish up the paperwork because he had problems tracking down next of kin. Marcus's father had passed when he was small, and he didn't have any siblings or cousins. From what Hunter could tell, he didn't even have a girlfriend to notify. He'd quit his job when his mom died, and if he'd ever worked, there was no paper trail. According to Gabby, he'd been content to spend Mama's money rather than make his own. After hunting through every official record he could access and coming up empty, Hunter ended up leaving a message for the family attorney and calling it good enough. It was almost nine by the time he got back to the farm and Ran had already left since she had to work the next morning, so we settled in and watched Thor. I figured between Hunter, Chris Hemsworth, and a really good bottle of cab, I'd be able to forget a nuclear holocaust for a couple of hours, so a dead body would be a piece of cake. For the most part, it worked.
The next morning was beautiful, and I decided to take my bike to work. I'd never been on a motorcycle until I met Hunter. He rode a Suzuki GSXR sports bike, and since Cody rode, I'd agreed to a couple's ride one evening after an extra glass of bravado. When the double date rolled around, I couldn't back out. I was terrified for the first five minutes, then became a die-hard fan in the next twenty. The more I rode with him, the more I'd wanted my own, and I'd finally worked my way up to buying one. Though I have to say, Hunter was worse than a mama duck when it came to teaching me to ride, going so far as to buy a dirt bike for me to learn on in the front pasture. I swear I'd be wearing bubble wrap if it were up to him. Last month, I'd finally taken the step and bought a bike of my own. It wasn't new, but it was pretty. A 2013 GSXR 600. I'd gotten it cheap because the owner had dropped it, denting the tank and scraping up the ugly yellow paint. That didn't last long, though. Skeeter, Hunter, and Matt had pulled together and pimped it for me. Now it was electric blue with a herd of running horses ghost-painted onto the tank and fairing. They'd even painted my helmet to match. The weather had been too cold to ride until recently, so for the most part I had to look at it in the garage. Thank God for spring. I pulled on my helmet and fired it up feeling the stress of the day before melting off me as I navigated around the curves and opened it up a little on one of the straights. I felt great when I pulled up to the shop. The peace didn't last long, though. I'd no sooner made it inside when Cora Lee and Elise, her nail tag, barreled through the front door, and Belle floated through the wall that adjoined the clip and curl. As always, Cora Lee's huge 80s hair defied gravity and all other rules of nature, and barely moved as she whooshed in. What did it look like? Elise asked. Was it totally gross? Errol, the man who'd owned the shop before me, floated through the door of my back room. Was what gross? He looked at my jeans and ratty t-shirt and sniffed. What on earth are you wearing? Coralie scowled at both of them. For the love of Pete, y'all, at least give the poor girl a chance to put her stuff down before you go interrogating her. I tipped a corner of my mouth up. She may be nosy, but the niceties had to be observed. I slid my purse under the counter, admiring the rear side of my logo, as dust mites filtered through the sunlight shining through the front windows. I motioned them to the back where I had a little kitchen area, and Errol tilted his head. Interrogating her about what? She found a dead body at the farm last night. Elise's eyes were sparkling. She hadn't learned the finer nuances of digging for dirt and still tended to let her enthusiasm shine through. Coralie, on the other hand, was a pro. Her expression was the perfect combination of concerned and regretful. Come on back to the kitchen, guys. I'll put on a pot of coffee and fill you in. When Errol had owned the building, back before he was murdered, the place had been a sandwich shop, so it had a nice kitchen area in the back. It was perfect for me because, as a kitchen witch, I loved to bake, plus it provided a nice stream of income. Rayanne owned a kitschy little coffee shop called Brew For You that was only a couple blocks away, and I made all the pastries for her. Before I bought the shop, I'd made everything at the farm and hauled it all the way to town, now, I could just bake right there while I worked the store. I also had a nice work area off the main showroom, if you could call it a showroom, that is. Most of my pieces sold before I could even get them to the front room, so there was a lot of bare space, but I was slowly building an inventory. Lately, I developed a fascination with smaller items, turning old soda signs into clocks and that sort of thing. I loved working on big pieces, but the smaller ones gave me immediate gratification because I could have them done in a few hours, versus a few days or even weeks. My first piece, a vanity that I'd made from an old door and an end table, had taken me nearly two weeks to finish, mostly because of the learning curve, but I was getting faster. I pushed through the door and kicked on the espresso machine. Coralie wrinkled her nose. I thought you were making coffee. I rolled my eyes. I am. You just don't know what good coffee is. Belle humphed. In my day, we made coffee in a percolator on the stove. 
Now that was coffee, strong, full flavored, and simple. They had the same complaint every time they came to visit, so I fired up the regular coffee pot and set about putting the grounds and water in so I wouldn't have to listen to Coralie complain. Now, I said, as I hit the switch on my espresso machine to make myself a cappuccino. To answer your question first, Elise, yes, it was gross, but not in the way you think. He was face down in a pile of poop. I couldn't see anything other than the back of his head, but that was gross enough for me. No blood or guts, though. Okay, Errol said, scrunching his brow. I'm going to need a little backstory here. For several months after he was killed, he hadn't left the shop. We'd all just assumed he moved back to Atlanta, so it was a bit of a shock when Belle, Addie, and Sherry Lynn, the third non-corporeal girl in our group, dragged him out of the wall the night we were checking the place out after I bought it. He still tended to be a homebody, especially on Sunday nights, when all the good reality shows were on. I left the TV on for him when I left for the night, and he was good to go. I gave a quick rundown of the events of the night before, which was really all I had to offer any of them. And that's all there was to it, I finished. Coralie thought for a minute as she poured herself a cup of coffee and reached into the fridge for milk. So, this guy has no family, no girlfriend, nothing. He comes over here, pretty as you please, and hooks up to your trailer. Then, somebody chokes him to death with a set of spurs. Yep. I said, stirring caramel flavoring into my cappuccino. That pretty much sums it up. Oh, and you should have seen the boots this guy was wearing. I rolled my eyes. Hand-tooled leather and alligator with the hide dyed forest green and the leather dyed red. Errol shuddered. Please tell me he wasn't wearing them outside his pants. I nodded. Sure was. Belle slanted her eyes at him. What's that got to do with the price of tea in China? He shook his head like she was missing the obvious. Any man that'd wear something that gaudy has to be shady. He was already committing one crime against humanity, not to mention cows and alligators, just going out in public that way. There's no telling what he was into behind closed doors. He waggled a finger. Hear what I'm telling you. I don't know what he was doing, but something bad'll come to light sooner or later. I couldn't disagree, especially considering what Gabby had told us about him. The question was whether or not it was something bad enough to get him killed. Coralie was all ears. This story had everything she'd need to keep the gossip mill grinding for at least a week. Murder, the hint of shady dealings, horse thieving. Now all we needed to do was put all the pieces together and figure out why it all happened on my farm. Chapter 7 When Coralie was convinced she'd squeezed every useful drop of info out of me that she could, they cleared out and left me to work. I flipped the TV to the cooking channel for Errol and dug into a box of odds and ends I'd picked up the day before. Two antique banister toppers in it first drew my eye. Then when I took a closer look and saw several painted ceramic knobs and old-timey cabinet pools, I didn't look any further. I got the whole box for 12 bucks, so I was a happy camper. I was pleasantly surprised to find several pieces of costume jewelry in the bottom of the box and set them aside to give to Anna Mae for her shop. I considered keeping a set of crystal teardrop earrings but decided against it and put them in the pile with the rest. When I flipped the box over to break it down for recycling, something sharp pierced my finger. A small spoon fishing lure was embedded in my skin and caught the light as I jerked my hand back. Scowling, I pulled it out and tossed it on the counter away from the other stuff so I wouldn't jab myself with it again later. Errol glanced at me when I yelped, then at the lure. Was it rusty? No, but it was sharp. I examined my finger and squeezed it. Too far from your heart to kill you, then. Suck it up. He turned back to the TV, where Bobby Flay was putting a barbecue beatdown on some chick. I lowered my brows. Easy to say when you're already dead and can't feel pain. After I tucked the inventory I was keeping away in the proper cubbies, 
Matt and Hunter had built me a storage cabinet with different sized drawers and cabinets as a grand opening gift. I returned to the kitchen and washed my hands. Ray needed muffins and turnovers for brew, so I figured I'd do those, then get to work on a set of rusted cast iron chairs I was cleaning up. I was just pulling the flour and sugar out when Hunter texted and asked me to come in for my formal interview with him and Smitty. Since I didn't have much to say, it took me longer to walk to the courthouse and back than it did to actually give my statement. I was back inside of 30 minutes and got to work. Four boxes of pastries and one clean chair later, I glanced at my phone and was surprised to see it was well past lunchtime. My back groaned in protest as I pushed to my feet and wiped my forehead with my forearm, careful not to get paint thinner on my face. I stripped off my gloves and took a big swig from my water bottle, and my stomach rumbled. Rayanne was supposed to come get the pastries an hour before, but she must have gotten busy. I scooped up my purse and slid the boxes of goodies off the counter, then pushed the door open with my butt. The cool spring breeze felt good and dried some of the sweat that was gluing strands of my hair to my neck. Hey, this is a business, you know, Errol said, looking pointedly at the little clock sign on the door. I sighed and, balancing the boxes in one arm, twisted the hands to let potential customers know that I'd be back in 45 minutes. Not that I had that many walk-ins yet. Most of my stuff sold by word of mouth before I even finished it, and I sold some of the smaller pieces on Etsy. Still, I was starting to garner some attention, and did have a few larger pieces in the store, so I suppose he was right, it was time to start running it like a store. Kind of, at least. I'd already decided on limited hours, because as a one-woman show, I could only make so much. I chose my projects carefully, doing mostly big-ticket items, so that as long as I sold one or two a week, I was golden and the smaller items were just gravy. I also had the farm to consider and wasn't a fan of leaving the place for too long without somebody being there to keep an eye on the place. The one thing about horses was that Murphy's Law applied in spades. If they could get tangled into it, fall into it, or otherwise get themselves into a fix— they would. Matt, Shelby, Addie, and I split the duties so that somebody was there at least once every few hours just to check. You know, just to make sure no dead bodies appeared or anything. The sun felt good on my face, so I decided to walk the few blocks to brew for you. It had been so cold that it was nice to finally have a hint of warm weather. I loved spring in Georgia. Even though our winters were mild compared to up north, it still got cold. It also got hot enough to melt plastic in the summer, so the in-between months were awesome. Brew was unusually busy, especially for a Monday, so I jumped behind the counter and started making coffees after I put the pastries in the case. It only took a few minutes to clear the line, and after, I made myself a lively latte. Rayanne's an earth witch, and she has mad skills with herbs and potions. I don't know what goes into her lively blend, but it works. Back when I was working double shifts at Bobby Sue's barbecue place, plus baking my butt off to keep Ray stocked, sleep was a luxury. So, find any more dead bodies today? Ray asked, hip-checking me. Maybe one stuffed under the deck or hanging in the loft? I scrunched my face at her. Ha ha, very funny, and no, I've managed to make it all day without finding so much as a dead bug. Keep it up, though, I know people. She grinned. Yeah, except I know the same people you do. Ray is my cousin, as well as my best friend. We grew up together, and she's as much a sister to me as Shelby is. When she opened the shop before she could afford to hire help, I often filled in, as well as provided the baked goods. And we worked together to help each other get by, just like family is supposed to do. She got off to a good start, and it wasn't long before she was able to hire Angel, a good kid who turned out to be a lifesaver for Ray. So, seriously, though, have you heard anything from Hunter? Do they have any idea what this guy was doing at your place, or... Who offed him? Nope, I said. Haven't heard a word, other than I went in first thing and gave him my official statement. 
I figured he would have called by now with something, at least, but I lost track of time at the shop. We'd sat around and speculated the night before, but it just didn't make any sense. I popped the lid onto my coffee cup and made my way to the door. I'm going over to the cat for lunch. Do you want me to bring you anything? The Cheshire Cat was the best pub in town and served burgers to die for. It would be dead this time of day, so I could eat in peace, either reading or shooting the breeze with Monty, the owner. Nah, I'm good. I'll have a sandwich here. See you tonight? She wiped down the last of the condiments bar and shoved everything back into place. I tilted my head, trying to remember what plans we'd made, then gave myself a mental forehead slap crap on a cracker. With everything else going on, I'd completely forgotten that it was Ms. Monday. Our little crew got together at Fancy's, a great little dive bar on the outskirts of town. Cheap beer, killer wings, and a couple of pool tables. The perfect place to get together to bitch, moan, and celebrate our successes. Cheaper and more effective than therapy. Yeah, I said. Of course. Have you talked to anybody to see who's going? As far as I know, me, you, Anna Mae, Sherry Lynn, Camille, and maybe Bobby Sue. Coralie can't make it because she and Buddy are going over to Rockport to the drive-in. She was in earlier for some, uh, special blends. She waggled her eyebrows. Oh, Lord. Well, at least she'd be smiling the next day. What about TJ? TJ was a girl I'd met a few months previous when I bought some furniture, and some trouble from her aunt's estate. That's another story, but to sum it up, the power of persuasion that she'd always chalked up to great people skills ended up being a witchy gift, though she did have a great personality and was easy to get along with. Her talent complimented her well. She ended up keeping her aunt's house, partly because she loved it and it was a place for her to escape, but mostly because her aunt ended up showing up post-funeral, right when the realtor was giving a tour to a couple from up north. Apparently, the woman was talking about covering up the 200-year-old hardwoods with carpet and closing in the veranda. For her part, Nora held her peace, but when the chick mentioned ripping out the rose bushes, that was it. They say the woman fainted dead away when Nora burst into sight, hands on hips, and roared, Over my dead body will you touch my grandmammy's roses. It was an unfortunate but effective choice of words. The realtor refused to go back in the house, and Nora introduced herself to her niece. TJ was adopted and hadn't known Nora in life. She also hadn't known that she was a witch, so she was a little behind the eight ball on the learning curve. When she came down, which was at least one long weekend a month, she had a lot to talk about on Ms. Mondays. I don't know, she said. Haven't talked to her. I pulled out my phone and flipped through my contacts. I'll find out. You want to come out to the farm and get ready? Of course. I'll be out around six. If ever there was a week that called for a ladies' night... This was it. Chapter 8 The shop was empty when I got back, which was unusual. Errol was sort of a prude when it came to leaving the store if the door wasn't locked, and I hardly ever locked it. There really wasn't anything much to steal, and it was off-season, so the only people around were locals. Plus, Coralie was right next door. Nobody in their right mind would pull any shenanigans that close to the one woman in town who could turn their biggest social nightmare into a reality in three phone calls or less. I went to the back and stuck my leftovers, okay, fine, my second slice of strawberry cheesecake from the cat, into the fridge and went back to my work area to start on the second chair. The first looked great, but I noticed a couple of crevices that still had traces of pink paint. I shook my head, wondering why on earth somebody would have painted such beautiful wrought iron pink. Hunter's ringtone played on my phone right as I was reaching for my gloves. Hey, handsome, what's up? Any news? He heaved an audible sigh. Yeah, there's news. It's just not the good kind. When he didn't continue, I prodded him. Okay, 
Well, you can't just say that and stop. It's just, I don't know what to think. I talked to Harry Custer, the sheriff over in Eagle Gap. He doesn't have much good to say about Gabby. I shrugged, pouring paint thinner into my pan. Well, we already knew that. She told us last night about the incident with his kid. Yeah, except that's not all. Apparently, Gabby had a huge knockdown drag out with Marcus a couple of years ago, right in front of all the barn staff. Rubbing my hand over my face, I said, Well, I'm not sure why it's relevant if it was a couple of years ago. Gabby must have had a good reason. That's the problem, he said. She had a damned good reason. They were dating at the time, and he brought another woman. Oh, well then. I struggled for something to say, because any way you looked at it, that was bad. How long had they been dating? Several months, according to Custer. He said it was serious. I thought back to those hideous boots and wondered what in the name of Sam Hill she'd been thinking. There's got to be some kind of explanation. Yeah, I was kind of hoping you could fill in the blanks. I mean, I know she moved away, but you stayed in contact, right? Surely this is something she would have mentioned had she thought it was important. Though she was a peace lover, she wasn't one to beat around the bush. We did, sort of. She'd come over and visit every once in a while, but we sort of lost touch other than that. She was doing her thing and we were doing ours. Plus, I was at UGA for a few years, so that didn't help. Still, I'm sure there's a logical explanation. He pulled in a deep breath and let it out. I could picture him running his hand through his hair. I sure hope so. Custer's chomping at the bit to take a bite out of her backside, so we need to figure out what it is and quick. I'll call her now. Okay. I'll see you tonight. I puckered my lips, a little bummed because we hadn't gotten to spend much time together lately. Tonight's Ms. Monday. Oh, yeah. That kind of sucks, but I understand. Breakfast in the morning? You're on, I said. Meet you at the diner. We said our goodbyes, and I pulled up Gabby's number. It rang through to voicemail, so I hung up and shot her a text, asking her to call me back. I worked through the afternoon and finished the other chair. I was just standing back to admire how great they looked when the bell above the front door chimed. I pushed through the door to the front room and smiled. A little old lady was shuffling around in a baggy dress, pushing a walker with tennis balls on the legs. A younger version of her was standing at the counter. Hi, welcome to Reimagined. I'm Noelle. She smiled. I'm Sarah, and this is my mom, Lainey. I'm looking for a clock for my husband's man cave, and a friend told me you make the most original things. I'd like to have one made out of a Coke sign or a beer sign if you have one. I led her to the section on my wall where I'd hung my clocks. I felt a huge sense of pride when she exclaimed over them. It was nice seeing my work hanging for sale, and even nicer when she bought three instead of just one. Laney puttered around while we talked turkey, muttering as she ran her hands along different pieces. Sarah kept a close eye on her the whole time we were talking. She tipped up one corner of her mouth, her eyes sad. Mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's two years ago. She's only 70, but you'd never guess it. She was right. I'd have put Laney closer to 90 than 70, and my heart went out to them both. What a shitty disease. Anyway, what can you do? I quit my teaching job, and I'll take care of her until she passes. She was a wonderful mother. I figure the first couple decades of my life, she made every decision around taking care of me and making sure I was happy. I'll gladly do the same for the last decade of hers. We're going to go get our hair done now. That almost made me tear up. I checked her out and gave her the friends and family discount, watching as she steered Laney over to Coralie's. The pile of jewelry I'd set aside for Anna Mae was still on the counter, and I made a mental note not to forget it since she'd be at Fancy's that night. The sun flickered off the crystal teardrop earring, and I noticed there was only one there. 
I poked through the rest of the pile with my fingers, but it was nowhere to be seen. My mind drifted unbidden back to Laney. She'd been tottering around the area and had probably seen the bauble. I shrugged and tossed it into a little bag with the rest of the jewelry. Anime would surely find some use for it. Gabby still hadn't answered me, so it would have to wait. I had a girl's night out to get ready for. Chapter 9 Sherry Lynn, who was an exotic dancer when she still had a body, wrinkled her nose when I came out of my closet. You're not really wearing that, are you, sugar? I looked down at the ripped jeans and black keyhole motorsports t-shirt I'd gotten as swag when I bought my motorcycle a couple months before. What's wrong with what I'm wearing? Nothing if you're going to a truck pool, but since you're going out for ladies' night, you might want to wear something that, well, makes you look like a lady. Your girls are all flattened, and the jeans. She threw up her hands, then smoothed the flirty, electric blue cocktail number she was wearing. Scowling, I went back to the closet. Some of us don't have the luxury of just thinking about what we want to wear and having it appear out of thin air, you know. Yeah, but I could probably reach into Gertie Buckley's shopping cart and come up with something better than that. Gertie was our local bag lady. Nobody knew where she'd come from. One day, she wasn't here, and the next, she was, cart and all. Rayanne snorted as she pulled on one of her knee boots, and I glared at her. Don't start. She kinda has a point, no. I heaved a put-upon sigh and pulled out a new-to-me pair of skinny jeans I'd picked up at the Goodwill, and a peasant blouse. I didn't know what the big deal was. It wasn't like I was trolling for men. Does this suit your highnesses? Sherry Lynn smirked. At least it was made for a girl. Deciding to take the high road and not throw the t-shirt at her when I shucked it off, mostly because it would have gone right through her, I changed clothes and went to the bathroom to put on my face. Has anybody heard from Gabby today? I called as I twisted my hair into a loose braid over my shoulder. No, Ray said. But I forgot to tell you, these shady-looking guys came into Brew looking for her. I glanced at her in the mirror. What do you mean, shady? Slicked back hair, cheesy knock-off Ray-Bans, suits. They flipped a candid picture of her at me like they were some kind of special. So, what did you tell them? She shrugged a shoulder. That I'd never seen her before in my life. They made me feel skeezy just standing across the counter from him. I paused with the mascara wand halfway to my eye. That doesn't sound good. And now, we haven't heard from her today? When were they in? Early, maybe eight. Worrying my lip between my teeth, I tried to think of some other way to contact her. She was working part-time at the Walmart and waiting tables at a little country breakfast place on the other side of town. I hated to call Walmart, and Lila's was closed. If we don't hear from her tonight, I'll run by her mama's tomorrow to check on her. A little sliver of worry slid down my back. Sherry Lynn floated into the bathroom, eyeballing my makeup job. Now you look like a girl. I'll poke around tomorrow and see if I can find the men. Hopefully they skinned out of town already. But from what Ray described, they aren't the type to give up till they find what they're looking for. Yeah, I said, worried. I just hope they haven't already found her. Chapter 10 I couldn't help it. I stopped by Gabby's mamas on the way to Fancy's, even though I'd never gotten along with the woman. Nor did I know anybody who had. Unfortunately, she hadn't seen her either, and pissed me off on top of ratcheting up our fears. Probably hooked up with some lowlife and is holed up somewhere. She said something about going fancies, and ain't no decent people ever step foot in there. Satan's playground, that's what it is, with its liquor and whores and, and ne'er-do-wells. All of them hellbound, and I say good riddance. 
She waved a hand and looked down her nose at Ray and me. She couldn't see Sherry Lynn. I reckon that's where the two of you are headed with your faces all painted up like that. They put one of them poles in there yet? I scowled and started to tell her exactly what she could do with her bad self, because Sherry Lynn was a little sensitive about talk like that, given her former profession. Her entire life had been pretty much one big beatdown to her self-esteem, and I glanced at her to see if she was taking the judgment old Bat's words to heart. She just rolled her eyes, and Ray put a hand on my arm, shaking her head. Water off a duck's back, sugar, she said, grinning. Let's go get you some of that Satan water. You look like you could use it. We turned away from the door, and she stepped out on the stoop, probably to make sure we didn't pick any of the flowers out of her toilet bowl planter. True class there. Sherry Lynn held up a finger, her eyes glittering with laughter. Hang on, ladies. Watch this. Ray and I looked at each other, then turned and waited as she floated back up the walk. Gabby's mama was still leaning against her doorframe, staring after us. Sherry stopped just a few feet away from her, then stuck her face within a foot of the woman's right cheek. She scrunched up her face for a second, and the air around her shimmered in the way I'd come to associate with an imminent public appearance. She looked just a tad less translucent, and I knew the moment she became visible, because Mama Meanness's face, we named her that behind her back as kids when she told us ice cream and candy were evil, lost all color. Sherry Lynn screwed her face up and whispered in her ear, Bibbity bobbity raising her voice a little with each syllable and dragging the words out as the woman slowly pivoted her head to look at her. Boo! Mama Meanness fell into the house and crab-walked up her hallway, screaming bloody murder about demons and harlots, slowing down only long enough to cross herself. On a whim, I flicked a wrist and slammed the screen door shut, and Ray, who's always been the creative one, blew a gust of wind through, right up her dress, and shut the lights off. It was all we could do to make it back to the car before we collapsed in a fit of hysterics, and Sherry Lynn floated through the back passenger door of my truck, grinning like a possum eating a sweet potato. Did you see her? I gasped, laughing so hard I was holding my side, trying to draw breath. Ray's face was so red I was afraid she was going to pass out. She was crossing herself backwards. Sherry Lynn held up a finger, squeaking through her own giggles. And she wasn't wearing any panties either, the hypocrite. That did it. I slapped my hand against the steering wheel, accidentally blowing the horn, and did my best to cross my legs to keep from peeing my pants. Phew, sucking in a few deep breaths several seconds later. I needed that. Now, let's go have us a beer or three. I swung a U-turn and pointed the truck toward Fancy's. Bobby Sue's car was already in the lot when we pulled in, but Camille's wasn't. As we crunched across the lot, Blondie blasted from the jukebox, and two guys with hard hat hair held the door open for us. One of them shivered when he ran his arm through Sherry Lynn's arm, and I smiled. Folks tended to write those feelings off as drafts. Little did they know. Bobby Sue was already at our regular table with the bucket of Bud Light sitting in front of her. Ray and I grabbed a bottle and twisted the top off. I had to admit, that first drink tasted awful good. My worries about Gabby had returned after the silliness with her mama had died down, and I checked my phone for a message, even though I knew there wasn't one. Hey, girls, Bobby Sue said. She was messing with the flap of a manila envelope. Hey, Bobby, I answered, taking another pull of my beer. How'd your day go? Before she could answer, Camille strolled in, looking as classy and put together as always. She was wearing jeans and a sequined t-shirt, which I only mention because several months prior, that would have been unheard of for her. She'd been all business suits, perfect makeup, and not a hair out of place. Salads with lemon juice and organic food only. Ice cream, burgers, and fried foods didn't exist in her world. However, she'd had a rough summer that had made her rethink her lifestyle. 
In short, she took the stick out of her butt and decided life was for living because she wasn't going to make it out alive any more than the rest of us are. I liked the old her, sort of, but I loved Camille 2.0, which was great because Shelby was best friends with her daughter, Emma. She swung her purse up and dropped it on the table, then pulled a beer from the bucket and collapsed onto her stool with a sigh. Man, what a week. You ain't kidding, Bobby Sue said, still fiddling with the envelope. When it rains, it pours. I wrinkled my forehead, concerned. What's up? I just talked to you a couple days ago, and things were going great. Justin's not giving you any problems, is he? If so, I'll take him for a few days for an attitude adjustment. Justin was a nine-year-old kid we'd pulled off the streets after the little brat had stolen my wallet. It turned out his mama and daddy were both gone, and he was stuck in a home with the foster mom from hell. I fixed her little red wagon for her, post-haste, then took him in, until Bobby Sue and her hubby, Earl, adopted him a few months later. We still sort of kid-shared because she had the restaurant to run, and the heathen had grown on us. He'd stayed the weekend with a friend, which we all thought was fabulous, because we figured it was a sign he was settling in, but that meant I hadn't seen him in a few days. Bobby snorted. Shoot. Other than just being rambunctious, that kid's never any trouble. Sides, if it was just a matter of a youngin needing a knot jerked in his tail, I'd be all set. I can handle that with my eyes closed. She drained her bottle and pulled the last cold one out of the bucket. Even though the place was fairly busy, Mary Beth, the weathered owner bartender, had already filled up another and was headed our way. I swear, there must be some sort of alarm on the buckets, because she always knows when that last one comes out. I turned my attention back to Bobby and opened my senses up just a little. I've always been telepathic and empathic, and so has Shelby, though her gift had been blocked until recently. The previous summer, though, in Justin's story, in fact, I learned that I had a lot more fuel in my psychic tank than I'd ever suspected. Ever since, I've kept my mental door shut, except to talk to Shelby, because privacy is a big deal to me. Doing that muffled my normal senses a little, though, and I wanted to at least get a sense of what she was feeling. It turned out I should have just wondered what she wasn't feeling. Confusion, anger, sadness, it swirled all around her. I'd never seen her such a mess. Is everything okay with you and Earl? Are one of y'all sick? I was starting to flip out a little because it took a lot to rattle her. Leaning over, I took a not-subtle-at-all gander at the envelope, but all I could see was her name. I jabbed my chin toward it. What's that? You do look peaked, Ray said, narrowing her eyes. I'm with no. What's in the envelope? While Sherry Lynn floated closer to Bobby, Camille played diplomat. Leave her be, guys. She'll tell us when and if she's ready. Ms. Mondays are for letting stress go, not for taking flack for being stressed to begin with. I felt guilty as soon as she said that, and from Ray's and Sherry Lynn's expressions, so did they. She's right, Bobby Sue. I'm sorry. She waved me off. It's okay. It's just, I was adopted and never knew my folks. And this. She shoved the envelope to the center of the table. Came in the mail today. Ray was on the other side of the table, but could read as fast upside down as anybody else could right side up. She also had perfect vision. It's from an attorney, she said. What's it about? Though she'd been the one to back us off two seconds earlier, Camille reached for the envelope, her hand pausing about it while she raised her brows at Bobby and nodded toward it. May I? Bobby Sue shrugged. Sure, go ahead. Maybe you can make more sense of it than I can. Camille pulled the stack of papers out and started reading, taking a swig of beer every now and again as she skimmed through the pages. Sherry Lynn read over her shoulder, but just shook her head at Bobby Sue. It don't make any sense to me either, sugar. Camille held up a finger as she finished the back page, 
then flipped back through the rest of the packet, pausing on the third or fourth page. It looks like they're notifying you that your birth father passed away, and this is a copy of the will. Yeah, Bobby Sue said. But what's with the name? It's all wrong, and some of the references don't make any sense. I've never heard tell of the people listed in there, including the name Sandra they keep referring to me by. Flipping through them again, Camille said, It could be that Sandra was your birth name, but it does seem odd. Do you know the circumstances surrounding your adoption? She shook her head. All I know is Mama and Daddy took me straight from the hospital up in Atlanta. I never really had any interest in finding my birth family. Far as we were all concerned, I went home with them. I was theirs. Ray started to say something when her gaze drifted over my shoulder, then heaved a sigh. Well, look what the cat dragged in. Chapter 11 I spun on my stool to see who she was talking about, but I couldn't see through the crowd of people. Finally, Gabby poked her head around a mountain of a guy who was carrying two beers in one hand and a mixed drink in another. Hey, ladies, sorry I'm late. She slid a stool from another table over to ours and grabbed a beer from the bucket. I glowered at her. Nice to see you're alive. I've only texted you 200 times today. I motioned between me, Ray, and Sherry Lynn. We even made a special trip out to Mama Meannesses because we were so worried. She cringed. How did that go? Sherry Lynn grinned. Better than what you'd likely expect, though don't be surprised if she's gone full exorcism when you go home. Expect candles and holy water. Oh, my God. What did y'all do? She glanced between the three of us, her eyes sparkling. Please tell me it was something awesome. Since she'd had no escape, poor Gabby'd missed out on many of the school trips and parties because her mama wouldn't let her participate, which is a major reason she moved away to begin with. No, Ray said. No funny stories for you till you tell us where you've been all day. We've been worried sick. Two dudes in cheap suits came into brew, flashing your picture, and we haven't seen hide nor hair of you all day. She glanced back and forth between us and sobered. For real, guys. I'm sorry. I went to the lake to think things through. I was walking on the rocks and fell in. I lost my phone when I did, and I guess time got away from me. I had a change of clothes in the car, so I changed and came straight here. I couldn't nag her anymore because she looked so woe-begone. Fine, but I'm going to tell the story, so, well, you're going to wish you'd been there. Oh, trust me, sugar. If it involved the three of you, I already do. Addie popped in just in time to hear it. Sure enough, by the time we finished telling the story, we were all laughing like lunatics again. Bobby Sue leaned in. I wouldn't normally tell tales. That was true. Unlike most of the women in these parts, she tended to mind her own business. But I don't know what happened to your mama. She was a wild child all through school. Smoked pot, skinny dipped, dated all the bad boys. Gabby's eyes were the size of saucers, and I snorted beer out my nose. No, she said. Mama said Daddy, Lord rest his soul, was the first man she ever kissed. Bobby Sue rubbed her chin for a minute. That may be true. She dated him in the eighth grade, but they broke up and she sure did kiss a lot more boys between then and when they got married after graduation. Addie nodded her head like a bobblehead doll. That's the God's honest. That girl's been saddled more times than Seattle slew. The disbelief on Gabby's face was almost comical. Sherry Lynn smirked. Told you she was hypocrite. I knew the minute I saw she wasn't wearing any bloomers. Gabby stuffed her fingers in her ears. La, 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 I can't hear you. She took them back out and glared at us. Not another word about her not wearing underwear. I did not want that visual. The smile slid from her face and she slumped. What's wrong? Camille asked. 
Now I have to go home and listen to her. Man, she's going to be on her high horse for days. Shelby and I had discussed my next suggestion, but it hadn't really come up till now. Why don't you just move in with us? We had six bedrooms at the farm and were only using four of them. Justin had his room and so did Ray. She'd had one since she was a kid, but only used it sometimes. She'd moved back in with her mom because it just hadn't made sense for her to pay rent when Aunt Beth had a house almost as big as ours. Plus, she was great company. Think Addie without the sharp edges. Oh, and a body. Ray slapped the table. Yes, that's the perfect solution. Gabby shook her head. The entire reason I'm staying with Mama is because, with my car payment and insurance, I can't afford more than the 500 bucks she charges me in rent. Otherwise, I'd have never moved back in. I was working off my rent at the ranch. 500 bucks? I about fell out. That's insane. You're basically paying the woman to treat you like crap. Help us with feeding in the stalls and throw me 200 bucks a month toward utilities, and I'll be a happy camper. Are you serious? She asked. For how long? I don't know when I'll be able to get a place of my own. Normally, I wouldn't be so gung-ho for anybody to move into my space, but Gabby was different. She was practically family. She'd hung out at our place a lot when we were in school because her mom was so hateful, so I knew she didn't have any weird, repulsive rituals like getting up at six every morning just for the fun of it. Toothpaste in the sink? I could handle. Morning people? I could not. Besides, she'd have her own bathroom, so I didn't care what she did with her toothpaste. For as long as you want. As far as I'm concerned, you don't have to go home tonight. Wait till she's at work tomorrow to get your stuff. Bobby Sue smiled. Looks like you've got a new place to hang your hat, kiddo. It'll be good for all of you. We just queued up for a game of pool when Anna Mae strolled in, looking guilty as a dog that just ate the Christmas ham, though I had no idea why. Where you been? Camille asked. Ms. Mondays start at seven. She and Anna Mae had been sort of peas and carrots lately. Turns out, after Anna Mae's husband did her the honor of kicking the bucket and Camille pulled the stick out of her butt, they had quite a bit in common. That suited me, because as much as I love Anna Mae, I was glad to give up my spot as her shopping partner. For the most part, if it didn't make you look good while you were on a horse, or now a motorcycle, I wasn't interested. I got tied up at the store. As soon as she said it, she patted her hair self-consciously. You mean, like, literally? I said, and waggled my brows. I couldn't help it. Of course not literally. She slammed her eyebrows down and glared at me, but her face was a lovely shade of beet. I held out my hands. Okay, okay. I was teasing. She was such an easy mark that I almost felt guilty. Camille was making it a point to powder her hands with pool chalk, and Bobby Sue was grinning at Anna Mae's discomfort. Ray edged closer to me and Sherry Lynn, and we watched as Anna Mae texted something, then blushed when she looked up and caught us staring at her. What? she said, stuffing her phone in her back pocket and doing her best to feign interest as Bobby Sue took a shot at sinking the three ball in the corner pocket. Nothing, Ray said. My conversation with Hunter drifted back to me, and I pushed off my stool, catching Gabby's eye, then motioning toward the ladies' room with slight dip of my head. She raised a brow, but set her cue stick aside and followed me. Once the door closed behind us, I checked all the stalls, then turned to her, hands on hips. You think now might be a good time to tell me that you used to date the stiff that showed up in your horse's stall? The sheriff over there said you went out for months, and it was serious. She scrunched her forehead. That's not true. It was like three years ago, and we went out a handful of times. Enough times that you were apparently displeased enough to throw a bottle of hoof black at him. She cringed. Yeah, that did happen. She looked me in the eye and held her hands out, palms up. It was only like the fourth time we would have gone out. He canceled at the last minute, so I decided to go spend time at the barn and get a head start on prep since we had a show the next morning. She took a deep breath and curled her lip. 
Then he and Miss Trust Fund showed up and it pissed me off. But it wasn't like an, oh my God, you jilted me and I can't live without you scenario. It was a good, solid, you're such a dick and I hope you die pitch straight at his head. I pinched the bridge of my nose and closed my eyes for a second. Well, she said, realizing what she'd said, I should probably reconsider my verbiage before I give an official statement. I nodded and ran my tongue over my teeth. Yeah, I'd advise that. Still, no matter how you painted it, it didn't look good for her. Chapter 12 by the time the night was over, Bobby Sue was pretty much back on kilter, saying the packet didn't have any bearing on her life. After all, the man was dead. It wasn't like she could have a relationship with a ghost. Well, that wasn't entirely out of the realm of possibility, but it was highly unlikely. As far as the name, she said there wasn't anything wrong with Sandra, except it wasn't hers. That was trademark Bobby Sue. Think solve, move on. We never did figure out what was going on with anime, but we decided to let it slide for the moment. If she'd found somebody, then we were all for it. After the nightmare she'd lived through for so many years with Hank, she deserved happiness. That didn't mean we were going to let it lie forever, though. Her pass was only temporary. I texted Hunter as soon as we were in the truck to let him know we were on the way back to the farm. It wasn't twenty seconds before he texted back, saying he'd meet us there. Even though it was late, he wanted to talk to Gabby because the other sheriff was going to call him back first thing the next morning. Hunter wanted his ducks in a row when he did. Hunter was waiting for us in the kitchen when we got there, and we barely stepped through the door before he started. What on earth were you thinking? He asked Gabby, his brow furrowed. Or, more like, what weren't you thinking? You should have known this would come up. She held up her hands and reiterated what she told me. I didn't think anything about it because it was years ago, and I haven't had Jack to do with him since then. While she was talking, we'd moved to the kitchen and settled in with iced tea and a box of day-old pastries. Hunter swallowed a bite of blueberry danish. That's even more reason to say something. Now it looks like you were hiding something. Gabby growled in frustration. I didn't even really think about it until No brought it up, to be honest. It was that inconsequential. He was an idiot, but the only times I ever had to deal with him were when Sylvia and I would lunch together and he'd come to borrow money from her. Wait, I said. He had to go to her for money? He didn't, like, have an allowance or something? Sure he did, she said, picking a carrot cake donut out of the box but he usually blew through that before the month was half out. Then he'd come to her with his hand out and try to explain it away. She knew he had a gambling problem, though, and it was getting old. I can't blame her. She worked her ass off to build that place, and he spent her money like it was water. She couldn't even get him to help with any of the management end of it, where he wouldn't have to get his hands dirty. Just out of curiosity, what did she die from? I asked, wondering if he'd offed Mama Moneybags in order to cut out the middleman standing between him and his big, fat inheritance. Gabby waved a hand. I know what you're thinking, but she had bone cancer. She fought it hard, but in the end, she said life wasn't worth living if she spent all her time sick and weak. When they told her another round of treatments would only buy her time, not save her, she quit taking them. A lone tear ran down her face, and she brushed it away, sniffing. She was a good egg. She taught me pretty much everything I know about the horse business, and believe it or not, that's quite a bit. I hadn't really given it much consideration, because I just assumed it was just a place she worked, rather than a job she loved. Show stables were notoriously hardcore with their employees. Long days, little pay, zero gratitude. I'd been wrong. Sylvia knew the name and situation of every person on those grounds from the top boarders to the kids who cleaned stalls and filled water buckets. She said it was not only smart to know who was handling your animals, but that people worked better when they knew they were appreciated. 
A small smile curved her lips. She was right. To the last man, every person there bled for that place when push came to shove. So, Hunter asked, bringing the conversation back to Marcus. Is it possible his gambling caught up with him? Gabby huffed out a breath, her brows raised. She shook her head. I don't see how. Lord, he inherited millions when she died. Just the farm and horses alone should have brought in seven or eight million on the low end, and she wasn't cash poor either. I lifted a shoulder. It's been several months, though. If he had that much of a gambling problem, it could be a thing. I reckon, she said, but that's some thing. Hunter shook his head. It seems like a lot of money to us, but remember, he may have had debt built up before she died. Bookies don't play, and if you don't pay on time, the late fees add up to double, triple, or even quadruple what the original loan was. He could have been millions in debt when she died, just paying enough to coast until they came knocking again. That seems like a much better motive for murder than a four-year-old lover, Spat, she said. Nope, he said. Not necessarily. Remember, if he dies, they don't get their money. Oh, yeah. Of course, it couldn't be that easy. Chapter 13 I decided the next morning I was going to keep the shop closed in order to finish the chairs. Tuesdays were always dead anyway, so I locked the door and slapped a sign on it, instructing anybody to knock. With strange men in town and a murderer on the loose, the last thing I needed was somebody sneaking up on me. Just because I'm a witch doesn't mean I'm a badass. Well, I can be, but not in a way that makes me invincible. After all, my magic only works when I'm not dead or unconscious. Better safe than tied up in a building that's about to blow up. That may sound specific, but it had happened recently, and I wasn't looking for a repeat. During my weekend buying blitz, I'd picked up a cute little cafe table somebody'd painted a hideous green. That was better than okay, though, because I'd gotten it for five bucks. By the time I was done with it, it would pair perfectly with the chairs. I was already picturing the set on somebody's veranda. I just turned the lock when my ears popped, a certain sign that a living impaired person had arrived. Morning, Noel, Errol said before I turned around. I was glad for the ear-popping thing, because otherwise the store would have two dead owners instead of one. He had the same bad habit Addie did of just popping in, pretty as you please, with no warning whatsoever. Even though I knew it could happen at any time, it still startled me. Sherry Lynn, bless her courteous little heart, had mastered the art of fading in so that a person had at least a few seconds advance notice, but she was the only one. Morning, Errol. How was your evening? He was all about the niceties, so I indulged him, both because I wanted him to be happy and because I didn't want to put him in a huff right off the bat. I'd learned shortly after I'd bought the store that, like me, he wasn't a morning person. That's why he'd owned a sandwich shop rather than a coffee house. He dipped his head. It was good, except for the cable flickered on and off some. I was right at the end of Chopped, and it cut out right when they did the final reveal. He scowled, reliving the moment. It was a good one, too. The main protein was hippopotamus, and the guy I thought would win cut his finger at the beginning of the round, a real nail-biter. I nodded my head and did my best to whip up some outrage for him, because he obviously expected it. That's a crying shame, of all times for it to go out. I'll check the connections today. It rained last night, so maybe that's all it was. Thank you. I would, but... He held out his arms and looked at his transparent body, frustrated. Even though he'd been dead for almost a year, he'd hidden in the shop until just a couple months prior, when I'd bought the place. He was still having some problems acclimating to being bodiless. I couldn't blame him. So, what are your big plans today? he asked. I'm going to finish up the chairs and that little cafe table. His eyes lit up. Oh? 
Tell me you're going to leave them black. I used to have the cutest little cafe set in Atlanta. That's the plan. The top of the table has tiles, so it's going to be a pain to get those clean. Cross your fingers for me. Will you be a dear and put it on the news for me? I haven't caught up in a while. I did, then headed to the back room to get to work. I'd been at it for a good hour and had the chair almost finished when my phone rang. I pulled off my gloves and slid my phone out of my pocket, surprised to see it was Skeeter, a good friend of mine who owned Skeeter's Automotive and Appliance Repair. He was one of those rare, all-around good guys. Hey, Skeet, what's up? Hey, Noel, I'm good. Something weird just happened, though. Weird how? Skeeter dealt with weird all day long, so if he thought it was out of the ordinary, it was likely a doozy. You know that truck that was hitched to your trailer? Yeah, uh, what about it? Well, I got it back here in Impound, and two fellers showed up demanding to look inside it. That was weird. Did they say why? He paused, and I could almost see him taking off his hat and scratching his head. It was a classic skeet move when he was bumfuzzled. That's just the thing. When I told them no, they got lippy, threatening me. I was in the back when they caught me, and I reckon they figured me for one of them city boys they could push around. That was hilarious, because Skeeter was raised with five older brothers. Even his mama was meaner than most men I knew when you crossed her. Sweet as pie. Otherwise, though, don't get me wrong. So, what did you do? I told them no, of course. They didn't like that none, though. Then they flashed me a picture of Gabby and asked if I'd seen her. Of course, by then I wasn't much in the mood to cooperate, so I told them I didn't even know her, but would be glad to pass on their names if and she came in. I rolled my eyes. This was only going to end one of two ways. And how'd that go over? About like a fart in church, I reckon. One of them went to lay his hands on me, and it wasn't quite the same when he pulled it back. He's probably going to have to have his thumb put back in place. The other must not have been too bright because he stepped forward to try his luck. His nose is going to need set, else he's not ever going to be as pretty as he was when he got here. Skeet was a wiry guy and not a whole lot taller than me, but he was raised tough. Size isn't always a factor, and folks tended to underestimate him. I smiled, but... It worried me. He could handle himself, but I was beginning to get the feeling those guys played by their own set of rules. Were they wearing suits? Yeah, he said. Slick-looking fellers. The one's gonna need to change, though. You know how noses bleed when they get poked hard enough. I laughed. I do. Last time I popped Olivia, she was more ruffled about her good shirt than anything. He snorted. You think that girl would learn? She ain't never come out on top tangling with you, so why she keeps trying is beyond me. Some folks never learn, I reckon. Listen, did you call Hunter? Not yet. He's next on the list, but I wanted to call you first. They were real interested in where I'd pick the truck up at, and I wanted to make sure you were safe before anything else. And that is why he was one of my best friends and would stay that way. He'd always been protective of me. Just ask the guy who tried to get handsy with me at a high school dance. Skeet had come around the corner just as I was shoving him off me, and the guy about lost the hand he'd been trying to put up my shirt. Oh, thanks, Skeet. I'm good, but I'll keep a lookout. I'm at the shop, but I got the doors locked. Keep them that way. And I'd just as like you girls stuck together. Don't none of you need to be alone, especially at the farm. I arched a brow. You know I'm a witch, right? Yep, but that don't make you bulletproof, and I'd hate to have to kill somebody. I'd hate for you to, too, I smiled. You want to call Hunter, or you want me to? No, I'll call him. I need to get with him about some throttle body assemblies he asked me to keep an eye out for anyway. All right, then. Thanks for the heads up. And Skeet? Yeah? Be careful. I'd hate to have to kill anybody either.
Chapter 14 I finished the chair and moved on to the table, my mind floating all the pieces to the puzzle and trying to make them fit, while my hands slowly stripped away decades of green paint. I had to be careful with the top because I didn't want to damage the tiles underneath, and was pleasantly surprised when, after lots of gentle rubbing, the tiles turned out to be arranged so that there was a red coffee cup with yellow steam in the center, and the tiles around the border were red too. I shook my head and Errol floated over to see what I'd found. He tisked. Somebody thought Christmas tree green would look better than that. If some people had a creative thought, it'd die of loneliness. Truer words. I went to work trying to remove the green paint out of all the crevices between the tiles. It would have been much easier to take a wire brush and some acetone to it, but I didn't want to damage the glaze on the tiles, so I was stuck using a soft bristled brush and a rag. Painstaking, but it was going to be worth it. An hour later, I stood and stretched the kinks out of my back and neck, but was pleased that I'd managed to get most of the top finished. The rest would be easy by comparison. I decided to call it a day and cleaned up the mess. The guys had installed a big fan in the back wall for me, so I wasn't high as a kite by noon when I was working, but the place still smelled like paint stripper. My stomach rumbled and I hurried things along. Hunter and I had opted to skip breakfast at the diner that morning, like we planned, so he could work on the case. So I hadn't eaten. I had a granola bar in my purse, but that wasn't going to cut it. I sensed chicken fried steak in my near future. I'd left the money in the till last night, which was unusual for me. I was usually fastidious about that because, in my life, money didn't grow on trees. When I walked around the counter to get it, the pile of leftover doodads from the box of jewelry and knobs caught my eye. I'd forgotten to put them away when I separated them out from Anna May's jewelry. Skeet was an avid fisherman, so I figured I'd stop on my way out of town and drop him off that spoon lure. I poked through the pile, putting each piece away in a drawer according to its function, but the lure was gone. I tried to think back to whether I'd seen it after I put the jewelry in a bag, and I was sure I had. I remembered pushing it back from the edge so it wouldn't drop. Since I wore flip-flops as much as I wore shoes, the last thing I needed was to step on a rusty fish hook. I moved things around, but there wasn't much else on the counter. Stepping back so I could see under the edge of the cabinet, I scratched my head. It was nowhere to be seen. Shrugging, I plucked the money out of the register and stuffed it in my wallet, happy that I'd made a little cash off those clocks the day before. The fish hook would surely turn up somewhere. I just hoped I didn't find it with my toe. I flipped the TV to the cozy channel for Errol. He was a huge fan of Magnum P.I. and Murder, she wrote, then shot a text to Hunter to see if he had time to go to the diner with me for lunch. He replied that he did, just as I was climbing into my truck, so I told him I'd pick him up in front of the courthouse. In the two minutes it took me to get there, he was already waiting on the curb, so he was either starving or anxious to see me. I preferred to believe he missed me, but I'm realistic enough to know it was equal parts me and fried and gravy deliciousness, not that I blamed him. He leaned over and gave me a quick kiss before he fastened a seatbelt, and the scent of forest and ocean washed over me. No matter what time of day, the man always smelled amazing. Did you get the table and chairs done? He asked. Almost. I just need to go over them one more time to get the residue off. I described the table to him, but he wasn't nearly as excited by the find as Errol was. He was happy that I was happy, though, so that was good enough. We chatted about a few things on the way to the diner. He talked to Sheriff Custer that morning and managed to convince him there were better suspects, even though he didn't have anything concrete to offer him as an alternative. Did you talk to Skeet? I asked. Yeah, he gave me a description of the car and got a partial tag, so I called a buddy in Atlanta to see if I can get a rush on it. We probably won't hear anything until tomorrow. I'm glad Gabby's staying at the farm. I'm going to pack a bag and stay there tonight so I can keep an eye out. I flicked on the blinker to turn into the diner. As far as I can tell, they're not even sure who she is. They're flashing a picture, but not calling her by name. That doesn't mean they don't know who she is, though. 
could just be an omission. They don't think of her as a person, so they don't use her name. They figure the pick is enough. That made a certain amount of sense. Well, none of us are going to give her up, but it's only a matter of time before they figure out where, and if they don't already know who she is. We need to catch them before that happens. He pulled the door to the diner open, and the familiar, comfortable smells of bacon grease and coffee assaulted my senses. My stomach growled. The Starlight Diner had been a Keyhole Lake institution for more than 50 years. The current owners, Ray and Jeannie, had inherited it from Ray's parents, and very little had changed since then. Pictures of Elvis, James Dean, and Vivian Lee hung above the counter, and photos of the town throughout the years showed how little the place had changed, yet stayed the same. Overall, walking into the place was like slipping on your most comfortable jammies. Their daughter Becky, the third in Shelby's girl group, worked there after school and on the weekends, but Jeannie was manning the counter that day. Hey, y'all. I feel like I haven't seen you in a month of Sundays. How you been? Been great, Jeannie. How about you? How's your mama? She'd gone up to Richmond for a month to help her folks out while her mom had a hip replacement. She's good, she said, smiling as she led us to our regular booth. Hardest part was keeping her from overdoing things. Just getting her to let me cook was a battle. Thank heavens we're fast healers, else we'd have killed each other. Daddy had the good sense to just stay out of the way. Everything good with y'all? I slid into one side of the booth and Hunter slid into the other. Oh, yeah. Good as can be expected when you find a body in your barn. She put her hand to her chest. I heard about that. Girl, you gotta quit spending so much time with folks who've up and got themselves killed. Any idea who did it? I snorted. It's not like I choose it. And besides... It's only been one besides this one. And even then, I just happen to be working when Hank bit it. So far, we have no idea who killed this guy or why they did it in my barn. I glanced at Hunter, not sure how much I could say. We have some ideas as to why he may have ended up dead. The problem is figuring out who did it, he said. He had a gambling problem, from what I understand, so it's possible he didn't pay up. Shrugging. She said, that seems kind of counterintuitive if they wanted their money, but there's no explaining why some people do what they do. She chewed on her pen cap for a second. You know, though, that reminds me. We had a couple slicked up dudes in here last night. Becky came and got me because they weirded her out. I glanced at Hunter. Mind you, there are plenty of folks in Keyhole that may freak tourists out because outsiders tend to judge books by their covers, but we tend to see things backwards. Let me guess, he said. Suits, sort of godfather knockoffs? She nodded. Yep, nailed it in one. They were asking about Gabby. My eyes shot to her. By name, or did they show a picture? Hmm, I'm not sure. I know they showed her a picture because she mentioned it, she said. Becky didn't like their vibe, so she asked them why they were looking for her. When they wouldn't give her a straight answer, she came and told me. Luckily, it was busy, so she had an excuse to move on. What did you tell them? I asked. Nothing. By the time I got out there, they'd gone. Becky said Olivia and her crowd were sitting across the aisle from them, making googly eyes. I heaved a sigh. Great. They probably know everything about her but her bra size at this point. Probably that, too, she said. I figured you should know, though. Coralie was in earlier and said Gabby was moving to the farm, so fair warning. They'll likely look at Mama Meanness's house first, though. Jeannie had gone to school with Gabby's older sister, so she knew all about the family dynamics. We placed our orders, and I know most people would say that after getting news like that, the food tasted like cardboard, but that just wasn't the case. Ray's chicken fried steak was too good to ever compare to a box, but that didn't mean I wasn't worried, and from the expression on Hunter's face, I wasn't the only one. Chapter 15 Right as we were getting in the truck, Jim Sanders, a regional CSI who lived in Keyhole, 
called Hunter. He had gotten an order to go over the truck and wanted to know where it was at. From what I could tell from Hunter's side of the conversation, he wasn't exactly pleased it had been moved from the scene, but there wasn't much I could do about it. He was a laid-back guy, and after grumbling about it for a minute, he fouled it under spilled milk and moved on. Hunter said, "Uh Uh-huh, a couple of times. I'm going to put you on speaker, okay? Hunter said, then fumbled for the button. Jim's voice tumbled through. Noel, you there? Yeah, Jim, what's up? I said as I pulled out of the lot. Hey, listen, there's a note in the glove box that's a little curious. I could imagine the frown lines on his forehead. Okay, what's it say? It's cryptic, sort of, and it doesn't make sense to me why it was in Marcus's possession when it's obviously meant for Gabby. So I contacted Sylvia Sturgis's attorney because it reads like an endowment. But Gabby already got what was bequeathed to her. She got a horse, a trailer, and a trust fund to cover the horse's expenses. That's what the attorney said, too. But this note is less formal. It reads more like a personal note rather than anything legal. Here's what it says. He cleared his throat. Dearest Gabby, For years we have shared a love of horses, and you have brought me countless hours of happiness. Your sharp wit and keen respect for all God's creatures have brought you as close to me as if you were my own daughter. You've often been the only bright spot in my day, especially in these last months when my body has failed me and I can no longer live my life as I see fit. For that, I'm eternally grateful. I know when I'm gone, my legacy will be squandered on a card table or a roulette wheel or on whatever else my son sees fit to waste it on. But my precious possession is much more valuable than every bit of land or horse flesh, no matter how fine. I own, and this, my dear Gabby, I leave to you. By now, you've probably been notified that I left Mayhem in your care. I've also left his tack and equipment a trailer, and a trust, because I have no doubt that before I'm even cold, Marcus will liquidate the farm. That, unfortunately, is out of my hands due to the legalities of his father's will. However, my personal possessions are mine to give freely to whomever I wish, and so now the ones I care most about are yours. I've hidden the most valuable among your other bequests. Start by looking near the key to my heart. May your life always be blessed with grace, beauty, spirit, and fire. Love, Sylvia. As he was reading, I felt a little like I was reading somebody else's diary and almost stopped him. But when I opened my mouth, Hunter held up a finger and shook his head. When he was finished, silence fell for a few heartbeats. So, what do you think it means? I asked. Was there anything else with it? Nope, he said. It was in a fancy envelope with her name on it, and that's all there was. I don't suppose you can release it to us, can you? I asked, even though I already knew the answer. Not yet. I have to send it to the lab and have them check it for prints. I'm not sure if they'll release it at all until this whole mess is wrapped up. Hunter's eyes lit up. Jim, Can you take a pic of it and send it to my phone? I'll show it to Gabby and see if maybe it makes sense to her. That I can do, Jim said. As soon as we hang up, I'll send it to you. Thanks, and get with me about fishing this weekend. We have the tournament coming up in a few months, and now that it's warming up, I want to learn all the secret honey holes, Hunter said. Jim laughed and agreed, and Hunter ended the call. A few seconds later, his phone dinged with an incoming text. Forward that to me, please, I asked, as I pulled out of the diner's lot and onto the main road. He nodded and tapped a few keys, and my phone zinged with his Doppler effect motorcycle notification. So that's weird, he said as he shut the screen on his phone. I shrugged. Not really, if you think about it. I mean, it's created exactly the opposite situation she was shooting for, but I don't understand why she was so cryptic. I guess there's only one person who can answer that question, he said, 
and she's staying at your place. Is she working tonight? No, she's probably at the farm as we speak. She said she was going to spend the day with ma'am because she hasn't been working with him much. She misses showing, but it's stupid expensive. Then take me back to my office and I'll grab my truck. Do you have anything else to do today? I shook my head. I was considering going back in and finishing up the table and chairs, but that's a couple of hours of work, counting cleanup. I'll leave it till tomorrow. Okay. Addie popped in, out of breath. You gotta come now. Two Al Capone wannabes are there hassling Gabby. I'll go back and do what I can, but hurry, because that ain't much. She popped back up, and I mashed the pedal to the floor. I thought about opening my end of the connection I shared with Shelby, but thought better of it. I didn't need her rushing in playing hero. Instead, I reached out for Gabby. I'd been testing my limits with my telepathy and was getting pretty decent at it. I'd never tried at so long a distance with anybody other than Ray or Shelby, and they were both witches. Unfortunately, I got zip. The only thing I could do was haul ass and hope we made it in time. Chapter 16 Hunter tried several times to call her, but it went straight to voicemail. Fortunately, the diner was only 15 minutes from the house, and we'd already been part of the way there. I cut it to seven, even though I could see Hunter twitching and clenching his jaw out of the corner of my eye. A black tourist passed us driving hell-bent for leather about two minutes before we got to the turnoff to the farm, and I hesitated, glancing at Hunter. If they had her, we needed to turn around and follow. I just slammed on the brakes when Addie popped in. She's not with them. She barred herself in the tack room, and me, Belle, Sherry Lynn, and Max scared them off. But they'll be back. My heart was hammering in my chest. She's okay then? Yeah, scared to death. And they did get in a couple of lumps before we distracted them, but she's fine. I pulled up to the barn to find Gabby pacing and cussing in the front yard. She put the boot to an empty bucket and kicked it halfway to the pasture. Her lip was bleeding, and she was going to have a fine shiner the next day. But other than being madder than a wet hen, she was fine. That was a good sign. I hopped out, then turned to Addie. Wait, did you say Max helped scare him off? Addie grinned as the little guy trotted up to us, grinning like, well, a mule eating briars, as she would say. He sure did. Between see-through folks and talking donkeys, things got a little too weird for them, I reckon. Max sniffed, looking smug. And I got in a couple good swift kicks, too. I raised my brows. Well, aren't you the hero of the day, then? I'm proud of you, Max. I'd been on the receiving end of those kicks a few times during one roughhouse game or another, and even a love tap from those little hooves hurt. Hunter was trying to get an explanation from Gabby, but she was too wound up to be coherent. Come on, everybody, let's head inside. I think a glass of wine or three for medicinal purposes is called for. I prefer scotch, Max said. I took a deep breath and huffed it out. He was going to milk this for all it was worth for the foreseeable future. I know what you prefer. I was speaking in general. Gabby had gone strangely silent as we crossed the yard, her brows drawn together in thought. Once inside, everybody gathered around the table and I set a bottle of wine and a corkscrew on the table in front of Gabby, along with a couple glasses to give her something to focus on, then poured a healthy dose of Glenlivet in a bowl for Max. Hunter grabbed a beer from the fridge. I took a couple sips of my wine, allowing Gabby a minute or two to calm down. Once her hand stopped shaking, I nodded at Hunter. We have a couple things to discuss, but first, tell us what happened, he said to her. She opened her mouth to respond, but Cherry Lynn spoke first. She was in the arena riding mayhem, and these sleazy guys in a black car came and started going through your trailer, she told me. My trailer? Why would they be going through my trailer? Maybe they didn't know it was yours, Hunter said. 
They probably thought it was Gabby's. The two are practically identical. Maybe they just started with yours. Gabby was swirling her wine, her lips pinched together. Okay, but that still begs the question of why they'd want to go through my trailer. We may have an answer for that, I said, opening my phone to the letter and handing it to her. She tapped to make it bigger, then scrolled through it, chewing on her lip as she read. Hello, Sherry Lynn said, her hand on her hip. Share with the class if you don't mind. We're ghosts, not psychics. Gabby scrolled back to the top and read it aloud. Does it make any sense to you at all? Hunter asked when she'd finished. Gabby shook her head, wiping away a tear. None. I mean, the last line is a reference to a horse quote. She's wishing me a life filled with horses, but we already know that because she gave me mayhem. She sniffed and I handed her a tissue. I had lunch with her a few times a week, she continued, after she wiped her eyes, and I usually bunked with her in the trailer at shows. We talked about everything from our childhoods to horse stats, but I don't remember her ever mentioning anything about things that were precious to her other than ma'am and the farm. Well, there's got to be something, Addie said. And what's this key she's talking about? She always said her heart was in showing, but that wouldn't make any sense. The only keys she left were to the trailer, but I've been through every inch of it when I was packing up my stuff in ma'am's. I had something in every storage compartment. Hunter sighed. Well, think on it. Meanwhile, we need to figure out who's running your fan club before they do more damage. Have a feeling that's more to do with Marcus, not Gabby, Belle said. I kept an eye on them while Addie came to fetch you and Sherry Lynn went to warn Gabby. They were talking about how the boss, she put that in air quotes, was going to be pissed that he was dead because he wasn't going to get his money, and what a pain it was that they had to find whatever it was Marcus promised in payment. Great, Hunter said, dropping his head forward. What? Gabby and I asked at the same time. She smiled. You owe me a Coke. I lifted a corner of my mouth. It was good to see she was coming around. Now we have two elements. The guy's trying to collect whatever Sylvia left behind, he said, ticking it off on his fingers, and whoever killed Marcus. From what Belle's saying, it wasn't the knee breakers who were just here. Max sniffled and I cringed when I saw his wobbling head and unfocused gaze. That final line of prose was the most beautiful thing I've ever heard in my life. She must have truly loved you. His sniffles devolved into sobs, and I rolled my eyes, then pointed to his giant cushion in the parlor. Go home, donkey. You're drunk. Chapter 17 Shelby and Emma, her best friend and Camille's daughter, got home from school not long after. We filled them in, then instructed them to stick together. The last thing I wanted was for them to get caught in the crossfire because then it would be personal and Hunter would have exponentially more paperwork to do. We decided to go through the trailer and Gabby's tack boxes in search of anything she may have missed. After all, it's not like she was looking for a random key when she packed and unpacked. For all we knew, it could be as obvious as one taped to the lid or sides of something. After two hours, we gave up and decided to do a little front porch sitting and think about it. A puff of dust in the distance caught my eye. Matt was coming up the drive. A retired vet, he'd come into our lives several months before when I'd found him camping in an old lakeside cabin on our property. At the time, he was struggling to claw his way back from the darkness he'd been living in due to PTSD and re-enter society. As things tend to do when the time's right, the stars aligned and the perfect job was waiting for him. When Max died, his wife had needed somebody with experience to step up and help her with the business— 
It was great for Matt because he did most of his work behind the scenes and didn't have to deal with people other than Max, who decided to stick around post-dying. Emily got the help she needed, and Matt got a job. Oh, and I got my pool and deck, which had been started right before Max died. Finished. Everybody was happy. He moved into the apartment above the barn and was a godsend around the property. Loose boards and broken hinges didn't stay that way for long. He waved as he pulled up, then climbed out and ambled across the yard. Y'all look like somebody stole your birthdays and Christmas, too. He paused, his eyes narrowed on Gabby. What in the name of God happened to your face? He bound across the porch and knelt down in front of her to get a better look. I had a run-in with some not-so-gentlemen who want something I apparently have, or they think I have, at any rate. What do you mean, a run-in? Where? She sighed and motioned toward the arena and barn. I was riding mayhem in the arena. Sherry Lynn came to tell me there were two men here. When I dismounted to see what they wanted, they grabbed me and started demanding I give them what Sylvia left me. I had no idea what they were talking about. They laid hands on you? On this property? His eyes went dark and stormy, and he was clenching his jaw. Yeah, she said, but I'm okay. Sherry Lynn, Belle, and Addie distracted them. Then Max started yammering and kicking, and they took off out of here like bats out of hell. His expression was thunderous, and the way he clenched and unclenched his fists was testament to how close he was to losing it. I should have been here instead of... It wouldn't have happened if I'd been here. I'm sorry. Hey, I said, refusing to let him blame himself for something that wasn't even remotely his fault. You can't be here every minute of the day. You do have a job and a life, you know. If I'd been here, yeah, I said, cutting him off. Same here. If I'd have been here, I'd have blasted them to dust. But we weren't, and we couldn't have known. Look at me. I waited till he made eye contact, then held it for the span of a few seconds until I saw the rage start to fade. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's their fault. Got it? He set his teeth and rolled his shoulders, but the rigid posture remained. Got it. Good. Now, go get a beer and join us if you want. We have some figuring to do to make sure this doesn't happen again. Gabby was sitting in a rocker with one leg pulled up underneath her. She was swinging the other, running her finger around the rim of her near-empty glass, lost in thought. Matt returned, carrying his own beer, one for Hunter, and a fresh bottle of wine. Have y'all eaten? he asked. I shook my head. We had lunch at the diner, but that was a few hours ago. I glanced at my phone and was a little surprised to see it was almost six. Shelby and Emma were playing with a couple of the horses in the arena, riding bareback and being goofy. Since Gabby had shown up, they were showing an interest in reigning. Shelby and I were raised using natural horsemanship before it was cool, and she was having a blast working with one particular young gelding we had. I smiled as she started the bridle-less horse at one end of the arena, pushed him into a lope, then did a descent sliding stop several yards before the gate. The gelding wasn't really built for it, but he tried hard for her. Girls, I yelled, are y'all getting hungry? Emma nudged the little mare she was riding up to the gate and unlatched it, and the girls rode up to the porch. Yeah, she said, but Mom's home. I'm not sure what her plans are. I pulled out my phone and dialed up Camille, who said she'd lost track of time and hadn't even thought about it. She was the head of the Magical Oversight Committee and was responsible for monitoring witches with unstable magic or questionable ethics. Her workload was ridiculous. Come on over then, I said. I'm throwing some burgers on the grill. We need to put our heads together on a few things. Since her transition to Camille 2.0, it was rare for her to turn down a good burger. I'll see you in 15, she said. I'm already close to your house on a job. What do you want me to bring? Chips and a bottle of red. We're keeping it simple. That's my kind of meal. 
Chapter 18 Ray needed my help the next morning because Angel had a class at the community college and there was some sort of get-rich-quick real estate thing going on in town. Why they'd choose Keyhole Lake for something like that was beyond me, but we were happy to take their money. I'd baked triple the amount I usually did the night before because we knew from experience we need it. When I started the truck at a quarter till the butt crack of dawn, I groaned when I saw the gas needle sitting in the red. I'd planned to get gas on the way home the day before, but with the Gabby thing, that had gone out the window. Fortunately, the quick stop was on the way, and it was open 24-7. Still yawning, I pulled up to the only available pump and climbed out of the truck. The place was bustling with activity. Linemen and retired fishermen and other people headed to work for the first shift at wherever they served their time in exchange for a paycheck. I leaned my butt against the truck and half-dozed while I waited for my pig of a truck to drink its fill. The pump handle finally clicked off, and I huffed when I saw the amount. It was swoon-worthy, had I been the swooning type. Since I wasn't, I just grumbled halfway across the lot on my way inside. The bright lights inside the store made me squint while I was paying, and I was grateful to leave them behind for the relative comfort of the pre-dawn darkness. A woman wearing a ball cap and scrolling through her phone was approaching, and I held the door the extra second or two it took her to get to it. She must have been as out of it as I was, because she didn't even look up when she grabbed the door and went inside, muttering a thanks as she did. Her face was shaded by the hat and the poor lighting, and I took a step or two before my sleep-fogged brain registered that it was Bobby Sue. I started to turn around and follow her in to say hey, but I was already running late. She wasn't any more of a morning person than I was, so I figured I'd bust her chops about walking right by me later. Being the disgustingly cheerful morning person that she was, Ray already had the money in the till and the espresso machine going when I got there. The smell of coffee woke me up a little, and she slid a cup of cool enough to drink coffee to me and took the boxes of pastries I was holding. Good morning, sunshine, she said, and I waved a hand as I took a gulp of caffeine. She plucked two apple fritters, one for each of us, on the bar and came back around to sit down beside me. She gave me a couple minutes to slug down half my coffee before she started grilling me about what happened the day before. She and her mom had gone out of town to pick up some fresh cuttings from a witch who lived on the outskirts of Atlanta, so she'd missed the action. Anything new since I talked to you last night? she asked, groaning as she took a bite of fritter. Oh, my God, no. These never get old. My baking was part of my magic, or, more accurately, my magic was part of my baking. The steady rhythms and comfortable routine of kneading dough, slicing fruit, or mixing muffins were so relaxing and enjoyable to me that my magic flowed into everything I made. Ray was convinced that added a bit of happy to all of my goods, and maybe she was right. If so, I was glad. Nothing. Hunter worked with Gabby to put together a list of as many ranch employees as she could remember, and he's working through them today, trying to find anybody who owns a green pickup. You know as well as I do, that's likely to turn up at least half a dozen people. She came up with almost 50 names. Ray snorted. Her memory's better than mine. I don't think I could name 50 random people off the top of my head. Yeah, I said, but we live in a fishbowl. I don't even know if that many people work at the Walmart. True. Still, it'll take him a minute to go through all of that. What about the sheriff over there? He's not getting itchy to pin it on Gabby, is he? I lifted a shoulder. He is, but Hunter put him in his place and told him it wasn't his jurisdiction and he had no say in the matter. Of course, that don't mean the judge is going to see it that way when he comes this way next week. For almost 20 years, Keyhole Lake had been run by a sheriff who'd done everything from triple property taxes for profit to blackmailing judges, so we were constantly under the microscope of regional law enforcement. Hunter had to walk a fine line between using his discretion and appearing to favor one citizen over any other. Then I reckon we better cross our fingers a single green pickup full of Marcus Sturgis's DNA turns up quick. I raised my coffee cup. Here's to it. 
Chapter 19 We were slammed all day long. Usually there's a lull between breakfast and lunch, but that day was an exception. We went through every single pastry I'd brought. Plus, Hunter had gone to the shop and brought an extra box I'd had in the freezer for emergencies. By the time we flipped the open sign to close, there was one lone, half-squashed peach turnover left in the case. I flicked a wrist and the blinds tumbled closed on all the front windows, and then plopped into a chair and kicked my shoes off. I dropped my chin in my hand and muttered a spell that set the broom and mop to work on the floors. Ray flicked the door locked and took a seat at the other end of the bar after she closed out the register and pulled the money out of the till. She motioned toward the bar towels, and in just a few seconds, we had a regular modern-day fantasia going on, without the epic fail at the end. Within ten minutes, the whole place was clean, and my stomach rumbled. Neither one of us had eaten anything since our pre-dawn fritters. You want to run over to Bobby Sue's with me and split a rack of ribs? I asked as I sent the mop and broom back to the closet. Hunter's gone over to Eagle Gap to talk to some of the employees, and Shelby is hanging out with Cody and Becky, then staying at Becky's to study, so I'm on my own. You had me at ribs, but get your own. My belly thinks my throat's been cut. She ran a bar towel across the counter one more time, then tossed it into the bucket of sanitizer. Let's go. The afternoon was beautiful, but our dogs were barking so we decided to drive rather than walk, even though it was only a few blocks. A steady breeze was blowing, and it dried the sweat off the back of my neck. One of the worst things about the service industry is even though you may be running an all-day marathon, you couldn't crank the AC down to make it comfortable because you'd freeze out the customers. That's why I always carried a sweater when we went out to eat. Been there, done that. The smell of smoked meat hit us as soon as we pulled into the lot, and it was all I could do not to drool down my chin. My stomach growled again, this time so loud that Ray heard it, or she would have if hers hadn't done the same. I pulled the door open and stepped through the breezeway, taking a deep breath. I could taste the ribs already. Louise, Bobby Sue's right-hand woman, was taking inventory in the server station, making notes on a clipboard. Hey, girls. Long time no see. She looked a little battle-worn, but her smile was bright. Hey, Louise, I said, glancing around the near-empty restaurant. Did y'all not get hammered by the get-rich-quickers from the convention? She rolled her eyes. Oh, we did, all right. And let me tell you, I sure didn't get rich. Quick. There were a few that tipped well, but for the most part, they were cheapskates. Ran me to death, and I was lucky to get 15% out of most of them. Ray and I'd noticed the same thing. For the volume we had, we only made about half what we normally would have. I hear ya, and we didn't eat so much as a bite all day. We're gonna mess up a couple of racks of ribs with all the fixins. She motioned toward our regular booth. If that don't hit the spot, nothing will. Pop a squat, and I'll bring you some tea. Good deal. Is Bobby Sue around? No sooner had I asked than she pushed out through the bat wings. I thought I heard y'all. Phew, we was it slammed today. She wiped her glistening forehead on the sleeve of her shirt. I scooched over so she could slide in beside me, then nudged her with my elbow. And thanks for walking right past me this morning. I mean, I know it was the ass crack of dawn, but cheese. She scrunched her forehead. What in the name of Adam are you talking about? The only reason I'm up at that time of day is if I ain't going to bed yet, or if we're going fishing. I tilted my head and rethought what I'd seen. I mean, it was dark, and the woman had been wearing a hat, and I was still half asleep. I shrugged. Then maybe you've got a doppelganger. Maybe so, she said. If so, I hope she had a more relaxing day than I did. You and me both, Ray said, pulling one foot up underneath her. Where's short stuff? she asked, referring to Justin. Bobby Sue waved a hand toward the back. He's helping Earl make the beans for tomorrow. We tore through six pans of them today. Speaking of, Louise arrived with our plates. As soon as she slid them in front of us, we dug in. Good Lord, Bobby Sue said, drawing away from me. Y'all are acting like you ain't eight in a week. Louise, don't reach across the table. 
I need you to have at least most of your fingers. I swallowed my first mouthful of ribs almost whole, then dipped a piece of garlic bread in my beans. It feels about that long. Last thing we ate was an apple fritter this morning before we opened. I'm gonna leave you to it then. I gotta get back there and make sure Justin ain't convinced Earl to let him use the slicer. She shook her head. I swear that youngin's got him wrapped around his little finger. Her eyes shone when she said it, and I snorted. Like he doesn't have you right in the same spot. It was Ray's turn to laugh. She motioned for me to Bobby Sue with a rib bone. Pot. Kettle. She had a point. Since Justin had come into our lives back in the fall, he'd wormed his way right into our hearts. Speak of the devil, Bobby said, motioning toward the kitchen as she pushed up. Justin, a ginger with freckles, came darting towards us. No, Ray. Hey, brat, I said, grinning at him. Ready to tell me what's in Earl's secret rub? He smiled. Sure, but you know the rules. It was a running joke that he could tell me, but he'd have to kill me. I only have a minute because Earl needs me, but can I come stay the night Friday? I hid my smile. It was awesome to see him so settled. Of course, I have some work that needs doing, so come on. He pushed my shoulder. I'm serious, and can I bring a friend? Ooh, Ray said. Twice the free labor. He scowled. And I continued, It's not a girl, is it? You didn't get engaged or anything this week, did you? Ooh, no, girls are gross. He wrinkled his nose, and I cocked a brow at him. You know what I mean, he said. Y'all aren't girls. His face went red, and I decided to cut him some slack. Of course you can bring a friend, and I won't even double the chores, just your regular ones. At both Bobby and Earl's and the farm, he had chores he had to do. We agreed they built character and taught appreciation and respect. He reached over and plucked a fry off my plate and dragged it through my ketchup. Okay, cool. Pick me up Friday? Sure thing, kiddo. He popped the fry in his mouth and slid out of the booth. See you then, he said on his way to the kitchen. I gotta get back to work. I rolled my eyes. You do that, then. Just so you don't go thinking Earl was breaking any child labor laws, Justin had a broad definition of work. He had an entire room set up in the back with a TV and his gaming equipment, along with a table where he could do his homework. The only work he had to do involved a little bit of cleanup in the evenings and whatever else he chose to do. To his credit, that was quite a bit, though. We just paid the check when Hunter texted me. I opened my phone and frowned. What'd he say? Ray asked. Did he find anything? Yeah, but it's not good. He didn't find the green truck, but he did talk to somebody who says he saw Marcus a few days before driving down the road with a girl who he thought was Gabby. Chapter 20 She tossed the tip on the table and we gathered our stuff. So, what's he gonna do? she asked. I was pecking away on my phone asking exactly that. While I was at it, I texted Gabby. She was at work, but usually answered when she could. Hunter answered first. H. I'm talking to four more before I come home to see if maybe he was seeing somebody, but the guy said he was almost positive it was her. N. Almost? When was it? She hasn't been over there that I know of. H. He wasn't sure. Said it could have been Thursday or Friday. N. Okay, I'll ask her. Be safe. Ray had read the texts over my shoulder. Thursday or Friday, huh? If it was Thursday, I know she worked at the restaurant in the morning and Walmart that night. I don't know about Friday. I crossed my fingers. Then let's hope for Thursday. Of course, that didn't work out to be the case. The next-to-last person Hunter talked to verified it was Friday. He'd passed them just a few miles away from where the other guy had, on their way into a store, though he did say he only saw her from behind. Still, that wasn't much comfort, and it sure didn't help Gabby's case any. 
When she finally answered me, she said she'd been at home all day Friday, binge-watching Arrow. Then her mom can vouch for her, right? Ray said, then immediately snorted. Forget I said that. I sincerely believed Mama Meanness would let Gabby go to jail rather than vouch that she was in her room all night if she hadn't actually had eyes on her the whole time. Great, Ray said. So it's a case of not having an alibi because she didn't know she'd need one. Yeah, I said, reading another text from Hunter as we climbed into Ray's car. The sheriff over there has it out for her, too. He wants Hunter to bring her in. (laughs) Bring her in? Where does he think we are? Atlanta? All Hunter's got to do is drive to your place. I guess. I just want him to find the green truck and get all this over with. And even if he finds the truck, he's still got to draw a line between the owner and Marcus. He can't exactly subpoena Max. Shoot, he could have seen the murder, and unless we had a way to tie it all together, the guy would get away. Addie popped in, scaring the bejesus out of me. I almost dumped my to-go tea in my lap because the lid popped off when I squeezed it. I love you dearly, but I wish you'd take a page from Sherry Lynn's book and give some notice. (laughs) I ain't got time for all that lollygagging. She turned to Ray. Your mama wants you to stop and get milk and sugar on your way home and a bag of compost from the farm. Okay, but why didn't she just call me? Addie scowled. Why on earth should she waste a cell phone minutes when I was coming to talk to Noelle anyway? I blew out a breath. You know, counting minutes went out years ago, right? We have unlimited plans. She can talk to her little heart's content to anybody she wants. And text, too. That phone's good for more than watching cat videos on YouTube, you know. Don't sass me. Max says he remembers something about the guy in the green truck. I popped in on Hunter, but he was yammering with that knot-headed fool of a sheriff over in Eagle Gap, so you need to tell him. The guy had a limp. I thought he didn't see him, Ray said. So did I, Addie said, but apparently we didn't ask the old fool enough questions. He didn't see much, but he did say he was tall meaty, and wearing a cowboy hat. Well, that would have been great information to have before Hunter went on a wild goose chase, I said. At least we know now, Addie said, as she faded away. Sure, you can leave, gradually, I said, before she disappeared. I fired off a text to Hunter and Ray swung into a spot behind my truck. I gotta run inside real quick, she said. I have a ton of milk and sugar here, and don't feel like going to the store after it right now. If you want, I'll bring the compost over to you. I haven't seen Aunt Beth in a couple weeks. Maybe we could do a girls' night. That would be great, she said. Fair warning, though. Mom's been on a planting spree, so you may be volunteering to get dirty. I snickered. I'll stop and get butter pecan ice cream and a Matthew McConaughey movie. Those were my Aunt Beth's only two Achilles heels. Wow, double whammying her. That'll do it, she said as I climbed in my truck. I started to drive off, then thought better of it. With the way things had gone lately, I couldn't leave her alone, so I waited till she was back in her car. I motioned for her to pull out in front of me, and when I eased away from the curb, I caught motion near the back door of the shop in my rear view. I took my foot off the gas and coasted up the alley, watching for further movement. Then a cat streaked from the doorway to the dumpster. Great, a witch who was spooked by a cat. How's that for backwards? Chapter 21 As expected, all thought of putting us to work in the greenhouse flew from Aunt Beth's mind as soon as she saw the movie and ice cream. Addie and Sherry Lynn joined us, and we had a great night in. When the movie was over, Sherry Lynn sighed. I hope he has a long life ahead of him, but I think he's going to be like Sean Connery, sexy at every age. I wonder if he'll stick around after he's done on that side. 
She smoothed the silk PJs she'd chosen for the evening, then patted her hair. I think I'd have a shot. After all, I'd have a lot to offer a ghost like him. What about Rupert? I asked. She'd met a fine, living-impaired gentleman on our cruise. Rupert's great, she said. But forever is a long time, sugar. I'm not sure I'm ready for that kind of commitment. Plus, she gave us her best duh look. Matthew McConaughey. I couldn't really argue with that logic. With her smooth-as-honey drawl and the exotic beauty she'd inherited from her gypsy grandmother, who was to say she wouldn't have a chance? By the time I made it home, I was ready to crash. I had no idea how Ray kept the early hours she did without falling asleep in her supper. Just as I was washing my face, I remembered that lone little peach turnover in the case at Brew. Heaving an exhausted sigh, I trudged back to the kitchen and pulled out a canister of the energy blend Ray used in her lively latte. It was probably a bad idea, but I added an extra pinch to my double espresso, tossed it back, then poured myself a glass of tea. Within twenty minutes, the infusion kicked in with a jolt, and suddenly I was practically hearing colors. Since I had no idea how long the boost would last, I decided to keep it simple and stick with turnovers and muffins, because I could make one huge batch of batter and dough, then cut them into smaller batches and customize. While the muffins were baking, I made and rolled out the dough, then made apple, blueberry, and peach turnovers. Since I had double ovens, I was done in just over two hours, which was a good thing. Somewhere between the carrot cake muffins and blueberry turnovers, my buzz wore off and the yawning started. Too tired to wait for them to cool, I slid the last batches onto the counter and shuffled to bed. The text I sent Ray telling her to come get them before she went in was probably jumbled, but it was the best I could do as I drifted off to sleep. Three hours later, Addie woke me up, whisper-yelling my name. Noel! Noel! Wake up! Somebody just came up the drive with their lights off. It took me a minute to clear the fog from my head, and I nearly face-planted into my windowsill when I rolled out of bed and tripped toward it. When I pulled the curtain aside and peeked outside, there was the same black Taurus that had passed Hunter and me. I pulled out my cell and dialed Matt's number. On the third ring, he answered, sounding completely alert, even though I knew he usually went to bed before midnight. That military training. He went from dead asleep to alert and on his feet in three seconds. It's me, I said. The black car we passed when Gabby was attacked is outside. Addie said they came up the drive with their lights off. Stay in the house, he ordered. Um, no, but I'll meet you out there, and I'll come out the pool door and circle around behind the barn so I won't be between you and them. I just saw light in Gabby's trailer. Regardless of his training, he wasn't bulletproof, and I wasn't going to let him face them down alone when I had something to add to the fight. He took a deep breath, resigned. Okay, but stay right to that path so I know where you are. I'm going out now. While we'd been talking, I'd made my way downstairs and was at the door. Me too. I turned the volume off on my phone and slipped out the door, holding the screen door as it closed so it wouldn't slap shut. I knew every inch of the path, and it didn't take me but a minute or so to get to the back of the barn. Matt was at the trailer, his back pressed against the side of it by the door. He put his finger over his lips, then motioned to hold up until they came out of the trailer. I nodded my understanding and slipped to the end of the trailer by the hitch so they wouldn't see me when they exited. Since they were in the living quarters, I heard cabinets slapping shut and the door to the bathroom open and close. They were talking, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. Though it was probably only a couple of minutes, it seemed like forever before I heard the door creak open. I poked my head around, and before I could even get to them, Matt had already knocked one of them out and immobilized the other. Impressive, I gotta say. I knew in theory you were kind of a badass, but you're truly frightening in action. 
He snorted. Please, I've seen twelve-year-old girls that were tougher than these two. Hey, the conscious guy said. Not cool. Matt jerked on his thumb and shoved him a little at the same time, causing him to howl in pain. No, what's not cool is you laying hands on a girl half your size or pilfering through a horse trailer that doesn't belong to you. Shut up before I decide to turn you loose and give you a fair shot at somebody your own size. The guy's face went white as chalk, and Matt motioned to the guy on the ground with his chin. Tie his hands behind his back before he wakes back up. Though I'd love to see him come at me, I'm not sure I'd be able to stop once I started on him. It was then that I noticed his jaw was clenched. He wasn't nearly as calm as he seemed on the surface, and I figured the sooner I could put some physical distance between him and them, the better. I ran to the tack room and pulled out a bag of long zip ties. I secured one around each wrist of the guy Matt was holding, then used another to connect the two together, then repeated the process on the other one. As soon as I'd zipped his wrists together, Matt said, Check him for weapons and take his boots off. I raised a brow, but did as he said. I figured this was his jam. Matt not so gently shoved the one he was holding to the ground beside his buddy, who was starting to stir, then started patting him down. I mimicked his actions, putting my hands in a couple of places that caused me to cringe. Matt grinned. You'd be surprised where people hide knives and small handguns. Surprised and disgusted, I replied, wrinkling my nose. However, my guy did have a knife strapped right under his armpit, so I could hardly poo-poo the process. I pulled his boot off, and the overwhelming scent of rotten cheese assailed me. Good God, I told him, fighting my gag reflex as he glared at me. You might want to see a podiatrist about that. He took a kick at my face when I reached for his second boot. Matt smiled because the guy had given him a reason, then delivered a solid charley horse to the thigh with his heel. After we had them secured, I called Hunter and filled him in. Don't do anything until I get there, he said. Not even a few kicks? Not even, he replied. Party pooper. Max trotted around the corner and heard me, but popped the guy closest to him with a solid kick with both legs. He looked at me and shrugged. I'm just a dumb animal. I don't know any better. Matt barked out a laugh, and the man he'd kicked did an awkward scoop roll away from him. Did he just talk? He talked the other day. I know he did. Max looked at him and snorted. <laughs> You're either high, drunk, or off your meds. Everybody knows donkeys can't talk. He put his tail and his head in the air and pranced off, firing off one final kick to the shin as he passed the other guy. Chapter 22 I turned to the house to wake Gabby, hoping she could identify either of them, but her truck wasn't there. Have you seen Gabby? I asked. Yeah, she had to work the breakfast shift this morning. It's the middle of the night. I pulled out my phone and was shocked to see it was 5.30. Considering I'd gone to bed at 3, I didn't feel too bad. To my body, it was the middle of the night. You can't just hold us like this. It's unlawful imprisonment or something. And assault, kicking us and throwing us around like you did? One of the grease balls said. First, Matt said, narrowing his eyes at him. You were trespassing for the second time. Second, you haven't seen assault yet. And besides, I think you mean battery. I'd be happy to demonstrate the difference if you'd like. Though I suspected he was nowhere near full battle mode, Matt was pretty freaking scary. His voice was soft and his body appeared relaxed, which somehow seemed more threatening than if he were tense. His smile reached his eyes, but it lent him the air of a wolf poised to attack. I was glad to have him on my side. 
The man squirmed and averted his eyes. Sorry, he said. My bad, man. He sat still for a few minutes, his stained wife beater visible through the ripped buttons of his shirt. Listen, you don't have to call the cops. I may be able to help you out if you're willing to let us go. The one Matt had dropped like a sack of potatoes struck out at him with his funky foot. Shut up. You're going to get us killed. Screw that. You see him? He motioned to Matt with his chin. Right now, he's the threat. And if the cops come, I'm going down for at least a dime on my outstanding warrants. Smothers a small fish, and I ain't attached to this backwoods dive anyway. Plenty of nice places in the country I'd rather be. I glanced at Matt, debating between using the opportunity to get a name or doing what Hunter asked and waiting. Chewing my lip, I weighed the odds. Right now, he had a reason to talk. When Hunter got here, he may not. Matt shrugged, obviously understanding my struggle. So, I said, deciding to get it while the getting was good. I don't care about outstanding warrants. Who are you working for? Why were you going through our trailer? And what do you have to do with the dead guy we found in my barn? Cheesy Feet clenched his jaw and looked away. I ain't saying nothing. I shrugged. That's fine. You're obviously the dumb one in the pair anyway. I turned my gaze to loose lips and tapped my foot. Well, the cops are going to be here in about five minutes. He licked his lips and looked at his partner, who was staring straight ahead. Rick Smothers. He runs a book over in Eagle Gap, an extension of his business in Atlanta. Sturgis was in so far he couldn't see daylight, and his money ran out. The man had a knack for picking losers. We had a running gag that you don't bet on nothing he threw money at. Matt had his arms crossed over his chest, feet shoulder-width apart. Yet, he's dead and you're still slapping around women on this property and trespassing. He held out his head. I wasn't down with slapping around no women. Georgie here, he don't got no bones about it, though. Sturgis ran his mouth about how he found out his dearly departed mama left something that belonged to him with this chick, Gabby, and she wouldn't cooperate. And so you decided to kill Sturgis and steal whatever Sylvia left from Gabby? He shook his head. Oh, no, you got it all wrong. He wasn't no good to us dead. Smothers ain't too happy about that. We didn't do it. Our orders were to retrieve the item and bring it to the boss to cover the debt. That's it. What about the guy in the green truck? The one that was here the day Marcus was killed? I asked. I don't know nothing about any green truck, he said. We were in town looking for your girly friend when he was killed. Matt rubbed his chin. His nose curled like he smelled something rotten. Speaking of her, what about splitting the woman's lip? For the first time, Cheesy Feet spoke up. Bitch wouldn't have got busted in the mouth if she knew her place. Matt's foot snapped out so fast I barely saw it. One minute, the dude was sitting there sneering. The next, there was blood gushing from his nose, and he was howling and spewing profanities. He muttered something under his breath. I bent down and turned my ear toward him. What was that, Georgie? Did you say you wanted me to turn you loose so you can kick his ass? I went to reach for his arms, being careful to keep my distance. He spun away from me so I couldn't reach his hands. That's what I thought, I said, pushing to my feet. Stop whining. You gave Gabby a split lip and a black eye, and she didn't do so much as whimper. Shame she's not here, though, because she sure was pissed. I'm sure she'd like a chance to return the favor. I turned my attention back to Mr. Talkative. So, what exactly were you looking for? He shrugged, keeping a wary eye on Matt. I don't know. All we know is the boss said Sturgis showed him a note he found in your girl's stuff at the farm before she came and got it. We ain't been able to find it to figure out what we were looking for. That explained why they tried to get Skeeter to let them see the truck. The crunching of gravel and the sound of a truck motor made me smile. 
Oops, looks like the cops are here. Loose lips struggled against his bindings, cussing me till a fly wouldn't light on me. You said you'd let me go if I talked. I crinkled my brow. I did not. I told you the cops were going to be here in five minutes. It's been about that long. He stopped struggling and smirked. I'm not repeating what I said if I'm going to jail anyway. He nodded toward Georgie. He's right. Smothers has people in the local lockups, and I ain't going in as no rat. I tilted my head and smirked back, holding up my phone. Lucky for us, I recorded it then. Hunter had pulled up in front of the barn and strode the few feet to us. He examined the two men in front of him, then dipped his head toward Georgie. What happened to his nose? I glanced at Matt, who started to say something. I'm sure he felt so guilty about hitting a woman that he smashed his face into something. Ain't that right, Georgie? He opened his mouth to respond, then glanced at Matt and snapped it shut. That's right, he said, through gritted teeth. And Mr... I didn't catch your name, I said to loose lips. He clamped his mouth shut, too. I turned to Hunter, then compressed the audio file and sent it to his phone. Well, whatever his name is, he explained things a tad. I just sent it to your phone. He scowled at me. What happened to waiting for me to get here? I sighed. I saw a chance and I took it. He said he has warrants and offered to talk rather than go to jail. You can't offer him a deal like that, Hunter said. Oh, I know. I reckon he thought I'd turn him loose before you got here if he talked. I never agreed to that, though. Sometimes I don't know what to do with you, he said, but I can't even be mad because you got more than I would have. Matt was hauling the talker to his feet when Max came trotting around the corner. Keep that freak away from me, Cheesy Feet said, rolling over and pushing to his feet. Hunter glanced at Max, then the dude. Don't tell me a big guy like you is scared of a little donkey. I ain't scared of no normal donkey, but that thing kicks, and it's a smart mouth. Biting the inside of his cheek, Hunter raised a brow. Smart mouth, huh? That donkey? He motioned to Max. Yeah, the guy said. I don't know what you people are trying to pull, but that donkey talks, and there's other funny stuff going on around here, too. Sherry Lynn popped in, examining her nails. Funny stuff? Where? I love a good laugh. Cheesy Feet jumped back, and Max gave him his best donkey grin, along with the fakest bray I'd ever heard. You know what's funny? The way your nose looks. Sherry Lynn swooped right up in his face and nodded. It does look a bit out of joint, in more ways than one. The guy sidled toward Hunter's truck. Just... Take me to jail, please. Hunter grinned and guided him toward the driveway as one of his deputies pulled up in a squad car. Now there's something a cop doesn't hear every day. Yeah, the con said, keeping his eye on Max and doing his best to pretend Sherry Lynn wasn't hovering right beside him. Seems to be a lot of that happening around here. Let's go. Chapter 23 Hunter shook Matt's hand. Man, again, I can't tell you how glad I am you're living here. Matt shot me a stern glance. Yeah, well, I tried to get her to stay in the house, but she wouldn't do it. Hey, I said, what if one of them had been like a ninja master or something? I wasn't going to let you deal with it alone. Besides, this is my home. I'm not going to stay inside like some damsel in distress and wait for somebody to come tell me it's okay to walk across my own yard. It's not like I'm helpless. Movement from Matt's apartment caught my attention. The curtain swayed just a little, and my first thought was that maybe there'd been three people instead of two. I tilted my head and took a step in that direction. I think there's somebody in your place, Matt. He stepped over in front of me and exchanged a glance with Hunter. 
There ain't nobody in my place. But I... Hunter grabbed my sleeve and gave me the get-a-clue look. The man said there's nobody in his place. Oh, I said, feeling like a dunce. My mistake. The awkward moment didn't last because Ray chose then to rumble up the drive. She slid her car into park and climbed out, looking around at all the action. What's going on? I gave her a brief rundown, laughing at the incidents with Max and Sherry Lynn. Did they have anything to say about the guy in the green truck? No, they said they were in town looking for Gabby when he was killed. He scratched his jaw. That's about right, according to what I found out. Did you have any luck yesterday? Matt asked. Nope, Hunter said. As a matter of fact, I had just the opposite. Two separate people reported they saw Marcus with someone they would swear was Gabby last Friday. The sheriff over there is starting to get pushy about arresting her. Why is he being like that? I told him about the run-in Gabby had with his son. The flutter of his curtains caught my eye again in the early light, and I'm not going to lie, I was dying of curiosity. Great, Matt said drawing my attention back to the conversation and shifting a tad to his right so that I was no longer looking at his place over his shoulder. The man was way too observant. How much time do you think you got before he calls in the big dogs on it? Hunter sighed. Maybe a day or two if we don't figure something else out. Well then, Ray said, we better get to figuring, but first, I gotta get those goodies to brew. I'm interviewing another girl this afternoon, too. Maybe I can actually start taking some days off. Angel's more than capable of running it without me. I was glad to hear it. She'd busted her butt there pretty much seven days a week for almost a year. Rather than hire somebody else, she'd thrown every spare cent toward her business loans and was about to be in the clear. Lord knew she'd earned the chance to slow down a little. Even though it was early, the ruckus had woken the horses, and they were getting antsy. The rattling of feed buckets and the occasional hoof kicking a wall let me know their highnesses weren't willing to wait much longer. Any thought of going back to sleep went out the window. I yawned. We can get together for lunch, maybe. Right now, I'm going to make some coffee, then feed. Hunter, I assume you have to go deal with Beavis and Butthead. He nodded. Then I'll text you when I get to town. Matt, you want coffee? He'd already turned to go back to his place. Uh, no. I'll make some at my place. I have something I need to do. I arched a brow at him as the curtain swayed again. I just bet you do. Big bad army guy's face flushed a becoming shade of pink, and I ran my tongue over my teeth to keep from grinning. He scowled at me. Don't you have coffee to make? Ray and Hunter left, and I went back inside after watching Matt stride halfway back to his place. Curious and curiouser. Chapter 24 I was dead on my feet by the time I finished the stalls. There are some things you just can't use witchcraft for, and picking road apples and pee out of sawdust is one of them. I hung the stall fork back in the feed room and pulled my phone out of my pocket, wiping my forehead on my sleeve. Almost eight. Plenty of time for a nap. My feet felt like lead bricks as I drug myself back to the house. I slid my coffee cup on the entry table, then picked it back up again and took it to the kitchen. No matter how hard I tried, some things just can't be unlearned. Leaving dirty dishes on the furniture was one of them. I did take the time to rinse the layer of barn dirt off my face, feet, and forearms before crashing on top of my comforter, but that was it. I was asleep faster than I could even think, bless your heart, let alone say it. When I woke up, the angle of the sun told me it was close to noon. I rolled over and stretched feeling like a new woman. I crawled out of bed and slipped on my fuzzy slippers, then scratched my hip as I shuffled to the stairs. I made a pot of coffee, and while it was running through, went back upstairs and brushed my teeth. 
It was the first day I'd had in a week or so where I didn't have to hit the floor running, and I was going to enjoy a cup of coffee and some front porch sitting. This was one of the many reasons I was fighting setting regular store hours, kicking and screaming. As long as I was making enough money selling my creations and baked goods, I wasn't going to tie myself to the place nine to five. The soft squeak of the back screen door was music to my ears and the comfortable silence of the house. I loved that place and couldn't imagine anywhere else ever being home. Hunter had a cute house he'd bought and was fixing up, and I'd stayed there a few times, but I couldn't picture myself living there. I scrolled through Facebook, then set my phone down and just enjoyed the sights and sounds of the farm. The chickens scratching and the occasional squeal from one of the horses were all that broke the silence. A few cardinals flitted back and forth, and the first hummingbird of the year came to sample my petunias. It was a perfect day, just warm enough so I didn't need a jacket, but the cloying heat and humidity that would weigh down the air in another month hadn't arrived yet. The sound of a vehicle coming up the drive brought me out of my chair. Even though two of our problems were now locked up in the Keyhole County Jail, there was still a murderer on the loose. It was only Gabby, though. There's coffee in the kitchen. Grab a cup and join me, I hollered. She held up the hand not holding her server apron and book and nodded. Within just a couple minutes, she pushed out the door and slid into a chair beside me, plunking her apron on the table. It sounded like it had five pounds of change in it. She sighed and propped her bare feet up on the chair next to her. Lordy, what a morning, she said, taking a sip of her coffee. I'm so glad this is the last day of that convention. I've never seen so many tight fists and bad toupees in one room. I hear ya. They nailed us at brew yesterday morning, and Louise said they got hit too. I shook my head. Whoever put that together needs their head examined. She rolled her eyes. It's part of the new We're Not Just a Lake Town promotion the Chamber of Commerce is running. Oh, for the love of God, I should have known if it was a cluster, Olivia had a hand in it. Olivia Anderson, my personal nemesis since grade school, was one of a handful of members of our Chamber of Commerce, and the only one who took an active interest in it. That meant any time they were behind something, it was likely to be a cheesy pain in the backside. It was how she rolled. I just hope there's nothing else like it in the works. Nearly every one of them ordered the bacon and egg special because it was only three ninety nine and came with a cup of coffee. She sighed. I want to heave just thinking about it. Three different times I had somebody complain about the 50 cent upcharge for cheese, even though I told them about it when they ordered. I raised a brow in sympathy and nodded toward her apron. Let me guess. Most of them gave you a five and told you to keep the change? You got it, sister. I was going to roll it, but I'm just going to take it to the bank later. I watched as she leaned back in her chair and closed her eyes, soaking up the sunshine. As bad as things looked, I didn't want to believe that she was involved in the whole business with Marcus. As bad as I hate to interrupt your piece, we caught the two guys who jumped you the other day. She turned her head toward me and popped her eyes open. No kidding? What happened? I told her about Addie waking me up, then about what all happened after, right up to Hunter mentioning how the sheriff of Eagle Gap wanted her arrested. I just don't get it, she said. That whole thing with his kid happened like two or three years ago, but he's hassled me every chance he's gotten since then. Shrugging, I reminded her of Hank. It's not like our police department has proven trustworthy, or even competent, for that matter. I wouldn't worry about it. Hunter will deal with him. We do need to figure out who the chick is that Marcus was with, though. If we can find her, it takes the heat off you. She chewed on her bottom lip. It doesn't surprise me that he was seen with someone who looks like me. He definitely had a specific type but I have no idea who it could have been. Pick any short, busty brunette in the county and he'd have chased her. I drained my coffee cup and stood to get a refill. 
we're going to have to narrow it down a bit more than that. Chapter 25 I rinsed out my cup and tried to decide what to do with myself. My thoughts drifted to the curio cabinet. Originally, I'd pictured turning the curio into a rifle rack, but I was rethinking it. I'd been trolling home improvement and upcycling sites and came up with some better ideas. The settee was another story, though. I knew exactly what I was going to do with it. After I showered, I loaded the settee into the truck and headed to the shop. I had a back entrance that opened into an alley, so as long as nobody drove through for a solid two minutes, I could magic the cabinet right through the door. I jumped out and unlocked the door, then backed the truck up as far as I could. I glanced up and down the alley to make sure the coast was clear, then gently raised my hand, palm up, and lifted the settee from the bed of the truck. Moving furniture with magic was trickier than you might think, especially when it was bulky. The important thing was to keep it level, but that wasn't exactly possible when you had to twist it every which way to get it to fit through the door. By the time it was settled into the workroom, I was sweating. Still, my back didn't hurt, and I hadn't dropped anything on my toe, so I was calling it a win. Moving heavy furniture is one of the few times I use magical exclusivity, at least when possible. I'm a klutz to the point of being a danger to myself and others, and I hate doing it, so which is prerogative? After I maneuvered the settee to my workspace, I sucked down a bottle of water and texted Ray and Hunter to see if they wanted to meet for lunch. Both of them said they were too busy, so I ran down to Ray's and grabbed one of her daily specials. She ran a limited lunch menu that usually consisted of one soup and two or three different easy-to-make sandwiches. She was too busy to talk, but not so busy they needed me, so I just made myself a chicken salad sandwich and went back to the shop. Errol still wasn't around, so I turned the TV off and went to the back to finish up the table and chairs. I was glad to see him getting out and about. Addie said he'd shown up for Wednesday movie night at the theater and was finally starting to integrate into the local post-passing community. I missed him a little, though. I was walking through to make coffee when the sun glinted off something on the counter. I stopped in my tracks to see what it was. My little box of paper clips was knocked over, and the clips were scattered all over. Frowning, I picked them up and put them back in the box, then put the box in a drawer. I couldn't for the life of me figure out how they'd been spilled, because Errol sure didn't do it, and I'm pretty sure there was no great paperclip thief running around, though, in Keyhole, he never could be sure. Still, a fetish like that wouldn't have flown under Coralie's radar. I shrugged and slid them back in the drawer, then locked the front door and flipped the please knock sign so I could get to work. It took me less than an hour to clean the final layer of greenish film from the table, and I stood back to admire my work. I was happy with it. A couple of red checkered cushions for the chairs, and they'd be perfect. I snapped a couple pics of the set for my website, then set to work removing the cracked and faded maroon fabric on the settee. It was so dry-rotted, it ripped when I tried to lift it off, all in one piece, so I ended up peeling it off in strips. The smell of old fabric and musty barn wafted up to my nose, along with the fifty years of dust, causing me to sneeze. I didn't usually use masks because they made me feel claustrophobic, but... I grabbed one off the shelf and slipped it on. In no time at all, I had it stripped down to the wood and was pleasantly surprised to find very little damage to the structure. Another downside I discovered the hard way, which was why I didn't blow a ton of money on pieces, was that just because a piece looked sound didn't mean it was. I still could have used parts of the settee had that been the case, but it would have been a bummer. I'd just finished sweeping up the mess when Shelby texted. She and Cody were going for a ride on his motorcycle, and she wanted to know if Hunter and I wanted to join them. I messaged Hunter to see if he was available, and when he was, I told her we'd meet her at the farm in half an hour. When I pulled up twenty minutes later and shut off my bike, she laughed. You cheated. You started without us. I grinned as I pulled off my helmet. 
Nah, I was just warming it up. It's so nice out, I couldn't resist. I unzipped my jacket part way. Where do y'all want to go? Cody, still in that lanky teenage phase, ambled up. We thought about riding over to the Golden Corral for supper, but we're open to suggestions. I wrinkled my brow. That was almost to Eagle Gap. That's kind of far. It's going to get cold after the sun sets. The distinctive sound of Hunter's pipes sounded, and I turned to see him making the curve in the driveway with Matt right behind him in his work truck. When they pulled up, Matt waved and meandered over to us. Y'all heading out? I nodded. We didn't expect you to be home so early. Want to go with us? We're thinking about getting some supper. He smiled but shook his head. No, you all go on. I have some things to do. By that time, Hunter had pulled his helmet off and was standing beside me. You sure? It's a great afternoon for it. I can't argue with that, but I really can't. I already made plans. The stirring curtains in his apartment the other morning popped to mind, and I tilted my head, looking at him sideways. Plans, huh? Big date? His face turned crimson, and Hunter nudged me. Don't be nosy, he said, then dropped a kiss on my temple to take the sting out. Man said he had plans. Leave it be. Matt grinned at him. Thanks, man. He turned and walked in the direction of his place, calling over his shoulder, Be safe. Shiny side up and enjoy your ride. I turned to Hunter when he was gone and narrowed my eyes. You know something. What is it? He tilted one side of his mouth up and pulled me to him. I know you're beautiful and your heart's in the right place, but you've been hanging out with Coralie too much. He gave me a sweet kiss and I almost forgot that he'd just insulted me. Almost. Gross, Shelby said. Are we gonna ride or stand here and watch you two make out all evening? I pushed away. I don't know. They're equally tempting, but I suppose we should probably get a move on. We decided to take the back roads to a great little steakhouse on the other side of Keyhole Lake. It wasn't as far as Eagle Gap, and Cody knew a ton of great little back roads. He'd moved in with his Uncle Will after his parents died the summer before, and had spent a lot of time on his bike trying to find himself after the tragedy. The smell of sizzling meat made my mouth water a block before we pulled into the restaurant. By the time we were seated and the waiter brought us our drinks, I was starving. As usual, I over-ordered, and by the time the steak came, I'd filled up on bread and salad. I gave it the old country girl try, but ended up boxing most of my meal. And a piece of cheesecake. It was nice catching up with Shelby. It seemed like she was always busy, and we hadn't been spending much time together. I made a vow then and there to remedy it. She was in her junior year of high school, and I knew she'd go off to college and be gone before too long. I leaned back, watching in amazement as both Hunter and Cody polished off the last of what looked like 20-pound ribeyes and laughed when Shelby said, You know, guys, there's no rule that says you have to eat the whole cow in one sitting, right? Cody chased one of his last bites with a drink of tea, then grinned at her. Ain't no rule that says you can't either. Man logic. She glanced over my shoulder and crinkled her brow. What? I turned to see what she was looking at, but nothing jumped out at me. It's just, I would have sworn I just saw Bobby Sue, but she wasn't with Earl. I shrugged, but craned around harder, my gaze roaming over the crowd. Maybe she's out with Coralie or somebody. No, Shelby said. It definitely wasn't Coralie, and the somebody was holding her hand. But there's no way. I waved her off. It must have been a trick of the light. She shook her head. No, it was plain as day. There's one way to find out. I pulled out my phone and called Bobby. Justin answered her phone on the second ring. Hey, kiddo. Can I talk to Bobby Sue? She's not here right now, he said. She's at the grocery store, but she forgot her phone. 
You want me to tell her to call you when she gets back? Nah, I said. I'll talk to her tomorrow. Okay. You're still coming to get me and my friend tomorrow, right? Absolutely, brat. I'll see you after school. Okay. Bye. She's there? Shelby asked, puckering her lips in confusion as I put my phone away. No, he said she's at the store. I thought back to the morning at the quick stop. There was definitely something weird going on. Chapter 26 I had a hair appointment the next morning and was looking forward to hearing what the Keyhole Lake Information Dissemination Center had in the works that day. That was one of the kinder ways of saying I was looking forward to visiting the gossip mill. First, though, I went to the shop a little early to bake and hang out with Errol. Angus and his girlfriend Trouble stopped in to say hi, too. They'd been recently reunited, and Angus was a different ghost. He'd always been kind and funny, but for the entire time I'd known him, there were shadows behind his eyes, like he was just plumb worn down by life, then by death. It turns out, trouble was the cause of that sadness, and I was tickled pink they were back together. It seemed tragic to me that they'd missed a lifetime together, but when I mentioned it, Angus just smiled and said, Sugar Plum, you can't be sad about that. We have forever together. Sides, a lot of folks wouldn't be who they are today if things had been different. Everything happened just like it was meant to. What do you say to that? We hung out for a bit and watched a couple game shows while the goodies were in the oven. Then I put it over to the Cozy Channel so they could watch the old shows that weren't so old to them. I made sure I was a little early for my appointment. Belle got her knickers all in a twist if you were late because she said that they built being fashionably late into the appointment time. When I got there, Coralie was finishing up with Roberta, one of the members of the Inner Sanctum. She did a lot of charitable work around the community and had been one of the folks cursed a few months before. That's another story you've probably already heard, so I'll skip the details, but all was right in her world again. Roberta was okay, but she had a bit of a self-righteous streak. She could look down her nose at you with the best of them and was a pro at backhanded compliments, but she was mostly harmless. Coralie and Belle kept her in check when her tendency toward meanness got a little too far off the rails. Over the years, I'd wondered if it was meanness or just lack of empathy, because she'd had a silver spoon in her mouth for so long. Whatever it was, I got on with her okay. I said hello and glanced toward the little mini-fridge Coralie kept to see if she had set out brownies. Coralie wasn't a witch, but both her scissors and her brownies were sheer magic. They're in the back, sugar, she said. I had the Harrison sisters in this morning, and Lord, those girls will eat you out of house and home if you leave food out. While she was cementing Roberta's impossibly tall hairdo into place with half a can of Aquanet, I made myself at home and fetched a couple. They were so rich you needed a glass of milk to do them justice, but sometimes you just have to take what you can get. What's going on with the murder? She asked, around the bobby pins in her mouth. Not much. I swallowed the gooey chocolate and grabbed a bottle of water from the fridge. You probably know everything I do. She smiled. I certainly hope so. I also hear tell Matthew has a bow. I leaned forward, then felt instantly ashamed of myself. Matt was a good guy and my friend. If he wanted me to know he'd tell me. Belle noticed my expression and swooped over. Now don't you go thinking we're letting speculation run wild on him. That ain't the case. Matthew's one of us, and woe be to the woman who does him any harm. We'd ruin her. Let the record show that's the first time I'd ever heard those girls threaten to intentionally wield their powers for evil. But have no doubt, if they set their minds to it, they could have someone tarred, feathered, and rode out of town on a rail. That's right, Coralie said. We just want to know who's caught his eye. I narrowed my eyes. 
Tell me you don't have a pull going on him. Just for entertainment purposes, they kept little side bets going on everything from when somebody was going to fix their mailbox to when a person was going to kick the bucket. They could get detailed. For instance, when Hank was killed, they had a double bet running on him. Not only did you have to guess the approximate time frame, you also had to choose murder or natural causes. With the way he abused people and stuffed fried food and donuts into his pie hole, it was just a matter of time before one or the other did him in. I didn't learn about the betting system until right around the time somebody killed him. Come to find out, they were running one on when Hunter and I would go on our first date, and they currently had one running on when we'd get hitched, but as far as I was concerned, they were playing the long game on that one. We weren't in any hurry and we're perfectly happy to click along at our own pace. Course we have a bet going, Belle said. Sorta, anyway. At this point, it's just on when he'll take somebody out. He hasn't shown so much as a wink of interest in anybody, so we couldn't come up with a clear betting pool of names. I shook my head as I climbed into the chair and Coralie wrapped the cape around me. Y'all have no shame. Coralie snorted. Shame's for when you're doing something wrong, and we're not. So, who is she? I heaved a sigh, giving up any pretense of outrage or shame myself. I have no idea. I'm almost positive there is somebody, but don't have a clue who it may be. Well, when you find out, Coralie said, I expect you'll let us know so's we can monitor the situation. I rolled my eyes. I have utter faith that you'll know long before I do. Belle puffed up a little since her faith in their snooping skills was restored. Course we will. We'll be sure to let you know so you can keep an eye on her at your place, too. Won't do for some two-bit floozy to come traipsing in trying to take advantage of our boy now that he's finally getting his life back. She crossed her arms. We won't have it. I bit my lip to keep from smiling, but it actually warmed my heart to know they'd taken him under their wings. That was no big thing for them, and like she said, Matt didn't need any bullshit just when things were finally coming back to level for him. Oh, I keep meaning to ask, I said. Did Buddy ever apologize for proposing to you on Valentine's Day? Buddy was her boyfriend of 15 years, but he'd been hit with a love spell and had up-dumped her apple cart, and his for that matter, by breaking their agreement and proposing marriage. A sappy smile spread across her face. Yeah, he's such a sweet man. He promised he'd never do it again and built me the cutest set of planters out of old truck tires. I tilted a corner of my mouth up as she leaned my head back into the sink. All's well that ends well, then. Roberta was due at the church to do the books, but she told me as she left how beautiful a September wedding would be. I rolled my eyes. At least I knew what time of year she had her money on. For the next several minutes, I just basked in the sheer pleasure of her acrylic nails massaging my scalp. I swear, sometimes there's not a better feeling in the world than having somebody else especially somebody as skilled as she was, messing with your hair. By the time she wrapped a towel around my head and tilted me back up, I was much more relaxed. Her scissors flew around my head as she trimmed off dead ends and thinned out my wild mass of curls so they were at least somewhat manageable. She was doing the final scrunching blow-dry when my phone zinged with a text from Hunter. What on earth was that? Belle asked. The Doppler effect with a motorcycle, I said. The what? She said, scrunching her brows together. It's a motorcycle passing by. Oh, she said. Why didn't you just say so? I rubbed my face. Why not, indeed? When it zinged a second, then a third time, Belle huffed. Back in my day, that would have been rude, she said. Honestly, I said, willing to take my licks because I deserved them. It is today, too. I'm sorry about that. Motioning toward my phone, I asked Elise to hand it to me from where I'd left it by the brownies so I could see what he wanted and mute it. I swiped my phone open and scanned his messages. 
Well, Coralie said, what's the big emergency? Before answering, I chewed on my lip, trying to decide how much to share. Lifting a shoulder, I figured they may as well get it straight for me. They'd know about it in a couple hours tops anyway. They found a man who owns a green truck. According to some of the farmhands, Marcus screwed him out of some money, so Hunter's going over to question the guy. He roughly fits the description Max gave us. Oh, thank you, sweet baby Jesus, Elise said. Maybe we'll finally be able to get a solid night's sleep without worrying because the doors are unlocked. Coralie just took a deep breath, shook her head, and patted her on the arm. Bless your little heart. Chapter 27 I left Coralie's with a lot on my mind. I wanted to talk to Bobby Sue to see what was up with her, but had no idea how to approach it. I refused to believe she was stepping out on Earl, but something stunk, and if she was in trouble, I wanted to help. First, though, there was the whole green truck thing to deal with. Max had said the man was big and had a limp, and I was anxious to hear if the guy Hunter found met the description or not. Unfortunately, that description wasn't any good for practical purposes, because we didn't have any other witnesses. Hunter had been going about it from the other end. He'd been looking for people who had a grudge publicly and privately keeping track of what they drove. He'd told the sheriff he'd gotten an anonymous tip, but that was worthless. He'd have to build a case without the vehicle first. Hopefully, he'd lucked out. Rather than call him, I stopped in my shop and tossed a few pastries in a bag, then walked to the courthouse. Peggy Sue, Hunter's pleasantly plump receptionist, and the woman who really ran the courthouse, smiled when she saw me, her round face lighting up. She stood up and came around the desk to give me a hug. Noel, what a nice surprise. Look at your hair. Why, you're just pretty as a picture. Hey, Peggy Sue. Thank you, I said, hugging her back. That's a pretty dress you're wearing. When Hank ran the town, she'd been one of the crabbiest people I'd ever met and always wore stark navy dresses with her hair pulled into a tight bun. Come to find out, She'd just been miserable doing Hank's dirty work, but needed the job and had nobody to go to with her concerns. Hank owned the town, lock, stock, and barrel. It took him dying for everything to come to rights. Now, she wore bright sundresses, had little ringlets of hair loose around her face, and smiled all the time. My heart broke for how miserable such a wonderful person had been for so long. One of many. She blushed and flapped a hand at me. Sure, oh, I picked this up at the Goodwill for five bucks. She eyed the bag. I sure do hope that's what I think it is, and I hope it's for me. I held it out to her. It sure is. Strawberry cream cheese danishes. I know they're your favorites, and I just baked them this morning. Peggy Sue had done me a couple good turns. First, with the taxes on the farm when I was about to lose it, then, by digging up the records for my shop and letting me know that the county had acquired it for back taxes and letting me buy it for what was owed. I figured I owed her a lifetime of pastries, and I was trying to find some pretty piece to repurpose for her, too. She grinned and went to fill up her coffee, motioning me down the hall. He's in his office, Shug. You just go on back. His door was open, so I tapped on the frame. Once Gabby had given him the list, he started with the people she said were most likely to stay in touch with Marcus. One of the ones that she described as being in his inner circle, Dirk Henderson, had been out of town when Hunter had arranged the interviews, but had returned his call as soon as he heard. According to Dirk, a guy named Sam Keith had loaned Marcus a bunch of money, and Marcus had missed the date when he was supposed to pay him back. Sam, he said, was fit to be tied and had left a dozen messages all over town detailing what was going to happen if he didn't get his money. And this Sam Keith drives a green truck? I asked, taking one of the black office chairs in front of his desk. He nodded. I'm going to go see him right now to see if he matches the description Max gave us. It's not like I could come out and ask Sheriff Custer. He's an odd duck anyway. 
I lifted a shoulder. He has a lot of territory to cover, and now he's got you coming into his county digging around. Remember how it was when you first came here? Folks tend to circle the wagons when strangers ride in. You're right, but it's still frustrating. I just want to solve this and move on. It'd be helpful if he weren't dead set that Gabby did it, too. He thinks I'm wasting my time and his by even looking any further. Yeah, I said. That doesn't surprise me. He's got a ready-made suspect. To be fair, I'd probably feel the same way he does, without the tunnel vision, if I were on the outside looking in. Jilted lover who had a second huge fight in which she told him to die, then he turns up dead in her barn. When you look at it like that, it seems cut and dried. He arched a brow and smiled. Maybe you shouldn't talk to him. You're much more succinct than he is. If he could string thoughts together like that, he'd have convinced the judge yesterday to issue a warrant. That caught my attention. Wait, what? He tried to get a warrant on her? Hunter leaned back in his chair with his hands clasped behind his head. He sure did. But when the judge asked for evidence, all he had was circumstantial stuff, and I threw in the anonymous tip about the truck. It was close, though. If Max hadn't given us that to go on, her goose would be cooked and there's nothing I could have done about it. I drummed my fingers on his desk, and an idea popped into my head. Are you talking to anybody else over there today? No, just him. He narrowed his eyes. Why? What are you thinking? Relax, I said, leaning back in my own chair. I'm just thinking maybe I should go with you. Bring a little mojo. You know, nothing serious, but I could tell if he's lying or not. He leaned forward, shaking his head. Absolutely not. How would I explain why my girlfriend, and Gabby's friend, is with me? I huffed out a frustrated breath. I know you're right. And even if we thought he was lying, what could we do with that information? Add your girlfriend's witchy intuition to the talking donkey's testimony? You know, he said, smiling, when you put it that way, it makes my life seem a whole lot stranger than it feels. I don't know how I feel about that. I stood and walked around his desk and sat in his lap. You feel awesome about it. After all, what would you do without the witch, or even the talking donkey? He wrapped his arms around me and gave me a kiss. I don't know, and I don't intend to find out. Chapter 28 I had a few hours to kill before I had to pick up Justin from Bobby Sue's, so I went back to the shop. I still had to strip the sticky old lacquer and layers of grime from the settee before I could start the transformation. I was trying to decide whether I wanted to stain it or go for a distressed look using country blue and white paints, but that was neither here nor there until I got rid of the gunk. My phone buzzed in my back pocket an hour or so later, and I stood stripping my gloves off and setting aside the putty knife I was using to oh-so-carefully scrape off fifty years of barn funk and cigarette tar. TJ's face popped onto the screen as I pulled it out. Hey, I said, as I stretched the kinks out of my back. Hey, back, she said. I'm in town and wondered if you wanted to get together for lunch. Moira's with me, and we have a couple ideas we want to run past you. Curious as to what they'd possibly need my opinion on, I agreed. Meet you at the cab? I was thinking maybe Ray's, since I'd like her input too. The caffeine would probably be a good thing anyway. That works. When? We're on our way there now. Say, ten? I'm covered to my elbows in paint thinner and sludge. Give me twenty. We disconnected, and I couldn't help but wonder what they were thinking about. TJ was still learning to use her witchy powers, and I know she was struggling with the Regional Witches Council in Virginia where she lived. Apparently, some bigoted old biddies on the board refused to believe she'd lived 30 years without knowing she was a witch. I felt bad for her, 
because up until a few months ago, she hadn't even known magic was a real thing. Unfortunately, one of her gifts was the power of persuasion, and she'd used it, albeit unwittingly, all her life. The old bats in her regional council were damned and determined to make the transition even harder for her than it already was. Camille and Aurora, the leader of our council, had tried to work with them to smooth the way for her, but even they had given up. So, TJ was left mostly to her own devices. Thankfully, Moira was a witch and could teach her the mundane things, but her speciality was space manipulation. She could actually make herself blend so well into her environment by reflecting and refracting light that she was all but invisible. However, she had no idea how to help TJ because her powers were mental rather than physical. Thus, whenever she came down, we all tried to work with her as much as possible to refine her skills. By the time I cleaned up myself in the area, it had already been 20 minutes. I rushed out the door, hollering over my shoulder to Errol that I'd be back in an hour. Since I was late, TJ and Moira were waiting for me when I got there, and Ray had made all of us coffee. Rue was empty, except for us. Angel was even already gone. Hey, ladies, I said, scooching in next to Ray. What are these ideas you want to run past us? I've had everything from bootlegging to psychic gift shops running through my head since we talked. T.J. laughed, her eyes sparkling. Nothing so dangerous as bootlegging and nothing so cliché as a psychic gift shop. She and Moira looked at each other. We're considering moving down here for good. We? I said, looking back and forth between them. Yep, Moira said. Dealing with our council for the last few months has turned my stomach. We're in marketing, for heaven's sake. There's no reason why we can't do that from anywhere. We both stuck with a brick-and-mortar business for the health insurance and benefits, but then we started doing a little freelance stuff on the side and found out we can make just as much money on our own. Well, TJ said, I can. Moira wants to try her hand at design. When we were down here, selling the house, the realtor kept complaining that staged houses sell so much better but there aren't any good designers around willing to do that, and owners don't want to take it upon themselves. That actually sounds like a cool job, Ray said. Are you just going to do it for realtors, or are you going to do private contracts too? Because, you know, I know somebody. She motioned toward me with her head, who makes custom pieces that add grace and beauty to any home. I bumped her with my shoulder and laughed. You have an amazing way of polishing turds. She scowled. Don't you dare talk yourself down. You may be new, but people are already asking questions on your website, looking for your next pieces. That shut me up. They are? I didn't even know there was a way for them to ask questions, except by calling me. When it came to that end of the business, I had to admit, I was lax. She'd built the site for me and helped me maintain it because I just wasn't good at it. Oh, geez, she said, rolling her eyes. Of course there's a way for them to ask questions. Several ways, actually. How do you think you sold the vanity for more money than you were asking for it? People got into a bidding war in the comment section of the page. Oh, I said, a little stunned. I just thought you raised the asking price. By five hundred dollars? She asked, her eyebrows shooting into her hair. Wait, TJ said. You mean the vanity she made from the old door and end table I gave her? Yeah, I said. The first day I met her, she was clearing out her recently deceased, but unbeknownst to her, not dearly departed aunt's house for sale. I'd stumbled upon the sale just by seeing the sign on the road. Of course, that had led to a hot magical mess that took some serious finagling to straighten out, but that didn't have anything to do with the door or table. Much. She leaned across the table. Now I gotta know. If a bidding war took it up by five hundred bucks, what did you make off a dilapidated door and a beat-up end table? I grinned at her. 
enough that you're going to wish you'd have charged me for them. Shut up, she said. How much? Two grand. I felt a little like a peacock, but I was proud of that piece. It was my first, and I'd hated to let it go, but two grand. Wow, Moira said, and to think of all the stuff we sent to the dump that day. I'd thought the exact same thing when she told me she chucked a bunch of other potential goodies. Yeah, TJ said, leaning back into the booth. I could have let you have it on commission. Ray laughed. I told you she's good. She pulled up a picture of the piece, and Moira's eyes grew round. Wow, no, that's gorgeous. Seriously, if I get into the personal design side of the business, you'll have a solid customer. Thank you, but let's talk more about the logistics here. When are you thinking about moving? Well, TJ said, taking a cookie from a plate Ray had placed in the center of the table. We sort of already quit our jobs. Our last day is next Friday. Then we're renting a big moving truck and hopefully doing it all in one shot. Next Friday? Ray set her coffee cup down and reached for the carafe for a refill. You're not burning any daylight, are you? TJ laughed. Is that a bad thing? Oh, heck no. It'll be awesome having y'all close enough to come visit. I'm just surprised you could pull it all together so soon. Well, it makes it easier since TJ has the house. I'm going to rent a room from her so we didn't have to find a place. TJ rolled her eyes. She's going to split the utilities with me. Moira scowled. I'm going to rent. I held up a hand. Details, ladies. The door chimed above the door, and Camille strolled in, looking perfect as always. She may have gone off her lettuce and ice water diet and taken the stick out of her butt, but she still managed to look like a runway model, no matter what time of day or night. Shoot, even when she wasn't wearing a business suit, she pulled that off. Hey, Camille, we said at the same time. She smiled, her whole face lighting up. Y'all having a girl's day without me? I shook my head. Not on your life. TJ and Moira have some news. Really, she said, grabbing an extra coffee cup and pulling a chair up to the end of the booth. Do tell. We're moving here. Well, to Aunt Nora's house. For good. Next week, TJ said, practically vibrating with excitement. Camille blinked a few times, maintaining her smile, but was obviously polexed by the news. What? Moira asked. Is that a bad thing? Honey, have you told your aunt about this yet? TJ furrowed her brow. Uh, no. We were going to surprise her this evening. Why? Camille bit her lip, thinking. Eagle Gap has, shall we say, a different citizenship than other towns around here. I tilted my head. Come again? I'd lived in Keyhole my whole life and had never heard anything strange about Eagle Gap except for far-fetched stories about... Oh, wait, you're not saying those old campfire stories are real, are you? Camille pinched her lips together and raised her brows, nodding. Yep, she said, popping the pea. That's exactly what I'm saying. My head was reeling, thinking about all the times we'd camped out and played in the woods. We could have died. Somebody should have told us. Camille snapped her fingers in front of my face. You stop that right now, Noel Flynn. You're applying the same bigotry to them that everybody else on the planet applies to you, and I won't have it. Addie popped in above the table in time to hear what she said. What are you going on about? She snapped. I ain't never known Noel or Ray either one to be a bigot. Camille's eyes snapped to her. Fine. Maybe that's a little harsh, but her mind was racing straight toward assumptions and prejudice before I could even explain. Explain what? Addie asked. TJ and Moira are moving into Nora's house. They haven't told Nora yet. Oh, Addie said. 
Is that all? So what's the deal? They're good people, eat a ton, but man alive, are those men easy on the eyes? Matter of fact, I've only met one or two of them in my whole life I didn't like. Wish I could say the same about witches, and there's only one family of them left. Okay, Ray said. You've only met one or two what that you didn't like? Addie snorted. Why, werewolves, of course. Of course. Chapter 29 I'm sorry, TJ said, but I thought you just said werewolves. Camille scowled at Addie. Technically, they're shifters. No, Addie said. Technically, they're werewolves. You know as well as I do, ain't no such thing as a creature that turns into something else just because the moon changes. Shifter is the politically correct term, Camille said. Oh, well, excuse me. It's a stupid term. I'm a dead witch with no magic. Somebody gonna start calling me a post-living magically impaired individual? Phew, they're werewolves. Ain't none of them ever expressed to me they don't like the tag. For my part, I was still stuck on the part where they said werewolves lived in the next town over. I mean, unlike TJ, I knew they existed, but I didn't know they were so close. I couldn't help the little shiver that ran down my spine as scenes from American Werewolf in London flashed through my brain. Addie must have seen it, because she frowned at me. Honey, they're werewolves not politicians. Ain't no need for you to get all wound up about it. Only thing that's changed is now you know. She was right, but it was still gonna take some getting used to. Oh, I went out with a werewolf a couple of times, Moira said. He was so rugged. He was kind of a dog, though. Ray tipped up the corner of her mouth, and Moira realized what she'd said. Well, no pun intended. The best ones always happen by accident, I said. Okay, poor TJ said. I just recently learned that not only are witches real, but I am one, and ghosts exist. Now you're telling me werewolves exist? Are they, like, dangerous, like in the movies? What else don't I know about? Addie shook her head. They're not dangerous. I mean, don't get me wrong. You cross one of them? You'll find they're not doormats, and if you hurt one of their young uns, well, you'll likely not live long enough to find out anything. But if you're a good neighbor that lives inside the same parameters you should show to anybody, they're great people. Hellacious cooks. Cause they gotta be, seeing as how they eat enough to feed a small army. Are there any other creatures I need to know about? TJ asked. Addie puckered her lips and pushed them to the side, thinking, need to know about, or don't know about. Uh, either, I guess. Both. Now they had my attention. Well, as you can imagine, there are vampires, but again, the movies got that all wrong, for the most part. They can't turn into bats, and it offends them if you even suggest they sleep in a coffin. T.J. raised a brow. Of course they would. That makes at least as much sense as everything else I've learned lately. And are there any of those in Eagle Gap? T.J. asked. Camille glared at Addie. What? The girl's gonna live there, and she has the same herbal gifts Nora had. Folks are gonna come knocking. Camille heaved a sigh. Let's meet up at your place tomorrow, and I'll bring you up to speed. She's right. You're gonna need to know some things. Course, I'm thankful Nora's around. At least she knows who's allergic to what. My mind drifted back to the night I met TJ and Mora. Shelby and Emma were with me, and we stopped at an all-you-can-eat Chinese place. There'd been a beautiful, exuberant family of probably 20 there, pounding down the food like it was going out of style. When Shelby had passed them on her way to the buffet, they'd stopped eating. Paid and left. Are the werewolves all blondes? I asked. Yeah, as a matter of fact, they are, Camille said. Why? 
I think the girls and I ran into them the first time we met T.J. and Mora at the Chinese buffet, except when Shelby walked by them, they got all quiet and left like their tail feathers were on fire. That doesn't surprise me, she said. That was a rough time for all of us over there. Since they didn't know what witches they could trust, it's logical that they avoided all of us. One of their kids was cursed during the ordeal, along with several humans and witches, but as Addie said, they're not forgiving when it comes to family. Ray snorted. Who is? That just seems normal to me. TJ was worrying her lip. Are we going to have problems? No, nah, Addie said, waving a hand. The Kavanaugh's are good people. If you get a chance to talk to Sue Ann, she's the grandmammy in the pack and makes the best peach pie in Georgia. Moira elbowed her. Seriously, Camille's right. It's not right to look down on them or be scared of them because they were born a certain way. They're the same as us, except with arguably cooler gifts, at least sometimes. TJ quirked a lip. When you put it that way... I'll tell you how I'll put it, I said. Those men were hotter than a two-dollar pistol. Hope you can run into a couple of the single ones. Ray nudged me. Careful. Hunter finds out you're ogling other men. You'll be in trouble. Oh, honey, Camille said, flapping a hand at her dismissively. Ain't no woman this side of dead. She glanced at Addie, who was fanning her face. Or, apparently, the other side, either. Who can't ogle those men? Okay, Ray said. We need to cool it down a degree, or twenty in here. I interviewed a woman yesterday, and she's going to start tomorrow. As soon as she's trained, I'll officially be able to take entire days off. That's awesome, sweetie, Camille said. You've earned it. Yeah, she's actually coming back in a few minutes to fill out her paperwork. I wasn't expecting y'all. She applied back before Christmas, but I couldn't contact her. She has a, an odd accent, but she's nice. We chatted a while longer, then a tall, leggy brunette came strolling through the door, the bell tinkling above her head. Ray waved her over. Lavana, I'd like you to meet the crew. She introduced us, and before we could even say hi, Shelby and Emma burst through the front door chattering. Shelby, Emma, Ray said. This is Lavana. She's going to be helping me out around here. Shelby glanced at her. Pleased to... She took a closer look. Have we met? Lavana studied her closely, then looked away. No, I'm sure we haven't. Well, that may be skating the truth a bit. I believe you were here when I first applied. Skirting the truth, Shelby muttered, still studying the woman. Pardon? Lavana asked. The expression is skirting the truth, not skating it. You're so right, Lavana said, picking up the paperwork. Rayan, I'll just take these to the small table by the window. Of course, Ray said. Shelby frowned, looking after the woman, but she shook her head and turned to me. We just wanted to see if y'all were interested in going to the movies with us tonight. We already asked Gabby, but she has to work. The new Marvel movie is out. I looked at the other girls, who nodded. Sounds great. Justin's coming, too. We made arrangements to meet, and I shoved thoughts of werewolves from my mind. After all, I had a murder to worry about. Chapter 30 We helped Ray close up while Lavana finished her paperwork. She seemed nice, though I did pick up an odd vibe from her. Nothing bad, just odd. I'd keep an eye on her, especially given Shelby's reaction. She and Emma, being typical teenagers, left to do their hair and get dolled up at the farm, while I went to pick up Justin at Bobby Sue's. I chewed my lip as I considered how to approach her about why she was at the restaurant when Justin said she was at the grocery store, and decided to shoot straight with her. That's how she'd have approached me. I poked my head in the kitchen to find Justin, Earl, and another little boy about Justin's age pulling pork in preparation for the evening rush. Hey, no, he said, reaching for another hunk of meat. We gotta finish up before we can leave. 
Earl's been teaching me how to do things, because there's a big barbecue cook-off coming up in a couple months, and they have a kids' division. I'm going to use our family rub and kick some butt. Then Earl's going to win it for us in the grown-up section. I could win $2,000 and a four-wheeler. I bit my lip to keep from laughing. His pitch had gone up about two octaves, and he almost knocked Shane off his chair, gesturing. No kidding? Holy moly, then. You'd better get on the ball. Come on out when you're ready. I glanced at Bobby, who was running a load of dishes through the dishwasher. Can I talk to you for a minute? She tilted her head back when she heard the worry in my tone. Shoving the rack of dirty plates into the machine, she followed me out to the server station. What's got your tail in a twist? she asked. Oh, I'm not mad, and nothing is wrong, I said, hoping I was right. I flicked a wrist to start a fresh canister of tea out of habit. I'd worked there for over four years, but also to buy myself a minute to think. It's just... I saw you at the steakhouse last night, and when I called, Justin said you were at the grocery store. Is everything okay? She scrunched her forehead, flummoxed. Honey, I don't know what you're talking about. I went to Walmart, then to Sam's, then home. I wasn't at no steakhouse. I rubbed my face. There's something not right here. You're one of my best friends. I'd recognize you from behind at a distance, let alone passing within two feet of you. And so would Shelby. And I'm telling you, I saw you at the gas station, and Shelby saw you at the restaurant. Her face clouded, and her eyes narrowed. I held out my hands. Let me rephrase that. We saw a you, not you. It's weird. There for a second, I thought you were calling me a liar, she said. I drew back. Absolutely not. But I am telling you there's something fishy going on. At the very least, you're doppelgangers in town. She smiled, then shrugged. I don't know nothing about that. It's all I can do to keep up with one of me. But you can bet your bottom dollar whoever you saw wasn't me. Justin and his friend Shane came rushing out of the kitchen, bringing the conversation to a close. There wasn't anything else to say, anyway. I told them to get their coats, then thought of something. You don't reckon Shane's folks will have a problem with me taking him to a superhero movie, do you? She shook her head. No, I've known them forever. They ain't like that, but I'll call just in case. If they have a problem, I'll let you know. Oh, and they just piled down enough food for a lumberjack, so they should be good to go for a few hours anyway. Good, I said. The way that boy eats, I can't imagine feeding two of them. She took me by the sleeve as I turned to leave, and I glanced back at her. The look on her face was hard to discern. I couldn't decide if it was sadness or gratitude. Thanks for believing me. I don't know what's going on, but it means a lot that you came to me instead of jumping to the wrong conclusion. I smiled at her. Of course, you dingbat. I love you. She rolled her eyes. That's enough with the sappy stuff. Get. She gave Justin a quick hug and a stern order to behave himself, and we left. My brain was churning with all of the loose information I'd thrown in there that day, and I was thankful Shelby had asked us to go. It would be a nice distraction. My truck was still at the shop, so we had to walk, but that was fine with me. It was another beautiful day, and I was glad to soak up some sunshine. Anna May's whatnot shop was on our way, and I stopped in front of her display. Anna May was Hank's widow, and had come into a huge chunk of cash when he died. She didn't have to work, but wanted to. She loved her shop and had a real eye for design. This week, a mannequin wearing a 70s-style bathing suit and sunglasses stood over a picnic basket that was overflowing with old blue porcelain camping equipment. Coke and gas station signs from the same period hung in the background. They gave me an idea, and I decided to poke my head in. I stopped the boys, who were already two stores down. I want to say hi to Anna Mae for a second. Justin wrinkled his nose. We can't be late for the movie. Chill out. 
We still have an hour before we're meeting them. We're in no hurry. Heaving a sigh that only an impatient tween can, he motioned to his friend. Come on, let's just get this over with. Besides, Anna may have some cool antique trains and stuff. My friend was hard at work arranging a fifties display. An old wash tub with homemade soap and a washboard sat beside a ringer washer that was in mint condition. We still had one of those at the farm because Addie was sentimental about it. Personally, I had no desire to even try to use one because, as klutzy as I was, I knew I'd lose at least some fingers. Those things were no joke. She was stretching to hook the end of a clothesline to a nail that was just out of her reach. Here, let me help you, I said. Even though I was only average height, I still had at least three inches on her. Think blonde, adorable, and petite, and you have a general picture of Anna Mae. She jumped when I talked and spun around, grasping her chest. Oh, hey, Noel, You scared the dickens out of me, sweetie. She handed me the rope. I was just about to empty the wash tub and stand on it. I should have hung the nail lower, but then the skirts aren't displayed as well. I slipped the looped end over the nail. There you go. Speaking of displays, I noticed the Coke and gas station signs in the front window, and I have an idea to throw your way. How about I turn a few of them into clocks for you? She shrugged. Works for me. Then you just want to take out our costs and split the profit? Sounds like a deal. We're heading to the movies with TJ, Moira, Ray, and the girls if you want to go. The new Marvel movie's out. Thanks, but I've already seen it. You are going to love it, though. I got to warn you about halfway through when I held up a hand and cut her off. Stop, stop, stop. I loved her to death, but she should have spoiler alert tattooed on her forehead. She had the grace to look sheepish. Sorry. Enjoy it. It's one of the best yet. Wow, Shane said from the back of the store. Look at those weird video game cases. They're hard plastic. I smiled when I glanced at the Atari games he was holding. Justin said, You're not going to believe this, but those are the actual games. Like, way back in the 1900s, that's what they had to play with. Wow, way back then. That didn't make me feel old at all. Anna May must have read my mind, because she nudged me with her elbow. She was older than me by ten years or so. You think you feel old? We actually had an Atari when I was little. I can remember when they were the coolest thing ever. As a matter of fact, that one's from Mama's attic. I laughed and collected the boys, ready for a little bit of modern entertainment. We had supervillains to thwart. Chapter 31 the movie was, as always, awesome. Hunter didn't make it back from Eagle Gab till almost midnight, so when he texted to say goodnight, he said he'd give me a rundown of what he'd learned from Sam Keith. Since I had the boys, I got up early the next morning and made them pancakes. Addie had taught us how to make hers, which was a blessing. When she passed, the three things I mourned the most were the loss of her hugs, her advice, and her pancakes. The morning I looked up and saw her floating in that stall, I realized I'd never get the hugs again, but I had the other two back and considered myself one of the luckiest women in the world. You're gonna burn it if you don't flip it. The pancake queen herself nagged as she hovered over the stove, pointing at the griddle. You've got the heat up too high. Okay, I was still one of the luckiest women in the world, but I was also one of the most irritated right then, too. I am not. I have the heat set at medium, same as always. I slid the spatula under the edge of one of the pancakes and peeled it up just far enough to see under it. I slid my tongue over my teeth in frustration and cursed under my breath because she was right. I flipped them about three seconds before they would have turned black. I pointed the spatula at her and narrowed my eyes as she hovered with her arms crossed, looking smug. Don't say it. Say what, dear? That I was right? No problem. 
I'll just zip it. Justin and Shane padded into the kitchen, yawning. Justin sniffed the air. Ah, you didn't burn them, did you? I turned to them and scowled. Don't start, or you'll have leftover meatloaf for breakfast. With spinach. He grimaced, and Shane looked terrified. She's kidding, right? He asked Justin. Probably, he answered, but maybe we should go see the horses till she's done. I huffed out a breath and brushed a stray curl off my forehead. No, don't do that. It's ready. A quick peek in the oven told me what my nose already knew. The bacon was done. I pulled it out, then made the boys a couple plates and set them along with the warmed homemade blueberry syrup in front of them. I knew better than to put the bacon over there, too. That stuff had to be rationed. Shelby and Emma shuffled into the kitchen, yawning. They headed straight for the espresso maker, and it was only a couple minutes before they collapsed at the table, shooting the chattering boys the hairy eyeball. Teenagers are rarely morning people, but Shelby was worse than most. I still had her beat with age and experience, though, so we had an unwritten agreement that no conversation would be initiated until we'd each had at least half a cup of caffeine. It kept things civil. I heard Hunter's bike purring up the driveway, and a few seconds later, he came stomping across the porch. I smiled when the screen door slapped shut and he entered the kitchen. Hey, handsome, I said. Hey, beautiful. He gave me a hug from behind and kissed me on my temple, then reached around me for the bacon. I smacked him on the hand with the spatula, but not before he snagged a piece. He poured himself a cup of coffee, then teased the kids while I finished cooking. A few minutes later, I slid the stack of pancakes onto the table alongside the plates. Shelby, looking moderately more awake, grabbed a slice of bacon and popped it into her mouth. What are your plans for the day? I forked a couple of pancakes onto my plate. I'm going to take the boys riding. What about you? We were going to do the same thing. Want to ride back around the lake? Shelby had had a come-to-Jesus experience at Christmas time that had changed her. Before, she'd been a spoiled brat. Not mean or nasty, just egocentric. We'd almost lost each other because of her arrogance, and suffice it to say, she did a lot of growing up in a short amount of time. She'd overestimated her magic and landed herself in no man's land between the two worlds. It had literally taken a miracle to save her, but she'd come back to this plane a different woman. Kinder, more thoughtful, and she put much more care into her actions. We'd revived a relationship I'd thought was gone forever, so all in all, it was a horrible, yet wonderful, experience. One of the ways she'd changed was that she made an effort to spend time with me when she could, and I did the same. What do you think, boys? Are you up for a longer ride? I threw the question out before I invested any thought into the situation. I gave myself a mental forehead slap. Shane, have you ever ridden before? He nodded like a bobblehead doll, eyes wide. Yes, ma'am. My oldest sister has horses, and I ride hers all the time. She has a gelding named Jake she keeps just for me. He's sorrel with a big blaze and socks. I breathed a sigh of relief. Horses are so woven into my life that sometimes I forget that's not the case with most people. Good. Then a longer ride's okay? They both nodded, and Shane looked at Emma with those giant eyes that only accompany a kid crush. When the boys were finished eating, Justin grabbed the egg basket and motioned to Shane. Come on. I gotta go collect the eggs. Really? Like, from real chickens? Justin rolled his eyes as they pushed out the screen door. Of course from real chickens. It's easy, though. I'll show you. You just gotta be less scared of them than they are of you, which ain't always easy. The girls and I waited for the door to close before we laughed. Well, Emma said, he's got a point. Some of those hens are downright hateful. 
Shelby snorted. How would you feel if you were just curled up on the couch, taking a nap, and somebody came in and shoved their hand under your butt, digging around for couch change or something? Emma dipped her head. That's fair enough, I guess. When you say it like that, it's a wonder I don't come out with more pecs than I do. I tipped up one corner of my mouth. If you're getting pecked, you're moving too slow. Hunter grinned and reached for the last piece of bacon. It'll give him good experience when it's time to deal with women. Try not to be scared and don't put your hands anywhere they don't want you to or you'll get pecked. Sounds about right. I rose to set the dishes in the sink, and while I was refilling my coffee, my phone rang. It was a local number, but not one I recognized. Hello? I said, holding the phone between my cheek and shoulder while I added cream and sugar to my coffee. Hello? Is this Noel Flynn? I held the phone out and looked at the number again, then answered. May I ask who's calling? This is Bob Stokes from over in Eagle Gap. You were at my estate sale the other day, and you bid on a miscellaneous lot that included a door, a couple mirrors, an old tea cart, and some other odds and ends. Oh, yeah, I remembered that. Some guy ran the bid up to like 400 bucks, and I wasn't paying that, no matter how much I liked the cart, or wanted to know what was in a big box that was included in the lot. Yeah, Bob, this is Noel. I wouldn't have minded picking those up, but they went too rich for my blood. Well, if you still want them, they're yours. I believe your final bid was two seventy five. Two fifty, but I'll go two seventy five since you took the time to call me with a second chance offer. I appreciate that. When did you want me to come and get them? Will tomorrow work? He paused. That's the thing. I really need them gone today. We're closing up shop and heading back to Tennessee tonight. I noticed you eyeballing some other pieces, too. A lot of it didn't sell. So if you have something to haul furniture in, I'm willing to deal because I want it gone. Oh, you're leaving tonight, I said, so Hunter and the girls could follow the conversation. Shelby mouthed, go, and motioned with her hands. Uh, hang on just a second, please, Bob. I pulled my phone away from my face. Justin's here all day with his friend. Okay, she said, raising her brows and shrugging. We promise not to get him wet or feed him after midnight. Very funny. I pulled the phone back to my face. Bob, it's going to take me an hour or so to get there. Will that work? He agreed that it did, and I ended the call, then glanced at Hunter. Change of plans. Up for a ride to Eagle Gap? He shrugged. You lead, I'll follow. I cocked a brow at him. I bet you wouldn't have said that an hour ago before I had coffee and fed you bacon. Smirking, he said, I wouldn't have said anything an hour ago before you had coffee. Chapter 32 I texted Gabby, who was working a breakfast shift, to ask if I could use her trailer again and to let her know we were cooking out that night, then rushed upstairs to get dressed. It only took me a few minutes to pull on some jeans and stuff my hair under a ball cap, and we were on our way. Shelby and Emma were going to keep the boys, and Gabby said it was fine to use her trailer, so we were hitched up and pulling out in less than twenty minutes. I squinted against the sun and slipped on my sunglasses as we pulled out of the drive and onto the main road. So, what did you find out from Sam Keith? Is he our guy? Hunter took a deep breath and released it. I don't know. He's a big guy, but I didn't notice a limp. I even tried to draw out something by mentioning my old football injury was acting up. But he didn't offer any commiseration at all. Maybe he just tripped or something, or Marcus got in a couple good kicks. After all, we don't know whether Max saw him before or after Marcus died. I swerved a little to miss a squirrel that darted across the road. Hunter gripped his armrest, and I quirked a brow at him. You want me to drive? he asked. I gave him my best are-you-out-of-your-mind look. No, you'd have hit the squirrel. 
He scoffed. No, I wouldn't have. Okay, I said, waving him off. It's a moot point. The squirrel lived, and I'm driving. What did your gut tell you about the guy? Shifting in his seat and trying not to look uncomfortable, he replied, I don't know. He's shady and cocky. He's also surprisingly intelligent. The truck's throwing me off, though. He loans somebody he knows is a bad gambler twenty grand and wears five hundred dollar boots, but drives a beat up Chevy truck with a cracked windshield. As Addie says, that dog don't hunt. Maybe it was his daddy's or something, and he keeps it for sentimental reasons. The windshield could be a recent thing he just hasn't fixed yet, I said as I flicked on my blinker to turn onto the road to Eagle Gap. He shook his head. I could understand that, but it's beat to crap and has had zero maintenance. I looked inside. He starts it with a screwdriver, and the tires are so bald the wires are showing. If it was just sentimental, it should be in good shape with the money he has. I turned that over in my mind. He had a valid point. Is the truck registered to him? Sheriff Custer ran the tags and says it's in his name only, and he's owned it for eight years. The guy verified. Things just weren't making sense. My bullshit meter was tingling, but I couldn't figure out what was setting it off. The road to Bob's place was treacherous, even in the truck. Honestly, I'd been surprised to see any cars at all at the auction. Then I realized my GPS had messed with me and brought me in through the shortest route, not the best one. Surprise, surprise. This time, I went the easy way. When the graceful old Victorian loomed in front of us, Hunter whistled. The house was impressive. That is, what you could see of it through the weeds and vines that threatened to reclaim it to nature. The massive wraparound porch just begged for rocking chairs and a chessboard, and the lonely porch swing, swaying in the breeze, would be a great spot to curl up with a glass of tea and a book. Or it would be after you trimmed down the grass and weeds so the bugs wouldn't eat you alive. What's the deal with this place? he asked. I lifted a shoulder. From what I gathered, it's his family estate. He was a little squirrely when I asked for details. All he said was that nobody in the family wants to live there. It seemed like their goal was to take the money and run. I pulled in front of a giant old barn with peeling red paint, and Bob, a fifty-ish bear of a man with mutton chops and a navy tattoo, sauntered out to greet us, grinning ear to ear. I introduced him to Hunter, and he motioned us into the barn. I didn't sell as much as I wanted to, even though we paid a fortune for advertising. I tried to auction the house, too, but nobody was particularly interested because we didn't open it up to walkthroughs. Didn't want to risk a lawsuit. The highest bid we got was fifty grand. Why didn't you want to open it up? Hunter asked. I was wondering the same thing, because it didn't look structurally unsound to me. Termite damage was common, so maybe that was it. We just didn't think it was worth the risk, he said again, then changed the subject. He motioned toward the auction leftovers. Take a look, and if you see anything you like, make me a fair offer. Addie and Belle popped in, nosing through the array of furniture and miscellaneous household goods still arranged at the end of the barn where the auction had taken place. "'Oh,' Belle said, peering into a box of precious moments' knickknacks. "'Coralie would love these. Make him an offer and I'll make sure she pays you back.' I walked over and looked in the box. Scratching my nose, I crinkled my brow. "'Coralie didn't seem like a precious moments type of gal. Are you sure?' "'Course I'm sure,' Belle said, disgruntled that I dare question her. Her sister just started collecting them, though I have no idea why. Okay, I said, figuring, if nothing else, Anna May could put them in her store. The more I poked through, the more I found. Unfortunately, Addie and Belle were happy to spend my money, too. 
There was a whole section full of horse stuff, ranging from saddles to grooming equipment. I was more interested in the antique harnesses and farm equipment, but I picked through and set a couple saddles aside, along with a box of gate hinges, latches, and hooks. With mayhem, you could never have too many. As I collected, I stacked what I could on an oak plank kitchen table that, underneath the scratches and grime, was solid. I'd strip it down and refinish it as a housewarming gift for TJ. I was poking through a box of costume jewelry when a schoolmarm-looking ghost popped in, wearing a little house-on-the-prairie-style dress and glaring down her nose at me through her wire spectacles. If I had to guess, I'd have put her in her late fifties. She started flapping her arms, moaning, and making the most ridiculous stereotypical ghost noises. Great. At least I knew why Bob was so eager to get out from under the place. Chapter 33 I cocked a brow at her. You're kidding me, right? I'm the ghost of Janie Stokes she moaned in a poor imitation of a B-rated horror flick. And I order you to get out! The last was said Amityville style. It was all I could do to keep from laughing, but Hunter didn't have that much self-control. He snickered. Addie and Belle had swooped over, glowering. For the love of God, you pretentious old bat, knock that crap off. You're humiliating yourself, Belle said. And if you're shooting for scary, I said, you're missing the mark by miles. Ms. Stokes puckered her lips. You're not scared? I shook my head. Nope. A little embarrassed. For you, maybe. Addie crossed her arms. What's your problem anyway? The woman was taken aback and opened and closed her mouth several times, at a loss for words. You do an even worse imitation of a trout than you do a paranormal entity, Belle told her, putting the last two words in air quotes. The woman scowled and pointed to the box of jewelry. That's mine, she said, sounding like a petulant five-year-old. For that matter, so's the rest of this stuff. Really? Addie asked. And what, pray tell, do you plan to do with it? It's on the mortal plane. Yeah, Belle said. And in case you haven't noticed, you're not. But my mama and my husband got me a lot of that. Addie tilted her head and examined her. How long you been dead? Almost a hundred years, she said, deflated. And have you ever been away from here? Belle asked. Ms. Stokes, excuse me, Mrs. Stokes, shook her head. I can do that? Oh, you poor woman, Belle said. You mean you haven't so much as been to the beauty parlor since you bit the big one? For heaven's sake, Belle, Addie said. Then turn to Ms. Stokes. First things first, have you tried picturing yourself wearing any of that jewelry? The matronly woman looked confused. No, why? Belle sighed. I suppose that means you've been wearing that same dress for a hundred years? Well, yes. It's what they buried me in. Addie and Belle looked at each other, cringing. That's a damn shame, Addie said, shaking her head. What's a shame, Belle said, wrinkling her nose, is that she ain't changed clothes in a century. Miss Stokes's hand fluttered to her chest. That's just rude. I'm dead, as you so eloquently pointed out. All of my clothing is in that box over there. She pointed to a closed box stuffed in the back corner. I'd missed it, but if it was full of period clothing, Anna May would love it. I hoped it wasn't full of moths and silverfish. Belle sighed. Close your eyes and imagine yourself wearing your favorite outfit. She did, 
and I watched as her dress faded, without showing any of her naughty bits, in case you were wondering, and transformed into a split riding skirt and loose blouse. She opened her eyes and looked down at herself in wonder. Now, picture yourself wearing some of that jewelry you were caterwauling about a minute ago, Addie said. Mrs. Stokes peered into the box, rubbing her chin as she considered. She glanced up at me. Would you mind poking through it for me, dear? It's been so long I forget what all I have. I did as she asked, and a couple of rings appeared on her fingers, followed by a cameo at her throat. Oh, dear, she said, shrugging her shoulders and pulling the blouse away from her chest a few times. You have no idea how much better I feel. I despised that dress, and my hateful sister knew it. It's why she buried me in it. It's been choking and binding me for a century. Okay, I said. Now that you know you can wear whatever you want and that you don't need any of the physical stuff, do you feel better about me taking any of it? She waved a hand. Of course, dear. Now that I know I can wear it whenever I want, help yourself. Good, Hunter said, speaking for the first time. May I assume you're the reason Bob here can't sell the house, or even live in it for that matter? She hung her head. I am. But she looked back up. You don't understand, though. My highfalutin sister Rose moved in, and her horrid children wrote all over the walls and scratched up the furniture with their shoes and had no manners whatsoever. Then Rose wanted to tear down the barn my Henry built for me. That was the last straw. Wouldn't you like to see the grounds and barn cleaned up again, put to use rather than falling down around itself? Hunter asked. She chewed on her lip, considering. I reckon I would, as long as they were mannerly and respected it. Henry and I worked hard to build this house. I helped him lay those floors myself. How about I introduce you to Bob out there, I said. He seems like a nice guy. Maybe you can come to an arrangement. He is, after all, your kin, I assume. Wouldn't you like to keep it in the family? Janie. I felt better calling her by her first name, now that she didn't look like somebody who was about to rap me on the knuckles with a ruler, dipped her head. I would. He's my several greats grandson. Looks a lot like my Henry. Hey, Bob, I called. When he turned toward me, I waved him back. Could you come back here for a minute? It's important. He trotted the length of the barn and stopped, his eyes stopping on the box of jewelry. If you found something that looks valuable in there, don't worry about it. It's probably paste. The last woman who lived in the house, my great-great-whatever-grandmother Rose, sold most of the stones because her husband ran off. Doesn't surprise me the way she henpecked him all the time, Janie muttered. Actually, I said, choosing my words carefully, I did find something valuable, but not in the way you think. Are you selling because the place is haunted? His eyes shot to mine. Course not. Ain't no such thing as ghosts. You don't have a heart condition, do you? Hunter asked. No? Why? I took a deep breath, then looked askance at Addie and Belle. Outing a ghost was poor etiquette and would likely earn you a straitjacket if you were too adamant and the ghost didn't want to be outed. They nodded. Go ahead, Belle said. Bill, I'd like you to meet your great-great-whatever-grandmother, Janie Stokes. Janie looked to Belle and Addie, then to Bob, and I saw her concentrate on making herself visible. Bob's eyes about popped out of his head, and he stumbled backwards. Calm down, Hunter said. You're getting a smoother introduction to it than I did. 
She's just another person. Well, except she's been in post-life retirement for a hundred years. Bob looked at him like he'd lost his mind, but at least he was listening. Yeah, I said. She changed planes in... I looked to her for a date. 1908, she supplied. 1908, and she's been stuck here ever since. Belle cleared her throat. Oh, I said, and this is my Aunt Adelaide Flynn, Addie for short, and her friend Belle. They popped into sight. He only shifted his weight back. He no longer looked like he was ready to bolt. Bob narrowed his eyes. Are you the one who's been making such a racket in there for so long? Janie had the good grace to blush. I am, but about that. I cleared my throat. Bob, do you really want to get rid of this place? He shook his head. No. My wife adores it, and I reckon I do, too. It's just nobody's been able to stay a night in the place due to the yowling and carrying on. Well, I think y'all should parlay and work out some kind of arrangement, I said. For now, though, I've chosen what I want, but you may want to keep at least some of it if you're staying. Janie swooped over and looked at what I'd gathered. Besides the stuff I already mentioned, I also had my eye on another settee, two old chests, a few headboards, and a several boxes of odds and ends, plus the stuff I'd come for to begin with. She poked her nose in each box and examined the furniture. Please take that table, the things I saw my sister do on it. I held up my hand. I'm going to strip it clear to the wood so all that'll be gone. That's a good idea. The varnish won't be the first thing that's been stripped on it, I can tell you that. I cringed and pinched the bridge of my nose, and Addie and Belle snickered. As far as the rest of the stuff, the only thing I'd like to keep, if Bob wants it, is that headboard. She pointed to the most ornate one I'd set aside. Henry carved that for me for our first wedding anniversary. It took him months. The footboard is right over there. She motioned toward the back of the barn. Bob, the poor guy, had tears in his eyes. That's a keeper, then, and it'll go in the master with us, where nobody can harm it. He ran a finger over the top of it and pulled it back, covered in greasy grime. You say you restore furniture? I do, I answered. I tell you what, then. He glanced at Janie. My wife's already taken everything she wanted. If you'll refinish this for me, we'll call it square on whatever you want in here, as long as that's okay with Mama Janie. She blushed to her roots with pleasure at the family name. I'd love to see it restored, she said. And as far as I'm concerned, you can take all of this stuff and it still won't be enough to repay you for what you did for us today. It was my turn to blush. That's not right. I didn't really do anything. I mean, hush, girl, Addie said, scowling. You're being rude. They're offering you a sincere gift and a fair trade. Yeah, Bob said. Remember, I'm basically trading you what, to us? is a bunch of junk for 70 acres and a mansion. Well, when he put it that way, deal then, I said, and we shook on it. Chapter 34 Bob had only been in the house a couple times, and Janie ran him out both times, so she took him in for a proper tour. That suited me, because we had a ton of stuff to load, and I've already shared my feelings about furniture. Hunter backed the trailer in, and I had it loaded without breaking a sweat in 15 minutes or so. We went inside to let them know we were leaving, and found them in one of the upstairs bathrooms. The place was ginormous inside, and our footsteps echoed in the empty space as we crossed the hard woods. Janie was pointing at some of the plumbing, and Bob was explaining the dangers of lead pipes and paint. We're heading out now, y'all, I said. 
Thank you for everything, and I should have the headboard done in a week or so. No rush, Bob said, holding his hand up. We still have to arrange for the boys to transfer schools, and I'm sure the missus will want to come down and decorate. I think she and Mama Janie are going to have a ball. Janie was smiling and crying a little at the same time. She swooped in and hugged first Addie, then Belle. Neither of them were exactly huggers, but they patted her on the back, none the same. We'll be back in a few days when Bob leaves to teach you how to leave, Addie said. We don't know how many ghosts over here, but I suspect we're about to open up a whole new world, honey. Bell nodded. You're going to have to keep an open mind about a lot of things, but if you want, we'll take you over and introduce you to the living and pad community and keyhole. They're good people. Oh, and my friend Nora lives right up the road. Distance don't mean much on this plane, though. Thank you both, Janie said. I look forward to it. I smiled. Your life is about to get a whole lot more interesting, that's for sure. And less lonely. Addie said, before she and Belle popped out of sight. We jumped in the truck and pulled out, taking the easy way out. I felt danged good about the day so far, and it was only a little after ten. About a mile down the road toward home, the gaslight flickered on. That was fine with me, because I was about to die of thirst anyway. Hunter pumped while I went in to get us something to drink and use the facilities. He came in and grabbed a couple of Slim Jims and a bag of chips. You just ate like a dozen pancakes and a pound of bacon, I said, shaking my head in wonder at the man's appetite. That was three hours ago. He poured himself a sweet tea big enough to fill a fish tank. You know that stuff's not real tea, right? It's instant, I said, as I poured myself a normal-sized Coke. He lifted a shoulder. Same difference. A little old lady standing beside him gasped as if he'd just announced he was the Antichrist and fluttered her hand at her throat, fingering her pearls. I tipped up the corner of my mouth in a half smile as she tottered back up the aisle. Better watch your language there, young man. Remember where you are. Once we were back in the truck and on the way, he ripped into a Slim Jim. While he was chewing, he asked, have you girls come to any conclusion about the letter? Any idea what Sylvia was talking about? None, I said. Gabby's racked her brain trying to think of what it could mean, but even if she did know what she was referring to, she'd still have to find the key first. True, I guess. I just feel like we'd know so much more if that piece of the puzzle would fall into place. He pulled the last bite of Slim Jim out of the sleeve with his teeth and stuffed the wrapper back in the bag. Has she thought maybe... His phone rang, cutting him off. I glanced down at it as he picked it up. Smitty, wonder what he wants on a Saturday afternoon. Smitty was his second in command. One way to find out, he said, sliding his finger across the screen to accept the call. Hey, Smitty, what's up? He listened for a few minutes. That doesn't make any sense. I could hear Smitty's excited chatter, but couldn't make out his words. Hunter shook his head. No, that's okay. I'll take care of it. Thanks for letting me know. Hey, can you send a screenshot of that to my phone? He pulled the phone away from his ear and frowned as he ended the call. Well, don't leave me hanging, I said. What was that all about? The green truck's not registered to Sam Keith, he said. It's registered to some girl named Clara Thomas. Last known address is in Atlanta, except the address is now a bed and breakfast. Atlanta? That's what he said, and she's owned it for almost five years. Okay, then. I slowed down as another vehicle passed me. So either the sheriff lied to you, or somebody in his department lied to him. He scratched his jaw. I met a deputy Thomas, but I was under the impression Custer ran the tags. Yeah, but did he say that specifically, or did you just assume it? He thought for a second, 
then shook his head. I don't know. He may have said we ran the tags, or even if he said he ran them, he could have just meant his department. His phone beeped with an incoming text, and he opened it up and pulled in a deep breath. Oh, Lord. I'm pretty sure we just found Marcus's girlfriend, he said, turning the phone toward me. How do you know? I said, turning my head to take a quick glance at his phone. Oh, yeah, I'd lay money on it. The pick was of a license, and the face in the corner could have been Gabby's sister, at least until you looked closer. So, now what? I asked. Now, I need to find out who's yanking my chain. Somebody's dirty over there, and I want to know who. Chapter 35 Hunter made half a dozen phone calls on the way home, but couldn't track anybody down. Apparently, most of the sheriff's department was out patrolling a festival going on over there, and Sheriff Custer was out of town. He left a message with the only deputy manning the phones, saying only that he needed to talk to the sheriff. He left a voicemail directly with the sheriff, though, demanding information. Do you think that was a good idea? I asked. What if he's involved? At this point, the odds that he's not aren't good. It's not like that would surprise me. Keyhole had, after all, been run by a bunch of strong-arming good old boys for almost two decades, and nobody could do anything because he had so many people in his pocket that nobody knew who to tell. Once he died, nearly 50 people in high places were pulled off their high horses and sent to prison. Ten or twenty times that many were freed, though. Hunter blew a puff of breath through his nose. You know, if you'd have said something like that to me a year ago, it would have been laughable to me. But after seeing what Hank got away with for so long, I've started wondering how many others just like him exist. I knew just thinking that killed him, because he was one of the good guys. He was in law enforcement for all the right reasons, and when somebody abused the badge, he took it as a personal insult. Maybe I should call the judge, he said, referring to Judge Clayton. He was Hunter's liaison with the regional circuit. Every scrap of paperwork, tax bill, or speeding ticket issued in Keyhole Lake was scrutinized like a bug under a microscope though the judge has started to loosen the reins a bit in the last couple months. I think that's a good idea, I said, if for no other reason than to CYA. It's reported you followed all the steps, and there won't be so much as a hint that you stepped a toe across the line. I worried about him because of that. We were already painted with the brush, and there was no giving Hunter the benefit of the doubt. His job was all uphill because it was almost like they expected him to be guilty, and in that situation, it wasn't hard to find fault, even if everything was on the up and up. He pulled up the judge's number on his phone, but left a voicemail. It was Saturday, and the judge did love his weekend tea times. So, now what? I asked. Now, nothing. I can't do anything at all until I hear back from somebody. We spent a few more minutes speculating about the murder and the mysterious note, but didn't come up with anything new, so I shifted the conversation to another mystery that was killing me. Are you going to spill your guts about Matt? I glanced at him out of the corner of my eye, trying to gauge his reaction. I don't know what you're talking about, he said, but his eye twitched up in the barest hint of a smile before he caught himself. You're lying to me. You know relationships are based on honesty, right? He didn't bother to try to hide his grin this time. Yes, honey, I do realize that. And it's honestly none of your business. He'll tell you when he's ready. The worst part is that I knew he was right. I was spending too much time with Coralie. Just tell me it's not some gutter snipe trying to pull one over on him. He cocked a brow. Does Matt strike you as somebody susceptible to a gutter snipe? Or to anything, for that matter? I couldn't argue that point, though there was definitely an element of nosiness. Most of my curiosity was protectiveness. But Hunter was right. 
Matt was a grown man, and who he dated was none of my business. Who's coming tonight? he asked. Do we need to stop and get anything? Oh, I'm glad you said that. I almost forgot to tell Errol about it. I need to stop by the shop and change channels for him anyway. It's Saturday, and he likes to catch a couple movies on Lifetime. Besides him, just the regular crew. Bobby Sue's come to pick up Justin, so she's going to hang out for a while, too. I swung the truck wide and pulled into the back alley so I wouldn't be hogging five spaces out front. Come in and check out the table and chairs, I said, flipping through my keys for the one to the back door. I cruised through the hall toward the front, calling a hello to Errol. He waved a hand in my direction, absorbed in the drama unfolding in front of him on chop. I hung a right into my workroom, and I reached for the string to turn on the fluorescence. You're not going to believe the diff... Something large and furry ran across the top of my foot just as I pulled the string. Surprised and a little terrified, I squealed and jumped backward into Hunter, my gaze darting in the direction the critter had been when it brushed against me. What? he said, scanning the room for a serial killer. I caught a brief glimpse of a long pink tail attached to a huge fairy brown and white butt just before it squeezed beneath the cushion of an old couch that had been there when I bought the place. Errol came whooshing in, eyes wide and looking all about. What? What is it? Were we robbed? He put his hands on his cheeks. Oh, I just knew something horrible would happen if I started wandering around living the high afterlife instead of sticking close. I stalked toward the couch, picking up my broom as I went. I didn't have anything against rats, per se, but I didn't particularly want the bubonic plague dragged into my workspace either. He could exist just fine without doing it in my shop. No, Errol, everything's okay, or it's gonna be, in a minute. Hunter followed, confused. No, what are you doing? I had the broom drawn back like a club, and I reached down and grasped the corner of the cushion. I took a deep breath and yanked it up. Sure enough, there it was. When it just huddled in the corner of the cushion looking terrified, still clasping a paper clip, I felt bad and put the broom down. We'd figure out a way to scoop him up and put him outside. I didn't wish him harm. Errol swooped in and, peering over my shoulder, let out an ear-piercing squeal. Norman! Oh, dear heavens, I'm so glad you're okay! You know Daddy didn't leave you behind on purpose, don't you? He reached to scoop up the rat, but, of course, his hands passed right through, and the rodent shivered. Uh, Errol? My poor friend was beside himself, crying silvery tears and talking baby talk to the critter. He turned to me, sniffling and wiping his eyes. Poor Hunter looked more like a trapped animal than the rat did. He's not good with tears. Oh, Noel, this is Norman. Errol gushed beside himself. I got him as a baby right before I moved here. He's one of the most loved and intelligent creatures I've ever met. I creased my brow and stared down at him. He was quivering, but obviously responding to Errol's attempts to calm him. And I swear, when he looked up at me, he knew we were discussing his fate. He held the paperclip toward me, almost like a peace offering. Oh, good Lord. I had a ratatouille happening right in my own workshop. Hunter stepped forward, keeping a cautious eye on Norman. Let me get this straight. Uh, that's your pet rat? Errol nodded, still sniffling. I thought for sure those awful men who killed me destroyed him too. Then I worried he'd starve to death or that he froze to death. He really doesn't do well with cold. He always needed a sweater. The waterworks were about to start again, so I held up a hand. Calm down. Everything's gonna be okay. Norman was edging toward me as we talked, and the light glinted off something in the corner of the couch. I looked closer, and it was the earring. I felt bad. Laney hadn't taken it after all. The tip of what I was sure was the spoon lore was sticking out, 
and there were several paper clips and even a glass marble from my pen cup. He always did like shiny things, Errol said, his gaze still attached to the rat. He turned, pleading with his eyes. You'll take care of him for me now, won't you? I mean, I can still keep him company and it, it'll be wonderful. Did I mention I'm not a fan of rats? I pressed my lips together and gave it token consideration, but I knew I was going to give in. Resigned, I turned to Hunter. So, you seem to be okay with the bratty teenage sister, the bossy dead aunt, and the 16th century talking donkey. How do you feel about rats? Chapter 36 It was only noon when we got back to the farm, but I felt like it was midnight. Errol had decided to hang out at the shop to spend time with Norman, who I learned was named after Norman Norell, because he had a spot that looked just like a bow tie on his neck. Who's that, you ask? It's okay, and I had to ask too, much to Errol's outrage. Norman Norell was the pioneer of American fashion, a philanthropist, artist, and master of understated elegance. I feel like I should have known that. The kids were still out riding, but Gabby was in the arena working mayhem. I backed the trailer up to the pole barn, then went over and watched them, my elbows resting on the top rail of the fence. Speaking of artists, that horse was amazing. She was loping him up the rail, practicing flying lead changes just for fun. It almost looked like he was skipping. In dressage, it was called tempi changes, and he was so good at it that I found myself watching her legs and seat for the cues. Every now and then, I'd catch a squeeze of a calf or a tap with a spur, but for the most part, they made it look effortless. She pushed him into a full lope, then did a perfect rollback at the end of the arena. That is, he shifted his weight to his haunches and did a turn so that he was facing the opposite direction without missing a stride. I shook my head as she did a couple small, slow circles, then brought him at a full canter straight toward us, sitting back just in time for him to dig in and slide to a stop right in front of us. Dropping her reins, she leaned forward, laughing, and patted him on both sides of the neck. He bobbed his head up and down and poked his nose toward me in greeting. Y'all look amazing, I said, rubbing his forehead. Thanks, she said. I was speaking to the attorney who holds his trust and found out that Sylvia included show fees in her list of allowable expenses. How awesome is that? There's a non-points show tomorrow up near Atlanta that I'm considering going to. I still have my show clothes, so I figure, why not? I had mixed feelings about the show circuits on a number of levels, but they could be a blast if you were with the right people. I think you should. Matt pulled up on the other side of the barn. Hunter leaned down and gave me a quick kiss. As much as I love hanging out with you ladies and talking horses, I'm going to go hang out with Matt and talk motorcycles. I smiled as he ambled across the yard, raising his hand to Matt. I hated to see him leave, but I loved to watch him go. He turned back toward me. Don't forget to tell her about Clara Thomas. Maybe she knows her. Gabby crinkled her brow. Who's Clara Thomas? After I gave her the rundown, she shook her head. Never heard of her, but I can say that even though I can't stand Custer, I've never known him to be crooked. Things are pretty straight over there. Something's not adding up somewhere. Yeah, she said, hopping off ma'am and leading him toward the gate. But where? What did you say the guy's name was? The one with the green truck? The gate latch was just a rope that looped over the post. Mayhem picked it up with his teeth and slid it off the post, then nudged the gate open with his nose. I smiled and shook my head. You could call him a lot of things. My preference was pain in the ass, but you couldn't call him dumb. Sam Keith, and the guy who pointed us to him, was Dirk Henderson. She puckered her lips 
thinking as we walked toward the wash rack. I know Dirk. He's kind of a dirt bag. His favorite thing to do is hang out with Marcus and blow Sylvia's money. I don't know Sam, though. She slipped Ma'am's bridle off and replaced it with his halter, which was already hanging on the rack. I uncoiled the hose and turned it on. As soon as the water poured out of the end, Ma'am stuck his lips out to me, asking for a drink. I obliged and grinned as he turned his lips up. It was then that I spotted a mark on his muzzle that I'd never noticed before, and I flushed cold, then hot, as a puzzle piece clicked into place. There, running horizontally along the very edge of his white lip, was a black mark shaped roughly like a key. A key, I muttered under my breath, the water hose forgotten, hanging from my limp fingers and splashing water on my shoes. Mayhem nudged me, but I shut it off and reached for his face. Gabby. She had her back to me, bent over taking off the skid boots that protected his lower legs from injury during sliding stops. She didn't hear me over the rip of Velcro. Gabby, I snapped, finally catching her attention. Mayhem's lip was back in its usual position, and the mark was invisible. I cupped his chin in my hand and asked him to raise his head. She came around, and I pointed at it. Oh, my God, she said. The key to her heart. Chapter 37 Sylvia showed me this once when I pointed it out, in pretty much the same exact conditions. We were giving him a bath, getting him ready for a show. She laughed and said it was the key to her heart. I pulled the letter up on my phone. Hunter had forwarded it to me the day we'd gotten it. Start by looking near the key to my heart. She rubbed his cheek, then put her hand on his lip. Come on, big guy. Let's see if you're hiding anything in there. When she lifted it up, I was surprised to see numbers tattooed on the inside of his upper lip. That was common practice in racing, required, actually, but not so much outside of the sport. Some owners did it as an extra layer of security in case of theft. Apparently, Sylvia was one of them. I looked closer. That's not right, I said. Racing tats are nearly always either four or five numbers with a letter in front of them. His was six numbers, or three, depending on how you looked at it, because of spacing. Thirteen, forty-two, twelve. Is that on his papers? I asked. She shrugged. To be honest, I didn't really look at them. The attorney had them, along with the trailer title. He had all the transfers of ownership ready for me, and all I really had to do was sign, and sign, and sign. While she talked, she unbraided his mane so she could wash it. I swear, I spent two hours just reading through everything and signing, but I just skimmed over his registration papers because they were familiar to me. They were legit, so I signed. This guy's not just a lawyer. He and Sylvia grew up together. She trusted and liked him. I went to work freeing his tail from the tail bag. Do you have the papers? She shook her head. At the time, I had no idea where I was going to end up, and I didn't want to send them to Mama's house because she just throws my mail away. I had them sent back to his office. I huffed out a breath. It was Saturday, so there was no way he was available. Focus on the numbers, then, I said as she hosed him down. Do they make any sense to you? She shook her head. Nope. We're no closer to the treasure than we were an hour ago. No, but an hour ago, we didn't know what the key was, so maybe it's just a matter of the next piece falling into place. The kids came trotting back into the yard from the side pasture, and the boys were grinning from ear to ear. They rode up to the hitching posts in front of the barn and dismounted. It seemed like they slid for a mile before they reached the ground, but their horses were already standing hip-shot, glad to be home. I was glad to see they weren't sweaty. Since the whole Christmas debacle, Shelby had been much more responsible, 
but she was still young, and running a horse, no matter how old you were, was fun. Justin was like a hitchhiker burr in the saddle, but I didn't know Shane's real skill level, so I was glad Shell and Emma had taken it easy. As they unsaddled, I cringed as Shane's horse shook and toppled the saddle to the ground. They were sturdy, but it barely missed taking Shane down with it. Bless his little heart, though. He saw it falling and did his best to catch it. Justin ducked under his horse's neck and helped him lift it back up smiling as he did. How he lived through the foster care nightmares on top of losing his folks and still came out soft-hearted and kind was beyond me, but I was grateful. Gabby and I worked in silence for a few minutes, sudsing Mayhem up until his white sparkled and his black gleamed. No small feat for a horse who reveled in rolling in every mud hole he could find. The mundane act of washing and conditioning and braiding was soothing after the week I'd had, and I suddenly wished I was going to the show with her. We were finishing the final braids and his mane when I heard a truck rumbling up the drive. I looked up, and Bobby Sue was coming around the final bend. I squinted. There was somebody in the truck with her, but it wasn't Earl. Anna May, maybe. She pulled up in front of the house, then jumped out of her truck and jogged toward us, a huge smile on her face. Y'all ain't gonna believe what happened to me today. Bobby Sue was always a ball of energy, but she was so fired up that she was bouncing on her toes. I bit my lip to keep from laughing, but it didn't work. We may not, but I think you should probably tell us anyway before you blow plumb up. Well, I was at the quick stop. Wait, I said. I thought you said that wasn't you at the quick stop. She scowled at me. I'm talking about this morning, she said. And if you wouldn't have talked over me, I'd have said that. I held up my hand. My bad. Please, do tell. All righty then. She glanced over her shoulder toward her truck, but the person sitting in it, was looking down at her phone, so I couldn't tell who it was. Who's in the truck? I asked, earning me another dark look. Would you zip it so's I can tell the story? I'm getting there. I pressed my lips together, then made the locking motion over them. So, she glared at me, practically daring me to interrupt her again. As I was saying, I was at the quick stop, and Susie Barker was working. She said she saw me the same morning you did. She paused, but I kept my mouth shut, waiting for her to continue. She was busy restocking the donut, so she didn't get a chance to talk to me. Apparently, there was a new girl working there that just moved to Keyhole Lake. It wasn't until yesterday she worked with the girl, Kelly, again. Apparently, it was busy that morning. I nodded remembering how there'd only been one pump open when I pulled in. Mayhem reached out and nuzzled the chest pocket of her flannel, and she swatted him away, but smiled. She reached into her pocket and pulled out a peppermint. You want this? She asked him, holding it up. Of course, he nodded, and she unwrapped it. Would you mind? I asked, impatient that she'd started a story, then left off to feed candy to a horse. I'm getting there, she said, as Ma'am crunched the candy. Anyway, apparently I left a note with Kelly, asking her to get in contact with me, and left a number, and Kelly stuck it under the register and forgot to tell her to tell me. I tilted my head and looked at Gabby, trying to figure out if I heard all those words in the wrong order or something. She looked every bit as bum-fuzzled as I felt. Yeah, you're going to have to find a different way to explain that one, I said. You lost me at, well, I don't think you ever had me. She huffed. It ain't hard. Kelly told Susie that a woman gave her a note that morning, but that she'd stuck it under the register and forgot to mention it because they were busy. She looked back and forth between us. You with me so far? Gabby looked at me, and I gave a tentative nod. So far, yes, she said. 
Well, Kelly gave the note to Susie, along with a description of the lady. Susie recognized it as me. It was a message for me with a phone number, except it used my full first name without the middle. Roberta Banks. Yeah, when she said it like that, it didn't sound like her at all. Kelly works at the bank a couple days a week, too, so she recognized the name and realized something didn't add up. So she called me and gave me the phone number from the note, and I called it. She stopped again, and this time I wanted to shake her, except I knew she could kick my ass. Holding up a finger, she said, Wait here, I'll be right back. Like we had any choice. I didn't know about Gabby, but my brain was so tangled trying to twist some sense out of everything that I probably couldn't have moved had I wanted to. Bobby Sue stuck her head in the open truck window and said something. The passenger door swung open. Justin came running up to me asking about thirty questions at once, but I put my hand on his shoulder and turned him in the direction of Bobby's truck. He was quiet for a couple of heartbeats, then looked up at me. There's two of them. How'd that happen? How indeed. Chapter 38 Striding beside Bobby Sue was a woman who looked exactly like her. Literally, they were mirror images of each other, except the other woman had short hair and was wearing linen slacks and a blouse rather than jeans and a t-shirt. Gabby, Noel, I'd like you to meet my twin sister, Sandra. The paperwork she'd brought to Ms. Monday now made a whole lot more sense. Apparently, we were both adopted out to different families. She got the same paperwork I did about our biological dad's death. They sent us identical packets, except hers included two letters explaining everything, and mine included none. In essence, our father wanted us to know about each other, but wasn't allowed to according to the rules of the adoptions. But they can't hardly sue him now, can they? Justin stuck his hand out. I'm Justin, he said, as she shook it. He motioned to Bobby Sue with his head. I'm her kid. Well, and part Noel's, too, but mostly Bobby Sue and Earl's. Sandra smiled and clasped his hand in both of hers. I've heard a lot about you, young man. It's a pleasure to meet you. Sandra's voice was just like Bobby Sue's, yet it was a little more cultured and had a slightly different accent. Does that make you my aunt, then? he asked. Sandra glanced at Bobby Sue, unsure how to answer. It sure does, Bobby Sue said. Cool, Justin said. Do I have any cousins? Sandra laughed. You do, indeed. I gotta go tell my friend. He was talking about his cousins, and now I can tell him I have some, too. He raced off, and she smiled after him. Where were you raised, Sandra? I asked. Valdosta, mostly, she said, her gaze wandering over ma'am. That's a fine animal you have there. Bobby Sue snorted as ma'am turned his head sideways and reached for her pocket again with his upper lip. Fine as long as you got peppermints and plenty of gate latches. It was hard to take the bluff too seriously, though, considering she reached into her pocket and pulled out another mint for him. Seeing him reaching for the mint reminded me of our adventure. I couldn't share Janie's story yet, because I didn't know Sandra, and we had a strict rule about strangers. They didn't get to know anything until the living-impaired community put it to a vote. So we explained the whole situation right up to showing them the tattoo. Sandra stepped closer, not seeming to mind that he was wet or nuzzling her nice blouse. May I? she asked, motioning to his lip. Sure, Gabby said, shrugging. The worst that can happen is we don't know any more than we do right now. Sandra patted Ma'am, then placed her hand under his chin, gently resting it on her hand, then lifted his lip up. 
I think I can actually contribute here, she said. I ride, but mostly western pleasure. That just so blew me out of the water because Bobby Sue was Bobby Sue. Her twin had obviously been raised in way different circumstances. The foster home that I aged out of, I raised my brow because that wasn't what I expected at all, was a horse ranch. Well, they preferred to call it a breeding and training facility. She waved a hand. But whatever. Anyway, I showed with them and made a friend who used the pleasure classes to get her younger horses used to the arenas while they were in training. Her father used a tattooing system just like this. The first two sets of numbers were the sire and dam, and the last was the birthing season. Sandra glanced at Gabby. Was he a 2013 colt? Yep, sure was, she said. That may explain it then. I'm not sure how much good it'll do you, but I'm glad I was able to help a little, anyway. No, it's another piece of the puzzle, Gabby said. Thanks. She unhooked Mayhem from the wash rack and turned to the barn. Would you like to meet the rest of the horses? Sure, she said, enthused, but turned to Bobby Sue. Bobby Sue motioned toward the barn. You go ahead. I know every critter in there. Watch out for Cupcake. Sometimes she don't live up to her name. Gabby and Sandra were talking horses as they walked away. I turned to Bobby Sue. You okay with all of this? She huffed. Are you kidding? I'm more than okay with it. All my life I wanted a sister. If I had to wait till I was 50 to get one, that's early than I ever expected. I breathed a sigh of relief. Then I'm happy for you. I turned in the direction of the pole barn. Want to come see the goodies I got today and keep an eye out for me while I unload it? I got a humdinger of a story to tell you. She grinned. Lead on. I do love a good humdinger. While I unloaded everything, I told her all about Janie, then about the new developments with the murder. Dang, she said, and here I thought I was going to have the only long-lost twin story of the week. Oh, you take the prize there for sure, but I don't like this whole mess. It stinks. Yeah, something ain't right for sure. But how are you going to manage to string it all together? You're missing something critical. Ray's truck came rolling up the drive, and she parked beside Bobby's truck, then waved toward the barn. Over here, I called. She turned sideways to sidle between the trailer and the barn, then did a double take when she saw Bobby. You were just... She pointed to the barn. No, I wasn't either, Bobby Sue smiled. That'd be my twin sister, Sandra. Ray took a deep breath. Okay, I've apparently missed a few steps. Back up to the beginning. I ran my tongue along my teeth, hoping Bobby told her the same way she told us, just for the entertainment value. While Bobby talked, Ray helped me magic the stuff out of the trailer. By the time she was done explaining, we only had one more box to move out of the trailer. Bobby smiled and waved across the yard. If you're going to witch that anywhere, do it now, because you've got about 30 seconds, she said through her smile. That thing was a monster, and there was no way I was lifting it myself, so I didn't burn any daylight getting it out. It had just settled on the table when Gabby and Sandra strolled to the doorway. Gabby's gaze roamed over the hall. Dang, you did get a ton of stuff. I showed off some of it, and we tossed around some ideas for mismatched items I'd thrown in at the last minute. When they told me to take it all, they'd meant it. It was going to take me two days just to sort through it all, and I had enough projects to keep me busy for weeks, if not months. Oh, and I almost forgot the best part of the whole story, I said, pointing to Janie's bedset. I told them the story, switching it up so it was Bob that told me the story rather than Janie. Oh, and I forgot to tell you about Norman. 
Four blank faces stared back at me. Norman Norell, I said, as if that explained everything. I was proud that I'd remembered his whole name. What does a fashion designer who's been dead for 50 years have to do with anything, even if he was brilliant? Sandra asked. I love to look at magazines of all the beautiful women when I was a little girl. Norman is Errol's rat, I said. Who's Errol? Sandra asked. Oh, oops, I scratched my head. Errol's a friend of ours, Bobby Sue said. Good thing one of us could think on our feet, or without sticking our feet in our mouths. I told the story as we wandered up the yard to the house, where we opened up a couple of bottles of wine and started the evening. By the time everybody left, I was exhausted. Hunter came up behind me and rested his chin on my head as I waved goodbye to Shelby and Emma, who were staying at Camille's that night. Are you as tired as I am? At least, I said, turning around and wrapping my arms around his waist. I was asleep before my head hit the pillow. Chapter 39 I woke to the sun just starting to peek through my window the next morning, and when I reached for Hunter, his side of the bed was cold. I hoped that meant there was already coffee made. Putting my nose in the air, I sniffed as I padded toward the bathroom, then scowled. Nothing. Nada. No caffeine-scented air whatsoever. I took care of business and brushed my teeth, then plunked down the stairs to the kitchen. There was coffee in the pot, but it was lukewarm. I shrugged, reaching for my cup and yawning. I was a witch. If the worst thing life was going to throw at me that day was lukewarm coffee, I had the world by the tail. After, I heated up the coffee and drank it. Of course. Once I had a hot cup of caffeine in my hand, I headed toward the front door, starting to wonder where Hunter had gone. I couldn't imagine that he would have left without leaving a note, but my truck was gone. I looked around, but didn't see a soul. Something strange caught my eye. Gabby's trailer was still there. She should have left before dawn in order to be to the show on time, considering it took almost two hours just to get to the showgrounds. She'd been running on little sleep due to picking up extra hours, and when you threw the stress from the murder on top of it, it was likely she'd overslept. I went back upstairs to her bedroom to wake her up, dreading her disappointment. She'd been so excited, and there wasn't another one for more than a month. When I got to the top of the stairs, I was surprised to find her door ajar. She always slept with it closed. I pushed it the rest of the way open. Her bed was rumpled, and when I took a peek into her closet, her show boots, chaps, and hat were gone. Scrunching my forehead, I tried to reach out to her with my mind, but got nothing. I tried Shelby. Knock, knock, I thought to her as I headed back downstairs and out the door. It took a minute for her to answer, and when she did, I could tell I woke her up. What do you want? What time is it? Have you talked to Gabby? Why would I talk to Gabby? I'm at Emma's. I know. Her truck and trailer are here, but her show stuff's gone. Can you try to feel her? Shelby's telepathy had grown at least as strong as my own, and though it was a long shot, I was worried. Sure, she said, with a definite lack of enthusiasm. Then a few seconds later, I'm not getting anything from her. I'd made it to the barn by then, and the tail end of a green truck bed caught my eye. I peeked around the corner, and the mystery truck we'd been searching for was parked where Matt's truck usually sat. Shell, there's something not... The clank of metal smashing into the back of my head was the last thing I heard before everything faded to black. Shelby's voice yelling at me in my pounding head was like fingernails on a chalkboard. Noelle Elizabeth, answer me right now! I groaned against the mental assault. I'm here. What the hell's going on? You were talking, then just cut off mid-sentence. It's been ten minutes. 
We're on our way, but there was a wreck halfway there blocking the road. We had to turn around and take some back roads. I opened my eyes and took stock of my surroundings. I was crumpled in the middle stall of Gabby's trailer, my face half buried in sawdust, and my arms tied behind me. My feet were tied together. My foggy brain tripped to the vision of Marcus's face buried in horse poop and a hysterical giggle bubbled to the surface that I'd at least been lucky enough to avoid that. Gabby was lying toward the back of the trailer, unconscious and tied up the same way I was. The thump of hooves a few feet behind me startled me, and I rolled over to see Mayhem's legs in the front stall. He was pawing and shifting his weight, causing the trailer to rock. My head was clearing, and my head thwacked hard against the floor of the trailer as we hit a bump. We were moving. I explained my predicament to Shelby. Get up! Look outside! See if you recognize anything! Her voice was laced with panic. I managed to sit up, then tried to roll to my knees, but another bump sent me back to the floor. A wave of nausea hit me, and I breathed through my nose, trying not to throw up. When it passed, I scooched backward and put my back to the wall, then used my legs to push me up it. At least the front stall separator was locked into place, running from one side of the trailer to the other, because I could stabilize myself by leaning against it. The other was locked back against the wall, leaving the space between me and Gabby open. I glanced out the window. Trees. We're on a back road because it's bumpy. I don't see any buildings, I thought to her as another pothole nearly sent me to my knees again. Keep looking. Cody knows every back road in 20 miles. If you see a landmark, he may recognize it. And for God's sake, leave our link open. Okay. Gabby stirred, and I spoke to her. Gabby, wake up. She groaned and cracked an eye open, then blinked a few times. What's going on? she asked, fear lacing her voice as her senses came back. You know as much as I do. What happened to you? She struggled to a seated position and pushed herself back so she could lean against the wall. She had a nasty bruise forming on her forehead. I was pulling Ma'am out of his stall to brush him down before we left, she said. It was still dark. The last thing I remember is somebody grabbing me from behind and jabbing a needle in my neck. Well, at least you got a needle. I got a shovel. I turned the back of my head to her. Noel, that doesn't look good. Your hair's matted with blood, and it still looks oozy. Yeah, I don't feel so great either. Another wave of nausea made me gag. Try to get up. I glanced out the window again and saw an old barn with the mail pouch logo, painted in faded yellow letters on the side. I called to Shelby and told her. She answered after a few seconds. Is it an open field or sitting in front of a big stand of trees? Rail fence? Logo on the roof or on the side? Open field. I moved closer to the window to look at the fence. Barbed wire fence logo on the side. Another few seconds, then, okay, we know where you are, we think. We're headed your way, but you have at least a half hour on us. Just hold on. Yeah, okay, hurry. The nausea was getting worse, and I was getting lightheaded. I sank back to the floor. Shelby's on her way, I said not sure what else to do to get us out of our predicament. Can't you just magic us loose? she asked. I focused on the ropes binding my feet, but I almost hurled when I tried to untie them. No, I muttered. My brains are too scrambled. I started to pass out, but Gabby snapped my name, kicking me in the leg when that didn't work. Don't you dare go to sleep, she said. You stay with me, you hear? Even nodding made my world spin. I hear you. At that point, hearing and obeying were two different things, though. She kept up a steady stream of chatter for the next fifteen minutes, when the trailer slowed and turned onto what must have been an old driveway or access road. 
The grass brushing the underside of the trailer made a soothing, whooshing noise, and my mind drifted, despite Gabby's voice. Another bump jarred me back to consciousness. Then the trailer lurched to a stop. Ma'am stomped and moved around in his confined space, agitated. Another vehicle shut off behind us, and I heard the doors of both open and shut. Voices sounded from outside the trailer, a man and a woman. I didn't recognize either one. The back door swung open, and the girl who looked like Gabby poked her face in. Well, looky who's awake. Chapter 40 I squinted to see her. Up close, she didn't look anything like Gabby, other than her size and hair color. In a passing vehicle, though, I could see where people would make that mistake. Clara Thomas, I said. That startled her. How'd you know that? You may look like me, but you sure don't have my brains, Gabby said. Her boyfriend's Hunter Woods, Keyhole Lake's sheriff. Clara took a deep breath, then blew it out, irritated. I know that, but nobody from our department gave him that information. Gabby lifted one shoulder. Maybe not, but our department isn't crooked, and Hunter had the good sense to double-check. Though, at that point, I wasn't sure what good that would do him. The man yanked the other door open. Our department straight as an arrow, he said. Well, mostly. I'm the only one who fed your man bad information. The upstanding Sheriff Custer, I presume? I tried for sarcasm, but considering I was trying to keep my stomach from turning inside out, I'm pretty sure I missed the mark. He jerked his head in a sharp nod. But why? I asked. Money, Clara said. Karma, Custer said, at the same time, then scowled at her. Gabby cocked a brow. You better be careful slinging the K-word around. Looks to me like you're losing some serious points in that arena. Marcus Sturgis was a worthless womanizer. He had more than most of us ever dream of. Clara reached in and grabbed Gabby by the shirt. He promised me the moon she said as she pulled a struggling Gabby toward her. And gave her the back of his hand, Custer said. Clara told me about the note he found in your stuff at the ranch. So that's how Marcus had gotten it. He'd gone through her things before she picked them up. You're not exactly one of my favorite people. My boy was kicked off the football team just for being a typical kid when you called the law on him. Typical kids don't destroy property and throw rocks at horses, Gabby said, as Clara jerked her out of the trailer. She landed in a heap in the grass, but rolled quickly to her knees. Custer curled his lip at her. And you wonder why I didn't mind you taking the fall for the murder? My little sister here, he jerked his head toward Clara, was so convinced he was going to keep her in style that I'd had it. I couldn't talk her out of it. Then, when I saw him with another woman, that was the final straw. He reached in for me, and any token struggle I tried to put up failed miserably. My vision was tinged black around the edges, and I was struggling to stay awake. I didn't plan it that way, though. I was just going to follow him and snatch him when I could catch him alone. When he pulled up to that farm and I recognized the truck, though, I couldn't resist the twofer. What was he doing at the farm anyway? Gabby asked. He was going to steal your trailer and tear it apart, find whatever the old lady left you. The creditors were about to start breaking bones, Clara said. He was already hitched when we pulled up. I managed an eye roll, but regretted it because my stomach rolled right along with them. He wouldn't have found anything, I said. He hooked to my trailer, not hers. Clara snorted. Why doesn't that surprise me? He paid so little attention to that farm of his mama's, he didn't know what the trailers looked like. Gabby shrugged a shoulder. They're similar, but no, he was clueless. Clara's gaze shot to Gabby. You found the treasure! 
No, Gabby said. I didn't. I have no idea what she was talking about. The other girl studied her for a minute, apparently trying to decide if she was telling the truth. She shook her head and focused on pushing Gabby toward an old, crumbling outbuilding. So what? I said, after he steadied me on my feet. You just killed him and left him there? Yep, Custer said. I watched him go through the trailer, hoping he'd find something, and waiting to make sure there wasn't anybody home. He pushed me toward an old outbuilding. When he started hitching up the trailer, I knew he didn't find anything. So I went into the barn and grabbed the first thing I saw, the spurs hanging on a peg beside a stall. He shrugged. He was such a pretty boy, he wasn't even a challenge. It was over in five minutes. I drug him to the back stall and shoved him in. He smiled. When he landed in that horse pile, I figured it was fitting. My only question, though, is how you knew about my truck, Clara said. Big Brother used it because his was in the shop. Dirk's been driving it since I got Mama's car when she passed. Yeah, Custer said. If it weren't for that, you wouldn't be here right now. We didn't even know you were home this morning. Our plan was to sneak into the house and drug her while everybody was asleep. Nobody around here locks doors. (laughs) Then get rid of her and tear the trailer apart ourselves when we could. When we found her loading the horse up and saw your truck was gone, it was the perfect scenario. He shoved me to the floor, and I ground my teeth together to keep from crying out. By the way, Gabby said to me, Hunter and Matt decided to go fishing. I was supposed to put a note on the whiteboard, though I don't reckon it matters much now. My sluggish brain was sure hearing her say that right then should have been funny but I couldn't figure out why. I drugged her and tossed her in the trailer, he continued, and we were just getting ready to leave when you came out of the house. So how did you know about the truck? I blinked, trying to focus my swimming vision. My donkey saw you. I could barely see their faces in the darkness of the shed as they picked up gas cans and dumped them out over everything. She tilted her head. Your donkey? A sight for sore eyes, literally, popped into view right then. Addie shouted at them, but Clara just laughed. That ain't gonna work, old woman, she said. Our mom's been hanging around nagging us for five years. You ain't got nothing other than a big mouth. Addie grinned, and it was evil. I ain't, but they do. She motioned toward the door with her head. I could see shadows in front of the door, and then they were sucked outward off the hinges. Daylight filled the room, filtering sunshine through the dust motes. Shelby had her hands held out in front of her, and a gust of wind blew through the shed. Her hair spread out around her, and her eyes were icy green. The expression on her face was lethal. She jerked her hands forward, and Custer shot backwards toward her. She slung her hand down and toward her left, slamming him into a heap several feet away at the base of a tree. Camille appeared at her side and made a twisting motion with her hands and roots shot from the ground beneath him, wrapping around his whole body. Clara was next. Shelby rushed to my side and checked my head, lifting my eyelid. She's in bad shape, Addie. We gotta get her to a hospital. When she turned to mutter a spell toward the ropes on my feet, I saw the angel wings mark on her shoulder, glowing golden through her t-shirt. Addie, Camille, look. Addie swooped over, and Camille sucked in a breath. Shelby had gotten that mark when she was touched by an angel several months before. The angel had said she was meant for great things, and warned her to use it for good. What? she said twisting around to see what they were talking about. Camille pulled out her phone and snapped a picture. When Shelby saw it, she just shrugged. I can't explain it, but if it helped me save them, then I'm thankful. Epilogue 
I spent the next several hours in the hospital, and they insisted on keeping me overnight, only releasing me when I promised to take it easy for the next few days. It wasn't a hard promise to keep, because I felt like I'd been hit with a Mack truck. Max kept me company and was nice most of the time. We played porch chess on the giant board I'd had made just for him, but he didn't go so far as to let me win. Gabby and I went through the trailer, finding nothing. We'd given it up, and I was shutting the door to the dressing room when the sun glinted off the silver brow band of a show bridle. It had a larger heart in the middle and smaller ones up the V-shaped leather on either side. I stepped back inside and took the halter off the hook. Behind it was a small door. Gabby, I called. Come here. She stepped into the dressing room, and I showed it to her. She pulled the little leather tab at the top of the rectangular cutout, and the front fell away, revealing a cubby. There was a small lockbox in there, and when she pulled it out, there was a combination lock on the front of it, three double-digit numbers. She bit her lip and looked at me, her hand shaking as she rolled each number to match the tattoo on Mayhem's lip. When she slid the latches, the top clicked open. Inside, on a bed of black velvet, lay a golden horse pendant on a slender chain. Gabby looped her fingers through the chain and pulled the necklace from the box, the sun glinting off the horse, giving it a near-magical look as it spun on the chain. Tears were running down her cheeks. What is it? I asked. Besides a necklace, I mean. She lowered the chain and caught the pendant in her palm so I could see it. The horse was running, with its mane and tail flowing behind it. She wiped her eye on her sleeve. Sylvia never took this off. It's been handed down from mother to daughter in her family for six generations. And now she's handed it down to the woman she considered her own daughter. I said softly, putting my arm around her shoulder. She leaned into me. Yeah, she whispered, the mother I never had. That surely is the most precious possession either of us could ever have. After a few days, I was good as new and claustrophobic as all get out. Hunter agreed we could go for a ride, but insisted that I ride with him. Since that beat staying in the house for so much as another hour, I agreed. Half an hour before we were due to leave, Matt sauntered across the yard and pulled his bike out of the storage barn where we kept them. Hey, I hollered, Hunter and I are going for a ride with Shelby and Cody in a few minutes. You ought to come with us. He grinned. I have every intention to, but I have to go pick up my date, he said as he pulled on his helmet and fired up the bike. As he drove off, I played the guessing game with myself, even musing aloud to Max. Honestly, Noel, you're as bad as those old hens at the clipping curl. He gave me a knowing donkey grin. I narrowed my eyes. You know, don't you? He humphed. Of course I do, but don't bother asking. You'll find out soon enough. Hunter's bike roared up the driveway, and I fetched my helmet and jacket and met him on the porch. He looped his arms around me and gave me a kiss. You scared me, you know that? I nodded, feeling content as I stood on my tiptoes for another one. I know, but it's not like it was my fault. He chuckled. It never is, sweetheart. It never is. But seriously, what is it with you and people trying to blow you up? This is twice now. I shrugged. Lack of creativity? Laughing, he pulled me in for a hug, and I nestled my head into his shoulder. I reckon so, he said. The sound of more bikes rumbling up the driveway broke the morning quiet, and I pulled away from him. Matt and Cody, both with passengers, pulled in front of the porch. Of course, I knew who was riding with Cody, but I turned to Matt, the curiosity nearly killing me. 
A petite woman climbed off as he held the bike steady, but she had a smoked face shield on her helmet, so I couldn't see her face. When she pulled it off, I burst out laughing. Anna May grinned back. Hey, sugar, ready for a ride? I pulled her into a hug. I couldn't have chosen better for him myself. Absolutely. Let's go. They insisted on keeping the ride fairly short in case I started feeling sick, but there was no way that was going to happen on such a beautiful day. Gabby's name was cleared, and she found her treasure. A murder was solved, one of my best friend's lifelong wishes had come true, and two more of my best friends had found happiness with each other. And I, of course, was blessed to have them all in my life. Once again, all was well in Keyhole Lake. This has been Mayhem and Murder, written by Tegan Meyer, narrated by Merritt North. Copyright 2017 by Tegan Meyer. Production copyright 2019 by Tegan Meyer. If you'd like to follow Noel and crew on their next adventure, Book 5, Murder and Marinade is next in the Witches of Keyhole Lake series.